President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Um, can I just deal with the? I'll, I'll, can I just deal with this housekeeping first, then I'll deal with the remote issue to allow committees that may be meeting immediately. Um, are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clerk. Well, documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red, and committees have lodged proposals as indicated at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll move on. On the point of order, Senator Davey, I assume you're one of many who would like to raise the, my attention to Senator Thorpe's on the remote system. Yes, it's a use of use of props Se and yeah. slogans uh, in the chamber. Effectively, she is in the chamber. She is using props and slogans. That is against standing Thank orders. Thank you. Senator Thorpe, I have previously ruled and discussed with those appearing remotely that there should be no slogans or other props used while senators are appearing remotely. I'm going to ask you to remove the props and the slogans. The flag is, of course, appropriate. They have been allowed by all participating senators. Thank you, President. This is a climate emergency. Senator Thorpe, Senator Thorpe please climate note. Emergency. Senator Thorpe, I, I, I will. Thank you. Um, I call Senator Wong. Has, the Leader of the Opposition has precedent. Senator Waters. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Is leave granted? No. It is not. Pursuant to contingent notice motion standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, may be moved immediately and have precedence over all other business until determined. Mr President, we in this place uh, have been here before when the IPCC has reported. I have been the climate minister when the IPCC has reported. And the report that we have now received, this, this parliament, the government, countries across the world, demonstrates the extent to which we have to take urgent action. You see, it is a race. The earth is hotter than it has been for 100,000 years. We are just years away from an average 1.5 degrees of global warming, a point at which human security, health and livelihoods are imperilled. And this was what was reported overnight from the scientists. This is what we are already seeing. And for the world and for Australia, this is an emergency. And has long been predicted, as I predicted on the basis of the advice given to me over a decade ago when we sat on that side, Australia is feeling the brunt of it. Our land areas have already warmed by 1.5 degrees on average. Heat extremes have increased, cold extremes have decreased, and scientists have a high degree of confidence these trends will get worse. This is why we ought to debate this motion. We are seeing sea levels rising at higher rates than global average. We are seeing snow cover and depth decreasing, and we have seen fire. We have seen fire like we have never seen it before. Extreme fire weather days which have become more frequent, a fire season which has become longer, and what we are told is that the intensity, frequency and duration of fire weather events will increase throughout Australia. And of course, regrettably, as a continent that is one of the most affected in this, on this earth, we will lurch from one extreme to the other because destructive heavy rainfall and river floods will also, degree, also increase. This is the effect, the compound effect of years of failure to curb emissions, to curb carbon pollution. And you know, we talk in this chamber often, those on the other side speak often about what we owe future generations. And I think all of us wonder what our children will say 
what our children will say about this parliament. My daughter did a, an investigation project, I think that's what they call them these days, and she chose climate change. And her first, answer, her first question to me was, is there anything we can do? We have an obligation. For many years now, we have had this obligation, and those opposite have refused to shoulder responsibility. You see, for many years now, we have been in a race. And the race against climate change is a race we have to win. It is a race towards renewable energy. It is a, a race in which we have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to jump ahead of the pack with renewable energy made by Australian workers with Australian technology, energy that could be exported to a world that needs it. And as we have said so often, this is about the jobs for today and the jobs of the future, because if we invest in renewables, we will, we will create thousands of good-paying jobs in growing industries. We could make power cheaper and cleaner. But we have a government that never acts until it's too late, a government that misses every opportunity, a, a government who always says it's not a race, it's not a competition. Well, this is, and it is the emergency that so many speak of. And I would finally make this point. The only way, as has been demonstrated with the election of President Biden, that you will get Australia, an Australian nation that is willing to do something about climate, is if you change the government. You have to change the government if you want to deal with this. Fine speeches, Trying to have a go at everybody is not going to do it. We have to change the government if this country is actually going to do something about the climate emergency that we face. If our carbon pollution reduction scheme had been in place for the decade between 2010 and 2020, we would have, we would have emitted 161 million tonnes less into the atmosphere. That is the difference a government that is committed to climate change than make, can make, and that is why we have to change the government if we're going Order. to actually ensure Senator, this country acts Order. on climate. Senator Wong, Senator Birmingham. Then I move the question be put. The question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the question be now put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Brockman to tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the nose. The result of the division is eyes 18, nose 18. The matter is therefore determined in the negative. The question now is. Um, it is 18 all. I um, assumed that, was going to, that would close the debate, but it does not. The debate continues. So I'll call Senator. Uh, look, I'm going to defer to Senator. Um, I'm, I'm just going to give, with the extensive pairing arrangements, I'm sure the chamber will let me give a moment for the whips to. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr. President, as, uh, as we do know, these are quite unusual sittings with the very extensive pairing lists that, uh, that are in place. And, uh, it appears that um, on the understanding of uh, where senators were voting, where parties were voting and, uh, and the pairing arrangements, uh, the expectation would have been for a different result. Um, uh, we don't seem to be able to identify between the whips quite what, uh, what, what caused the result to be a tied vote. But can I uh, request the indulgence of the Senate for the vote to be recommitted, please. Given that 40 senators were absent from the division, they are quite extensive pairing arrangements. Is leave of the Senate granted to recommit the vote? Senator Patrick, you wish to object to that? I, I, I would object if anyone additional comes into the chamber. Well, I can't determine that. Leave is either granted to recommit the vote, and, and I might say, Senator Patrick, where an explanation is provided is the custom of the Senate. Senator Wong. Well, we, we will. We have always allowed for a recommittal, provided the appropriate steps are taken, which is someone has to turn up and say, oops, I missed for these reasons. Now, 
if that we will extend that courtesy as we expect it to be extended to us but the government has not yet said what happened they can't just recommit in the hope um, senator wong i can i just observe i've i've been here for that to happen too but that's normally the case where we might have four or five pairs someone may have been erroneously asked to pair without there being an error on that individual senator's part Senator Patrick. So, thank you, Mr. President. I think that's fair, but that needs to be explained to, by, to the chamber. Abs ab I, ha I have put, asked leave. I've got an objection. So, on that basis, I'm going to call for debate to continue. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd just like clarification as to where Senator Griff's vote is going on this. This is an important issue for South Australia, okay. um, and I think we need right, to Senator needs to be on the record. Where is he voting on the topic Senator, of climate change Senator, and action? Senator Hanson Young, it is not up for someone to speak on behalf of another senator. Um, I don't think Senator Griff is on is online. Um, there have been long-standing arrangements with respect to cross benches and independents. I'm going to call for the debate to continue, and I'm going to call Senator. I was going to call Senator Waters, your, um, who's on her feet first, Senator Watt, um, because I don't have leave to put the division again. So, Senator Waters, on the motion to suspend, moved by Senator Wong. Yes, thanks very much, President. So it's great that we're suspending standing orders, as we should, to be debating this most crucial issue facing humanity. But it is incredibly disappointing that the challenge put down to the government uh, by Labor is that all they want the Morrison government to do is finally commit to net zero emissions to 2050. Now, I'm sure folk have had a chance to read the report last night. And the report is a clarion call for action by 2030. This issue should be Order. above politics, and the report calls on us to act by 2030. Now, I, I, <laughs> I'll take Order. those interjections, but I would urge everyone in this chamber to read the report. Order. It talks about 2030. 2050 is too late. We have a government that has barely mentioned a response to this report. The Prime Minister is only standing up to have a press conference to complain about protesters who are rightly registering their concern about the inaction from this government on the climate emergency. And we will shortly be moving once again uh, to suspend to talk about the need to take action on 2030. Now, we've already seen the absolutely devastating impacts of the climate Order. emergency. Order. I'm happy to keep going, President. It's not bothering me at all. But if you're going to call the chamber to order, that you go for it. Order. Senator Waters to continue. Thank you. So the report last night Senator Wong. talks about the devastating impacts of uh, a exceeding a one and a half degree Order. climate rise. Now, we've got 10 years, Senator Wong. and all we see in this chamber is both parties taking massive donations from the coal, oil and gas companies. And yes, here we go again, because we will keep raising this issue until we get science-based policies. And we will say until we are blue in the face that we want to see a different government. But if you want to get climate action, then you need the Greens in the balance of power to push a new government to Order. go further and Order. faster on the climate Senator crisis. What? Senator because Wong. We, yeah, yeah. If you want action on the climate crisis in the next decade, like last night's report says is urgent, then you need the Greens in the balance of power because, frankly, this debate about 2050 is too little, too late. And while we see millions sloshing around in donations from the coal, oil and gas sector, and while we see public money being given to private companies headed up by Liberal donors to open up new gas basins against the wishes of First Nations community in the Northern Territory, you will not see science-based climate policy. That is why it is urgent that we suspend standing orders today, not to talk about net zero by 2050, but to talk about decent climate targets by 2030 so that we have some chance of saving agriculture. 
in this nation. So we have some chance of reducing the severity of the awful bushfires that we saw uh, not two years ago when the Prime Minister was taking a holiday in Hawaii. Uh, we've seen those awful fires now hit the, the birthplace of democracy, uh, Athens. We've seen flooding in Europe. This is real. It is not something for the future. This is happening now. We've seen saltwater incursion into our Torres Strait Island food-producing land. This is not something that can be delayed. We need action now, and if we want to have any chance of staying below one and a half degrees, we need rapid and urgent cuts to emissions. Uh, this government just hasn't even read the science. They've never met the scientists, and they're certainly not going to start listening to them now. Um, and the flaccid pressure on them by the so-called opposition uh, for a 2050 target that is too late is frankly embarrassing. We need science to be deciding policies in this place, not donations from the coal, oil and gas companies. And until such time as other parties join the Greens in refusing donations from those fossil fuel uh, crony capitalists, then we won't get science-based policies. And in fact, that's what the Australian populace expect and deserve from us. We had a decent uh, carbon price. It was working to bring down emissions. The Greens want to see good climate policy. We want to see a change of government, and we want to work with the next government to push them to go harder and faster on the climate crisis, because at the minute, without the Greens, you won't see urgent action. You will see donors getting, de uh, getting their wishes delivered upon, which is not enough. We need a decent opposition, we need a government to listen to science, and you need the Greens in the balance of power if you've got any chance of taking climate action. Order. I'm going to order, order, Senator Wong. Order. I'm going to go order. I'm going to go to Senator Brockman. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to apologise to the Chamber. I made an error in the pairing arrangements. I missed out. Uh, I sent Senator Hume from the chamber in error. She was not included on the pair sheet. It was my error. I apologise to the chamber. In particular, I apologise to my colleagues for making the error, but I wish that the vote to be recommitted, Mr President. On that basis, with leave of the Senate, I will recommit the motion, which was the motion of Senator Birmingham, that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham that the question be now put be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Brockman tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 19, noes 18. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes and Senator Brockman tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 18, noes 19. The question is resolved in the negative. Senator Waters. Yes, thank you very much, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to 2030 targets in light of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Leave granted. It is not. Senator Waters. Uh, President, in pursuant to contingent notice standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change may be moved immediately uh, and uh, take precedence over other, all other business until determined. Now, we had a report last night that could not have been clearer in its warning. It is not the first time that we have had a clear 
warning and report from the world's scientists. But this one is the most urgent and the most pressing yet. And I find it a little baffling that um, we have uh, consternation in the chamber about the fact that 2030 is what we need to be talking about. You have a government that's targets for 2030 are so weak, they are essentially one third of what needs to occur to keep this country um, safe and to keep us underneath a one and a half degree tipping point, beyond which there is no return. And certainly this government's policies have us on track for four degrees of warming. Now, that's actually catastrophe. That is actually the end of agriculture as we know it. It's, our, it's dead oceans. Um, it's bushfires of such severity um, that we cannot even fathom. It is, it, is not, it is not an option. And so, yes, we need to change the government. Of course we need to change the government. This government is controlled by its climate denialist backbenchers, and they can't even bring themselves to meet with the scientists, let alone follow their advice. Uh, and I'm being reminded by my uh, erudite colleagues here that it's not just the backbench that have a problem with science uh, in the government. Of course, it's many of their front benches as well. So it is absolutely clear that the government of this nation, the Morrison government, is not doing what is necessary to keep Australians safe. They are, in fact, setting us on a trajectory of a death sentence yep. for nature, for society, for our economy. Uh, wrong way, go back. But what we cannot tolerate is discussion of 2050 without discussion of what needs to happen in the next 10 years. The report last night could not have been clearer. 2050 is too late. Net zero by 2050 is too late. We can do so much better. We can actually create a jobs boom. We can transition those existing fossil fuel workers into clean jobs that will last and that won't cause them health problems. We can actually tackle this crisis collectively as a nation and give our nation and the world the best shot at a safe future. But we need to be doing that rapidly and urgently by cutting emissions from the coal, oil and gas sector, not by opening up new coal, oil and gas fields, not by dishing out public money to help private companies do that, and certainly not when those private companies are donors to either the Liberal or, in many cases, the Labor Party. It is about time that we ended those fossil fuel donors uh, exerting so much influence over policy making. And so we welcome the fact that Parliament has spent a short part of today and we hope the whole day talking about this issue. But what we cannot stomach is that 2050 is somehow enough. And we want to work with the opposition. We want them to be in government. But without the Greens in the balance of power, then you won't see the strong and urgent action that the scientists are saying is necessary. Now, we had world-leading climate laws. That's what the Greens and Labor delivered under the Gillard prime ministership. It was working. It is the only other time that emissions have come down in our nation's history. It was world leading and it was axed by this climate denying government. We want to work with the opposition when they are in government and we want them to go harder and faster on the climate crisis because we don't have any time to lose. One and a half degrees is a tipping point that we cannot go above uh, if we even hit two degrees, we know that our global coral reefs are written off. So I take umbrage uh, at the suggestion and, in fact, at the um, quite extensive uh, contribution, I might, I might term it, uh, from the opposition to our last suspension. But 2050 is too late. Delay is the new denial. We need this parliament to be talking about 2030 targets. The government's 2030 targets are so weak they have us on a path which is a death sentence. I am sick of the fossil fuel companies calling the shots on our nation's climate policies. So is the rest of the country. For God's sake, give the money back and start listening to the scientists in drafting climate policy, uh, or you will be consigned to the opposition benches, where I hope you will be, and the Greens will work with a new government to deliver decent climate action. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, President. I just want to briefly uh, contribute to this debate to flag that Labor will, will be uh, supporting the motion to suspend standing orders. Uh, we will not, however, be voting for the substantive motion because it doesn't reflect the Labor position. Um, but I do want to take the opportunity to also bring to the Chamber's attention the very serious 
risks that have been outlined in the IPCC report overnight, particularly for regional Queensland, uh, especially for Northern Australia. Uh, so it is somewhat ironic uh, that some of the hardest opponents of taking action on climate change in this chamber are representatives, so-called, of regional Australia, when the IPCC report makes very clear that it is regional Australia more than any other part of the country and almost more than any part of the world that faces the most serious risks uh, if action on climate change is not taken. You know, even in the last couple of years, whether it be the Black Summer fires, whether it be floods, whether it be cyclones, we see that constantly it's regional Australia that bears the brunt of our ch changing climate. It's regional Australia that pays the price for this government's lack of action on climate change, and yet it's regional Australia that is being so profoundly let down by a government that claims to represent it. And that's before we get to the incredible job opportunities that do exist in regional Australia if we actually start taking action on climate change. Um, we can create jobs in regional Queensland and in regional Australia if we take uh, action on climate change. That's probably why every stakeholder, from the National Farmers Federation to Rio Tinto to BHP um, to gas companies, is all backing net zero emissions by 2050. It's not because they're good corporate citizens, but it's because they know that there is money to be made and jobs to be created. That's why they're backing it, and that's why Labor's backing it, and that's why we need this government to actually ta start taking some action, rather than continuing the approach we always see from them, which is to never take responsibility, to blame others, to come up with spinning lines to avoid actually doing anything. Uh, just in closing, though, I do want to respond to a couple of the points that Senator Waters has made on behalf of the Greens. And you, in fact, I predicted uh, as we walked into this chamber that most of what we would hear from the Greens this morning would be attacks on Labor, and it was, because it always is. Because the Greens exist to take votes from Labor, to take votes, to take seats from Labor, and to actually guarantee the re-election of LNP governments. Now, if we need any proof of that, let's look at the founder of the Greens party, Bob Brown, and what he had to say about the notorious Adani convoy that ran through Queensland last year, contributing to the re-election of this government. He said that he was very proud of the Adani convoy. It had achieved its objective by returning Senator Waters to this chamber. It didn't matter that in the process it re-elected an LNP government that even the Greens say is destroying the climate. That wasn't their concern. Their only concern is to come after Labor. And as for this notion that the Greens holding the balance of power would be a good thing for the climate, well, let's just remember the last time there was a Labor government with the Greens in the balance of power in the Senate. They blocked Labor's initiative around the CPRS. Why on earth would you let the Greens have the balance of power if you actually want action on climate change? Change. The only way to have action on climate change is to elect a majority Labor of government, and that's exactly what we intend to do at the next election. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, we've had a, had a whole wave of posturing and certainly bickering from those opposite between the Greens and the Labor Party. It's a bit like being at a bad family gathering. But, Mr. President, the simple fact is what we have to see and what we are committed to seeing is not the posturing of those opposite nor the bickering of those opposite, but simply calmly getting on with the job of investing in the technologies that reduce emissions whilst protecting the jobs of Australians. Three quick facts, Mr President. Firstly, between 2005 and 2019, Australia's emissions fell faster than Canada, faster than New Zealand, faster than Japan, faster than Korea or faster than the United States. Action in this country is real and is seeing a reduction in emissions. Indeed, the second fact, Australia beat our 2020 emissions reduction targets by 459 million tonnes. When we've made commitments to the world, we've honoured them, we've delivered, we've exceeded and we are on track to meet and beat our 26 to 28 per cent reduction targets by 2030. Lastly, Mr President, we are committed to the Paris Agreement and its goals, as well as to achieving net zero emissions as soon as possible. Mr President, I move the question be put. The question is that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham. The question be now put, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Davey Teller for the ayes and Senator Chisholm Teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 19, noes 16. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion moved by Senator Waters to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be, to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Chisholm tell off the ayes and Senator Davey tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 16, noes 19. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, it is my intention now to proceed with business. The Senate has determined on two occasions to continue with the order of business as notified, and I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, family assistance legislation amendment, child care subsidy bill 2021, second reading debate. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, President. And 
just give me a moment to find my... And while you're doing that, Senator Pratt, I'll ask senators to, to leave the, the chamber in an orderly fashion, please. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, this afternoon we're here to debate the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Child Care Subsidy Bill. And what we are seeing today is the government finally admitting that they've been keeping the foot on the neck of working families, hurting the mental state and well-being of Australian families as well as their economic security. Their need to bring this bill forward is an admission that their much lauded uh, changes of a few years ago have become a burden on Australian families, just as Labor predicted that they would. And so, as we enter into this uh, debate today, from the outset, it's timely for me to move a second reading amendment, where at the end of the motion we add that the Senate notes that most families will receive no extra support from the government's changes to the childcare subsidy, that the government's changes do nothing to stop out-of-control childcare fees, and that passage of this bill will allow the minister to bring forward the commencement of the changes, and that the government should deliver extra support to families as soon as possible. These families, Australian families, have been left voiceless and disadvantaged by this government. One of the most pathetic news presences of uh, recent times was the specimen from the coalition party room that said that women using childcare were outsourcing parenting. Outsourcing parenting. Well, access to affordable, quality childcare is a fundamental cornerstone of economic participation in our country. It's a fundamental cornerstone of the economic well-being of families, especially families with children who, in order to meet their uh, families' needs, you need to be working as a single parent or as a two-parent family, often you need two parents working. This is the quality of the debate that the coalition had internally around these issues. The government has wasted a lot of oxygen trying to deny many of the hard facts in relation to childcare in our nation. Long daycare fees have gone up by some 2.4% in 2020, and that included four months of their free childcare experiment. So four months where fees couldn't go up at all. We've seen overall fees have gone up by 2.4 per cent. They've hiked 9.3 per cent under Minister, uh, Prime Minister Morrison's new childcare subsidy. Fees are now up 37.2 per cent since the election of the coalition government. But this government doesn't like to talk about this data. Their mismanagement is not only hurting the selfish women uh, who need the support of this package, it's holding families back from work. There are almost 100,000 families in our nation not working due to the cost of childcare. And as a telling example of this, I had a senior psychiatrist in Western Australia come to me just a couple of weeks ago, desperate that uh, something be done about the cost and affordability of childcare. Because as he said to me, the cost and affordability and inaccessibility of childcare was contributing to his ability to recruit psychiatrists into the workforce. Psychiatrists that support the developmental needs of children and, indeed, the mental health of Australians. The cost of childcare is having an impact in so many ways. Researched from the Front Project, based on a survey of 1,700 families, 
found 73 per cent of families say the cost of childcare is a barrier to them having more children. What a sad and sorry state of affairs. 52 per cent agreed that once the cost of childcare is factored in, it's hardly worth working. But Labor has always argued that the system is broken and that the system under this coalition government is completely busted. That's why we announced our own ambitious plan to make childcare cheaper for one million families, a million families who need it most. The Morrison-Joyce government know this too. That's why they were pulled kicking and screaming into making the modest changes that we have before us in this bill today. So as we look at the bill itself, we can see that Schedule 1 removes the annual childcare subsidy cap from the Family Assistance Act, so there will be no longer a limit on the amount of subsidy that families over a specified income year can receive each year. The annual cap was a terrible policy. It was always a terrible policy. It has served as a serious bar barrier to second income earners in a family, usually a woman, working the hours that they want and need. And in the kinds of skills shortages that we are facing in Australia currently, very evident in Western Australia, working the hours that our economy also needs them to work. It was such a bad idea. Nobody ever, ever recommended it. The Productivity Commission didn't when they were asked to design a new subsidy scheme by the government back in 2015. They certainly didn't include it in their design. So who came up with this idea? The Social Services Minister did, and that Social Services Minister was Mr Scott Morrison. Abolishing Mr Morrison's cap is a terrific idea, so great that it is already Labor policy and part of our plan for cheaper childcare. The amendments in Schedule 2 will increase the rate of childcare subsidy by 30 percentage points, but only for second and subsequent children aged, up to, aged under six up to a maximum rate of 95 per cent. As we know, this measure is being implemented through a two-phased approach to ensure implementation can occur as soon as possible, but allowing sufficient time for the system to build support uh, for the change in policy and to put in place integrity measures. These changes to the subsidy provide some income, some extra support for some families in a short period of time. And in that context, Labor supports the bill. But it is a disgrace that there is not more help and more support. The government's pre-budget announcement promised a lot, but as this bill demonstrates today, it delivers very little. Like everything with this government, they are all flash and no substance, as we've seen again and again. The problem with this bill, Mr Deputy President, is that not many families, not many families at all, will see a cent of extra help. Three quarters of families in the system still get nothing. The government announced a complex and restrictive policy that only benefits families with at least two children in care below school age. Families will need a mathematics degree to understand their subsidy under this new system. Any passing analysis uh, of the Labor and Liberal childcare policies shows unequivocally that our policy, the Labor policy, provides more support to more families for longer. 86 per cent of all families with children under the age of six in the system are better off under Labor's policy. The vast majority of families with a combined family income between uh, just over 69 and just above 174,000 with two children in childcare will be better off under Labor's policy. And any extra support the Liberals have in this package to families with two children 
That extra support is only temporary. It's ripped away when a family's oldest child goes to school, no matter that that oldest child is likely still to need after-school hours care. What a ridiculous prospect to give and then take it immediately away. How is a family supposed to continue to juggle participating in the workforce with two children if the extra uh, support you put in place just suddenly disappears? Labor's boost in support will be provided to every child for the entire time they are in childcare. We will also get the ACCC to design a price regulation mechanism to shed light on costs and fees and to drive them down for good. The Productivity Commission under Labor will also conduct a comprehensive review of the sector with the aim of implementing a universal 90 per cent subsidy for all families. Now, this is critical in Labor's view, not only uh, for working families to get them participating, but indeed for the access of children to early childhood education and care. A plan that's good for families, a plan that's good for the economy, and a plan that's good for children's wellbeing. So here today, we support this bill because something, something today is better than nothing. But it is little wonder to us on this side of the chamber that this government doesn't want to talk about their childcare policy. They know it is a pathetic scrap of a policy. The government's own workforce papers show the workforce participation rate will fall even after these changes are introduced. And with closed borders and uh, people screaming out for jobs and skills in the economy, this is unsustainable. We need a strategy to lift participation uh, in the workforce, and childcare is key. But I have to say only this government could design a childcare policy in the depths of Treasury that won't help working families more. We need to get Australians back working the hours they want and the hours they need and the hours our economy needs. Early learning and childcare are absolutely fundamental to this. Labor knows this, but members of the Morrison-Joyce government clearly don't. Some of them clearly think that childcare is just glorified, expensive babysitting. There was even talk of aiding working families among the coalition as forcing women back to work, as though respecting a woman's right to work is a new and unexamined prospect for the coalition until this point. I have to say, what century are we in here? It is 2021 and we have members of the Morrison-Joyce government shaming parents for using childcare and needing a reminder to respect the right of women to choose how to balance their work and family life. Now, I know juggling children and working can be a difficult juggle in terms of creating that balance. But how is it contributing to the quality of that juggle when you can only afford two or three uh, days childcare a week and in order to work the other days you have to juggle informal care? These are not choices that the coalition is offering families and especially women. It is completely and utterly out of touch and embarrassing that this government has taken this approach and has delivered to the nation this quality of debate around these issues. To make matters worse, they even called for more incentives for women to stay home. This ignores the structural incentive they've created to encourage women not to work, their record high childcare fees. It ignores the fact that many women and families do work full time 
but only access childcare for some of the days during that week. Sometimes they survive well with grrand grandparental care, but sometimes Senator it's an Perth, inconvenience of informal care. Thank you. Senator Faruqi, by remote. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I speak to the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Childcare Subsidy Bill 2021. The bill removes the annual cap on childcare subsidies, um, CCS payments to families, and increases the maximum rate of childcare subsidy for second and subsequent children, where a family has more than one children under six years of age. These are the two measures announced in the 2021-22 budget. The measures, once implemented, will clearly provide some amount of relief to some families from the expensive and burdensome costs of early learning and care, and for that reason, the Greens will support the bill. Any funding boost for early learning is welcome. But let's be real. The proposed bills will not fix the fundamental problems with the current system of early childhood education and care, which is underfunded with one of the highest fees in the world. The most sensible and equitable move would be to make childcare universal and free. Expensive early learning has held women, children and families back for far too long. The benefits of free early learning and care for families and the whole community is beyond doubt. And while I'm talking about children, their education and their future, I can't not talk about the very dark cloud hanging over their lives the cloud of the climate crisis. The IPCC report that came out yesterday was devastating. Science and scientists are telling us that even under the most ambitious emissions reduction scenarios, the world is now likely to heat to 1.5 degrees or more above pre-industrial levels by 2040. And the other big tragedy is that the liberals have tied our country to the least ambitious targets while they spruik coal and gas. And the Labour sorry, Party has sorry, no 2030 targets at all. Senator Faruqi, I have uh, Senator Stoker on the point of order. The point of order is relevance. Um, this is a bill about childcare. I um, ask that, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, rule we should return to the question. Thank you. I do remind this, the uh, Senator that uh, she should remain relevant to the topic and uh, ask her to continue. This is a bill, Madam Deputy President, about our children's future and their education. And this government is burning the future of these children we are talking about today. Children in Australia and across the world who are hurting and who will be hurt and harmed even more if action on climate isn't taken. But rather than safeguard and protect our children's future, we have a federal environment minister arguing and appealing against a landmark court ruling that she does not have a duty Senator of care Faruqi. to protect Australian Senator children. Faruqi, sorry. Senator Stoker on a point of order. The point of order is relevance, uh, and I respectfully suggest that your prior ruling wasn't observed at all. Senator Waters on the point of order. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. On the point of order, we have a second reading amendment, which Senator Faruqi will soon foreshadow that she is speaking to. Um, and I'll note the tradition that second reading contributions are generally fairly broad ranging. Um, and I am in entire agreement with Senator Faruqi that a bill that addresses the future of children, uh, it is entirely appropriate to be also speaking about the climate crisis. Thank you. Uh, Senator Faruqi, I'll ask you to. Uh, to in continue on that basis, understanding that there is a second reading amendment likely. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. There is a reading amendment, uh, which I will foreshadow in a minute. But here we are talking about children, their education and their future. And so in that future, it is a definite need to talk about their future under the devastation and destruction around us, which will happen if we don't take immediate and urgent action on climate. Um, and all kudos to the children who took the matter of the Australian government's responsibility towards them to the court. Um, and I think it is pretty shameful. Uh, it is a pretty shameful abrogation of responsibility towards our children and the next generation by this government and the environment minister who are appealing against that landmark court ruling that we don't have, or she, the minister doesn't have duty of care to protect Australian children from the climate harm caused by the potential expansion of a coal mine. 
because it, it does it does cause harm to children and the next generation. And this government, if it doesn't act on the climate crisis, are nothing but climate criminals and environmental vandals. And my colleague, Senator Waters, will be moving a second reading amendment to highlight the impacts of the climate crisis on children, their future, and that it should be a topmost priority to do something about it. This bill, Madam Acting Deputy President, is just tinkering around the edges. And it is way past the time of tinkering around the edges and procrastinating on real and lasting change. The government loves to talk up its incremental minor changes to the childcare subsidy as a huge win for families. But on the face of it, that is not the case. Many families with a single child in care will not receive any benefit whatsoever. Even this bill before us today is flawed by design. The government was rightly criticized in May when this package was announced for its measures not coming into effect until July 2022. That's 14 whole months between the announcement by the education minister and actual fee relief in families' pockets. We will have had a federal election by the time these measures come into effect. The minister may not even be the minister by the time this all gets implemented, and I hope that he isn't. But come next election, I hope that the people of this country would have kicked out the Morrison government and the Greens would be in shared power so we can push for creating a fairer and more equal society. But there are a few months to go before this can become reality. And women, children and families can get some relief from extra payments right now. From the providers that I have spoken to, there seems to be no good reason why this start date could not be brought forward. The government has pointed, out, pointed to the complexity of changing IT systems. I'm sorry, but in the age of COVID-19, when we've seen how systems can be redesigned and payments reprioritized seemingly overnight when deemed urgent enough, that doesn't cut it at all. In any case, I note the education minister said in a second reading speech, and I quote, it is anticipated we will be able to commence implementation by July 2022. Should it be possible to bring the commencement of the measure forward, we will do this so that families can benefit sooner. That is why the bill makes it possible for earlier implementation with the date to be set by proclamation. Clearly, the minister is feeling the heat. And I will be moving an amendment in the committee stage that would bring the implementation date forward to 1 July 2021 so families can realize the benefit of the package now. And I ask the senators to support this amendment because it provides certainty and doesn't leave it just up to the minister and their whim to decide what the date will be and when can it be. More generally, we need to be thinking in much bigger and more ambitious ways about the future of our early learning and care system. The dire state of affairs for early learning and care in this country requires nothing less of us. This is the first time during a health crisis the government has grudgingly recognized that childcare is an essential service, and thousands of families have benefited from that. The pandemic has opened up a conversation about the long term viability of our existing approach to childcare. This is an opportunity too good to let slip away. There is a compelling case for free and universally available early childhood education and care, and it would have enormous social and economic benefits for our community. Too often, women have to give up work and career opportunities because childcare is too expensive or just not available. Children get the enormous benefit of early education when it is accessible for all. So the benefits of removing all barriers to access are not only creating equity, but also have a huge payoff for the whole society. So let's stop entrenching gender inequality. Let's stop deepening intergenerational inequality. Let's make corporations pay their fair share. Let's tax the billionaires into oblivion. Let's not hand back public money to the wealthiest in society. And let's use some of these funds to invest in making childcare universal and free. And we should also be expanding publicly provided services to families. So families aren't reliant on for-profit centers because education is not a business. It's time early childhood education was funded and provided as the essential service that it is. We should also be ensuring fair and decent pay for education. Early childhood educators should receive professional pay, reflecting the skill and responsibility of the work they do every single day. And on that point, I do want to make a special mention of early childhood educators 
following the release of a report from Big Steps and the United Workers Union this morning. This was a survey of more than 3,800 educators, and it finds a sector at breaking point with high turnover, low pay, and no plan from the federal government to fix it. The report makes for very alarming reading, Madam Acting Deputy President. It tells the story of government neglect, an undervalued workforce, privatization, and an essential service delivered on the back of burnt out staff. Just a few statistics from this report to illustrate this dire situation. 37% of educators said that they do not intend to stay in the sector long term, and this group, and of this group, 74% intend to leave within the next three years. Over 60% of educators said they have often come to work or stayed at work sick due to staff shortages. 70% of educators surveyed said they always or often worry about their financial situation. It's a national shame that early educators are taken for granted in this country. Staff are living in droves, and frankly, the sector is in crisis. We should not be in a situation of chronic understaffing and high turnover. The government needs to completely rethink its approach to early learning and care, and that means strong and sustained investment to make early childhood education free once more and a workforce that deals directly with issues of low pay and understaffing. And I have a second reading amendment that calls for the Senate to reaffirm that childcare should be free and universal for all children and workers and educators in the sector deserve higher wages and better conditions to reflect the value, the immense value of their massive contribution. I also want to indicate that the Greens will be supporting Labour's second reading amendment. While acknowledging that it does not really go as far as to address the issues facing the childcare system, and that while um, this bill allows the minister to bring forward the commencement of um, the changes. It doesn't make sure that it actually does happen. And that's why I will be moving the amendment to bring the date forward. Ultimately, while this bill does provide some relief for some families and the Greens support that, it's still a tiny step forward in a long journey that we have to embark upon to ensure that our early learning system is equitable, universal, appropriate and there and available for all families. Thank you. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak in support of the Family Assistance Legislation Childcare Subsidy Bill 2021, and I really do take great pleasure in doing so. Step by step, reform by reform, we're making childcare more accessible for Australian families, particularly to those families that most need it. This builds on the previous reforms that we've made to the childcare sector, which have made a significant difference to families and which have also been well received by industry and childcare providers. Now, this bill represents this next step. It gives effect to the Morrison government's commitment to make childcare as accessible as possible. It's all about supporting families, backing them in the workforce safe in knowing that their kids are getting the best possible care. This bill targets additional supports to all CCS-eligible Australian families with more than one child aged under six in childcare. This is around 250,000 families who will benefit by around $2,260 per year. Now, that's a significant number of families uh, from right around the nation. Uh, which then they're going to see uh, the practical impact of what we do here in this place, and that's what it's all about. While those on the other side are often hell bent on scoring political points, uh, uh, using the most inappropriate topics, we've just heard contributions uh, along those lines. We're over here plugging away, plugging in, uh, putting in place the reforms which deliver a practical outcome for Australian families, and we're listening to them. We're delivering for them. We always have, and we always will. Now, those on the other side uh, often couldn't care less. They're more concerned about the things which do quite the opposite, undermining the vaccine rollout, uh, playing politics with the pandemic. But over here, we're talking about a reform which is going to impact 250,000 families across the nation, putting money back into their pocket. It's what we committed to do at the last election. It's what we're following through with here, even with this bill. 
From the middle of next year, we will increase the childcare subsidy available to families with more than one child under six in age under six in childcare. Now, this means that families with more than one child in childcare will see their level of subsidy increase by 30 percentage points to a maximum subsidy of 95 per cent of fees paid for their second and subsequent children. Around 50 per cent of families who benefit from the measure, those earning less than about 130000 will receive the maximum 95 per cent subsidy for their second and subsequent children. These families will pay on average $21 a day for two children in childcare. Around 95 per cent of families who benefit from the measure, those earning about $250,000, will receive a subsidy of at least 80 per cent per, uh, for their second and subsequent children, paying on average $73 or less, uh, or less a day for two children in childcare. We'll also remove the $10,560 annual cap on the childcare subsidy for families earning over $189,390, benefiting around 18,000 families. Now, this means that families with multiple children don't exhaust their childcare subsidy cap sooner in the year for younger children. Those families shouldn't be at a disadvantage. Quite the opposite. We need more Australians to be having kids. As Peter Costello famously said, have one for mum, one for dad and one for the country. These changes will put more money into the hands of Australian families, especially those who need it most. Those on the lowest incomes will continue to receive the highest rate of subsidy. This is a core principle of our childcare subsidy and it will ensure families are supported to access affordable early learning and care. The activity test uh, remains in place to ensure that families must be undertaking activities such as working, training or studying to be eligible for childcare subsidies. This is a very sensible measure. Very sensible measure. This measure reduces workforce disincentives for families and encourages parents, especially second income earners, who are more often women, uh, to go back to work and uh, or work more if they choose to do so. So what does this mean in practical terms? Families with two children in care for five days a week, 50 weeks of the year, earning $60,000 will save $52 a week, be entitled to an 85% uh, uh, subsidy for their first child and 95% for the second child and receive $936 in weekly subsidy with an out-of-pocket out cost of $104. Now those earning $100,000? will save $102 a week, be entitled to 75.4 per cent subsidy for the first child and 95 per cent for the second child and receive $886 in weekly subsidy with out-of-pocket costs of $154. Those earning $180,000 will save $156 a week, be entitled to a 50 per cent subsidy for the first child and an 80 per cent for their second child and receive $676 in weekly subsidy with out-of-pocket costs of $364. Across a year, the average yearly savings for families as a result of these changes will be $783 for families earning under $70,000, noting that these families already receive a very high subsidy for all children in care. $1,650 for families earning between $70,000 and $120,000 and $2,804 for families earning between $120,000 and $150,000. This support is targeted towards those who need the most assistance. 60 per cent of the additional investment goes to families earning under $180,000. The maximum childcare subsidy rate will increase to 95 per cent for the second and subsequent child, means uh, lower income families. Uh, who already receive very high levels of childcare subsidy will still benefit from these changes. Importantly, all types, of, uh, all types uh, except in home care uh, where a family rate is paid are covered. Uh, the measure is primarily intended to support children attending long day care and family day care, as this is where most children aged under six uh, attend childcare. It's important that government assistance remains targeted to ensure that it's sustainable over the long term. 
This government believes that these settings strike the right balance between providing targeted assistance to those that need it most while maintaining fiscal responsibility. Uh, other models recommend providing assistance to high-income families, including those earning well above $350,000. Those models go against our core principles uh, for the childcare package. For me, it's all about choice. I know that there are a variety of views in this place on childcare, and that's fair enough. But this is about giving Australian families options, letting them make the decisions that impact them based on what works for them and what they think is in their best interest. If a family wants to put, a, put children in childcare and continue to be in the workforce, pursuing a career and supporting their family, that's great. And they ought to be supported to be able to make that choice. And if they decide to have a parent remain at home, then that's also good, if that's what's in their interest and what they want to do for their families. This isn't a one-size-fits-all policy for families. They need to decide what's best for them and their own families, and they're in the best possible position to do that. It's not our place as legislators to be dictating to Australian families what they need to be doing. It's up to them to decide, and that's what we are doing. We're backing them to do that. We're backing them. We're backing them to do both of those options, providing that choice. These are thoroughly liberal policies. And with that, I believe that we should uh, keep working to make childcare more accessible to those that want to take it up. Now, this bill is just that next step, but it isn't the end. We need to keep plugging away, consulting with parents, providers and industry to, to continue to make reforms which make childcare sustainable, accessible and of the highest possible standard. One thing I believe that we should be looking at as part of this next step in support and continuing with the reforms, these reforms, I think we should also be looking at uh, policies such as income splitting. We know that the early years in a child's development are the most critical. Now, splitting income for taxation assessment purposes would provide further choice to parents. It will also simplify the options for parents, including supporting a parent that chooses to stay at home, or even facilitating informal paid childcare arrangements from grandparents and the like. Income splitting will go a long way to making childcare even more accessible to families and backing them as they plan for their financial future. It's something that I believe, strongly believe that we should be putting forward in the next tranche of reforms. Now, in saying this, this bill supports choice. It backs Aussie families and it will put more money back into their pockets. I commend this bill to the Senate and I commend indeed the Morrison government for backing families to make the right decision for their own circumstances. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. We are about 20 seconds away from going on to two-minute statements. So with the leave of the Senate, are we happy to, to move on? Thank you. So we will now call Senator Marielle Smith, who's on our remote link. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The latest report from the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has found that Southern Australia is already facing more extreme heat, drought, catastrophic bushfires and less average rainfall. We have already experienced less rainfall and an increase in droughts. And this will have a disastrous effect on our health, agriculture and biodiversity. The report predicts a temperature increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius by about 2030 based on our current trajectory. Well, what will our children say to this? Say knowing that we had this report. They'll be looking to us, looking to our policies, looking to the decisions made by those of us in this place and asking, what did you do? The report is unequivocal. Human activity is responsible for rising temperature levels and the scale of recent changes to our climate are likely unprecedented. There are still those opposite who continue to deny, to question the science, but we cannot afford this. We cannot afford further delays on action on climate change. The UN Secretary General has declared the report a code red emergency for the world. He said the alarm bells are deafening and the evidence is irrefutable. The government cannot ignore this any longer. The report has made clear that Australia is in particular peril. 
sea levels around Australia and New Zealand have already risen higher than the global average and will likely continue. Fires more frequent and fire seasons lasting longer. Heavy rainfall and floods are projected to worsen. And across southern Australia, drought has already increased and projections suggest this will worsen. The only way to turn this around in terms of policy in Australia is to change the government. It's to change the government. This is a warning of the greatest urgency. This is an emergency, and I urge more action from the government. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Macdonald remotely. Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise to pay tribute to doctors and healthcare professionals everywhere, but especially those in our rural towns and indeed those who train them. James Cook University in my hometown of Townsville can lay claim to being Australia's most successful university in producing medical graduates who go on to work as doctors in regional, rural and remote locations. It is the only university contracted by the federal government to offer the Australian General Practice Training Program, which delivers across 90 per cent of Queensland, servicing about 1.6 million people, including two thirds of the state's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. 75 per cent of the almost 1,800 JCU medical graduates since 2005 have gone on to work in regional and re remote locations for periods of 12 months or more. And of that number, 1,000 are still in those locations, an extraordinary achievement. Of the 424 GP fellows who completed Australian general practice training with JCU, four out of five were working in regional and remote locations six months post-fellowship. JCU's model relies heavily on practical training in rural locations so participants can live, learn and work with qualified doctors to see what it's really like. And one GP involved in this training, who I'd like to mention, is Dr Leonie Fromberg, the Flinders Medical Centre in Cloncurry in northwestern Queensland. She and others like her make JCU's program a shining light in medical training in this country. I'm proud to support the university's efforts in this endeavour, and I'm proud to be part of a federal government that has a ministry dedicated to rural health and rural doctor training. I encourage any medical students wanting to learn the whole range of medical skills to go west, where the traffic is light, the air is clean and the people are friendly. Thank you. Senator Rice. Remote. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Yesterday's report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was described as a code red for humanity by none other than the UN Secretary General. He said, the alarm bells are deafening. Greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at immediate risk. I learned about the science of the greenhouse effect as a young student of climate science 40 years ago. It was a shocking truth that set me on my path to being a campaigner for the well-being of life on this planet and to being here in this place. The first IPCC report came out in 1990, a lifetime ago for my two adult kids. They, like all young people, have lived their lives with the knowledge of the climate crisis hanging like noose around their futures. Yet our government is still looking after their billionaire mates and their fossil fuel donors while our future is literally going up in flames. We have to kick them out. And the Labor Party, they too are looking after their fossil fuel mates and donors and hand in hand with the government are hell bent on unleashing a huge carbon bomb on the planet with more coal mines and backing, track, fracking vast tracts of sovereign lands of First Nation peoples. And they're silent about what needs to happen by 2030 when we have to have slashed our pollution. Delay is the new denialism. But have hope, people. We can kick this destructive planet-burning mob out of power. We can elect a new government with the Greens in balance of power that will commit Australia to science-based targets for 2030. We'll commit Australia to getting out of mining coal and gas and oil so we can play our part in giving humanity and all life on this planet a chance of a healthy future. Thank you. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
Uh, I'd like to commend uh, all of the actions of South East Queenslanders over the last few days to take serious steps to ensure that we could emerge from lockdown. Uh, and I also express my concerns to residents and businesses in Cairns who are now facing a lockdown as well, which hopefully won't, won't last for too long. Uh, but quite apart from COVID-19, a new threat emerged in South East Queensland over the weekend to the lives and livelihoods of not just South East Queenslanders but all Queenslanders. A new threat that is intent on coming all the way down from Queensland down to Canberra and wreaking havoc just like we've seen it do before. What is that threat? Hello, Newman. That's right, it's former LNP Premier Campbell Newman. He's back from the dead like the zombie apocalypse. He just will not go away. And now he's here to terrorise not just Queenslanders, but Senator Stoker, Senator McGrath and Senator Canavan as well. This is the former LNP Premier who cut 14,000 jobs from the Queensland Public Service, who cut health services, who closed and sold schools, who tried to privatise our power network, who abolished literary awards, who commenced a war with traditional LNP supporters like lawyers and doctors and, of course, curbed civil liberties in Queensland in a way we had not seen since Joe Bjorki peterson There is a very real risk that if Campbell Newman is elected at, to the Senate, along with the Morrison government being returned, they will do exactly to Australia what they did to Queensland when Campbell Newman was the Premier. He will team up with the LNP uh, to cut jobs, to cut services, uh, to cut all sorts of civil liberties that we enjoy right now, just like he did and the LNP did when he was the Premier in Queensland. There is a very clear message for Queenslanders. If you want secure jobs, vote Labor in the House and vote Labor in the Senate. If you want quality services, vote Labor in the House and the Senate. You, if you Senator want job Watt. cuts, vote for the LNP Senator, and Campbell Senator Newman. Hansen. It is time to close Australia's international borders to non-Australian citizens and protect our nation from state premiers obsessed with endless lockdowns triggered by imported variants of COVID-19, which the government claims are more dangerous. More than 1.67 million people have flooded into Australia during the COVID-19 pandemic, while Australians themselves are virtually imprisoned in their own states and homes. It's an appalling double standard. Australian workers and families can't cross domestic borders yet. Thousands and thousands of international workers and visitors have been given a free pass to cross the international border. The latest international visa and arrival data reveals the Morrison government has issued more than 20,000 visas in June this year and more than 164,000 since April last year. These included more than 46,000 work-related visas and 25,000 temporary visitor visas, almost 3,000 student visas, more than 26,000 family visas and 63,000 other permanent and temporary visas. While the Prime Minister keeps an international border open, Premiers will continue to slam shut state borders and put millions of people into lockdowns that are destroying lives, jobs and businesses, breaking our economy and leaving a huge legacy of public debt. Scott Morrison may not be able to control state borders, but he can shut the gate to the foreign arrivals who have been bringing COVID-19 to our shores. Given end date being the 1st of December for people to be vaccinated if they wish, not forced and then declare no more state border closures. Set a target to open international borders by May 2022. It is quite evident what is happening around the world. People are learning to live with COVID. Any government or business have no right to coerce, bully, bribe or threaten people to be vaccinated. That spells out a communist regime to me, not a democracy. We can't continue with these lockdowns. Something has to give. Senator Canavan. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this morning uh, we have seen uh, some Australians uh, exercising their democratic rights to, to protest out the front of this building, uh, but uh, some of them, unfortunately, uh, have not done so in, in a respectable way, and they deserve to have the book thrown at them. Uh, it is fine, and I want to, re want to repeat that it is absolutely every Australian's right to protest and, and have their views heard, but it is not your right to deface public property is not your right to come into the heart of our democracy uh, and, and graffiti uh, your own views on the front of it to the exclusion of other Australians with different views. Uh, this is an absolute disgrace that has been abetted and, and facilitated by the Australian Greens in this chamber. They should hang their heads in shame that they associated with such people that show such lack of respect for other Australians and the institutions of this democracy. 
The reality is the protesters out there today they don't want to change the climate. That's not their goal. They're not there to change the climate. They're there to change our government, to change our democracy. They do not support democracy. They do not support our systems of government. The reason you know that, the reason you know that is if they were serious, if those protesters were serious about changing the climate, reducing carbon emissions, they would have walked down to the Chinese Communist Party embassy just down the road after this and protested against the biggest carbon emitter in this place. But they don't do that. They don't do that, Madam Acting President, because I kind of reckon, I reckon a lot of those activists, I reckon some of those people in the Australian Greens over there, they kind of like communism. They're kind of in favour of it. So that's why they're not, they're, not, they're not protesting against communists. They're not really worried about the climate. They are wanting to radically change our society and do so in a way that shows no respect for their fellow Australian. Anyone associating with these, with these vandals and juveniles should be denounced and anyone that cannot denounce them deserves no respect in our Australian democratic political system. Thank you. Senator Griff, remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Look, I'd like to begin by congratulating our Olympic squad on their fantastic performance in Tokyo. One thing that makes the Olympics special is its power to bring us together in one moment, one moment to share in the glory and achievements of fellow Australians. We have indeed been fortunate to experience many of those moments in the last two weeks. But for a great number of us, those triumphant and inspiring moments were marred by the barrage of gambling ads shown during ad breaks. Under Australian law, gambling ads cannot be shown between 4pm to 7pm on any broadcast and on children's programming between 5am and 8.30pm. But so many of our Olympic achievements Moments many Australians shared with their children were broadcast outside of these hours and totally escaped these restrictions. It is absolutely time for us to reconsider those limited restrictions. A report published by the Australian Gambling Research Centre showed that one in three Australians opened a new online betting account during the pandemic last year. One in three. And this led them to gamble more often and for larger amounts. No doubt many of these people were influenced by advertising, the same type of advertising seen by our children during the Olympics. And tragically, some new gamblers will soon find themselves in financial difficulty, setting out a chain reaction that can and has ruined lives and families. It is well and truly time for government, this government, to act to permanently remove gambling ads from television, from radio and from online. This is needed to help protect our young and to protect future generations. Thank you, Senator Grip. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I rise today to speak on the 2021 Census. And critically, uh, it's a critically important survey of our nation that has tremendous impact on the work of parliament. And I want to call out a campaign led by Humanist Australia in their effort to get Australians to tick the non-religious box. I strongly support every Australian to answer the census as honestly as possible, people of faith, people of no faith, but I'm deeply troubled by the campaign's motives. In the Humanist Australia CEO's recent op-ed in The Age, she explicitly cites the reasons for her campaign is to strip funding from religious schools and activities. This is spiteful, misinformed and wrong. We should be celebrating Australia's rich religious pluralism, not mocking it. At a time of rising anti-Semitism, we should be supporting Jewish institutions and schools to be safer. We should be supporting Islamic, Catholic, Christian and other faith and other educationally ideological schools as well as government schools. And to do so, we need to have the facts, hence a truthful census. While the gaps in our social safety net grow ever larger, we should not be seeking to curb the work of religious charities and aged care homes who are in greater need during a COVID crisis than ever. Religion brings joy and comfort to many Australians of the Islamic, Christian, Hindu, Baha'i, Sikh, Buddhist and all the other faiths that give people meaning. This opportunistic and spiteful campaign to take funding away from religious institutions is simply wrong. I encourage every Australian on this Census Day 2021 to be honest. Be honest in the census. Tell the truth, because 
you will give us the real face of Australia. Do not respond to spite. Inform your answers with good conscience and tell Australia who we really are. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, this morning we saw an act of complete bastardry against the Australian people here at Australian Parliament House. The Green Support Group, Extension Rebellion, vandalised this place, the People's House, as it's known. This is what happens when you choose slogans over actions. Labor and the Greens have continually used slogans. We, the Morrison government, choose actions. Actions like be beating our Kyoto target by 439 million tonnes. Actions like having the most solar rooftop in the, uh, uh, voltaic, volta voltaic in the world. Actions like reducing 639 million tonnes of emissions, carbon emissions in the last two years, the equivalent of taking all Australian cars off the road. It is 14.7 million cars. Actions like $20 billion of committed investment in new clean energy to drive over $80 billion in public and private innovation, creating an estimated 160,000 jobs. We are a government of actions, not slogans. Actions that actually reduce emissions, not destroy jobs or impose costs on Australian households, businesses and industry. The acts of vandalism are typical of the other side of this chamber. It's their approach. It's all noise, no action. And when it comes to addressing an issue such as climate change, only meaningful action will deliver the results. Slogans won't do it. The members opposite here who have celebrated this morning's acts of bastardry should be ashamed of themselves. And I trust that the ACT Magistrates Court will deal with the rest. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, hardly a month goes by without a warning, a prediction, a story um, about a defence project that's over budget, running late, or failing to deliver. T today, again, shipbuilding is in the news. The poster child for failed defence projects used to be the Super, super Sea Sprite helicopters. It was overtaken by the Joint Strike Fighter. And that has been overshadowed now by the future submarine. The future submarine is so big, uh, it's ensuring that its shipbuilding mates, uh, the uh, future frigate and the OPVs, are obscured in its shadows. Now, these projects have substantial project teams in the defence organisation. It's overseen by a first assistant uh, secretary, National Naval Shipbuilding Office, a general manager, submarines, a first assistant secretary, ships a Deputy Secretary of National Naval Shipbuilding, on top of which there's a Submarine Advisory Committee, there's a Naval Shipbuilding Advisory Board, uh, which has morphed into a Naval Shipbuilding Expert Advisory Panel, and we've even got a sub subcommittee of the National Security uh, Committee of Cabinet now overlooking shipbuilding. And we've just gone and paid $3, billion, $3 million to Boston Consulting, um, and who uh, have decided the projects are late, and their answer is to do a restructure and employ more people. It's McHale's Navy. We're not short of overseers. The, mem the, the number of people that is not the issue. It's the skills and experience of those people that are currently there. The leadership has failed. They picked the wrong solutions. Moving chairs is not the answer. We need to change the people. We need to start at the top and, and work our way down. Thank you. Senator McCarthy, remotely. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. Just wanted to update the Senate on the refugees held in Darwin that we've had big changes in the last 24 hours. Mashtaba, his wife Ursana, and their son Benham who were waiting to go to the US were moved to Melbourne in the early hours of this morning for their medical checks. After being told about the move late yesterday, they will apparently have five days in quarantine there and it is a bit unclear as to whether they will then go into detention or community. And they also haven't been told whether after the medical checks, 
they will be returned to Darwin or stay in Melbourne until they can get on flights to the US. This means that the Maghans family are now the only ones in the Darwin facility. They are all deeply distressed and Hajar, the daughter, collapsed yesterday evening and was taken to Royal Darwin Hospital by ambulance. Her family were not allowed to go with her and I believe they've not been able to visit and I understand she remains in hospital. Malika, Hajar's mother, uh, is also deeply distressed at the hospitalisation of her beloved daughter and no doubt the incredible stress of still being detained uh, here in Darwin. I support calls by Chief Minister Gunner that the family be welcomed here in the Northern Territory. I understand he has written to the Morrison government uh, expressing this view. Madam Deputy President, Acting Deputy President, I certainly call on the Senate, the Australian Parliament, to do everything it can on urging the Morrison government to release this family into the community here in Darwin on Larrakia country. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson. Last week, big, aggressive, foreign-owned multinational corporation, JBS, announced it is buying into human aquaculture, diving into the troubled, divisive and controversial Tasmanian salmon industry. Myself and many Tasmanians, those who have fought against the past decade of crony capitalism in the state's salmon industry, fought for transparency, truth, robust independent regulation of the industry, hold grave concerns over this. This takeover of human aquaculture signals a new wave of industrialisation of our beloved waterways, oceans and beaches. JVS Global CEO told media that the takeover of Huon is, quote unquote, a strategic acquisition. Aquaculture will be a new growth platform for our business. We will repeat what we previously did with poultry, pork and value-added products to make our portfolio even more complete. Why am I and so many Tasmanians concerned? During its rapid rise to become the world's biggest meat packer, JBS and its network of subsidiaries have been linked to allegations of high-level corruption, including the biggest fine in corporate history, $3.2 billion after bribing hundreds of politicians, modern-day slave labour practices, illegal deforestation, particularly in the Amazon, animal welfare violations, major hygiene breaches and price fixing, including fines. I warn JBS that they won't be expanding in Tasmanian waterways without a fight, a significant community fight. Now, I know JBS already exists in the beef industry in Tasmania. I know they have significant influence with government, and I know many farmers uh, have had dealings with JBS. Some speak highly of the company. So I say to JBS, this is an opportunity for you to put the industry onto a sustainable footprint. Make sure we have an independent, robust, fully funded environmental protection agency, and I ask them to support Thank the Greens Senator bill Wish to do Wilson. this. Senator Scar. Um, Adam, Acting Deputy President, yesterday in this place there was a discussion in relation to global Magnitsky laws. I think it is incredibly important whenever we discuss these laws we remember and pay tribute to the man who inspired them, Sergei Magnitsky. Sergei Magnitsky was a son, a husband, a father, a man who uncovered a $230 million corruption and fraud scandal in Russia, who spent 11 months in jail without trial and before he was to be released, only eight days before he was required to be released, he died in prison at the age of 37. So when we talk about the Magnitsky global laws, let's always remember the man who inspired them and the story of his sacrifice. And let's remember the words of his family, who when Sergi was nominated for the Allard Prize, this is what they said about their husband and father. I quote, Sergi was so outraged by the theft of $230 million of taxes which should have gone to state recipients like pensioners, schools, the disabled and hospitals that he stood up in the belief that truth and justice would prevail. 
Others might have backed down in the face of the immense pressure he was subjected to, but he did not. That would have meant compromising his own integrity and sense of honesty, and he could never do that. He believed that he was acting for the greater good of his country and fellow citizens. He wanted to be a shining example to his colleagues, friends and families. So whenever we talk about the global Magnitsky laws, let's always remember the tale of Sergei Magnitsky and his sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. I rise this afternoon to express my dismay that victims of the Stirling Income Trust collapse have been left out of the compensation scheme of last resort as currently drafted by Treasury. A few days to go before the consultations close, so I encourage people to complain. The government dragged their feet in putting the scheme together, and yet, in the meantime, they encouraged Stirling victims to lodge complaints with AFCA so that they could be considered under a future scheme. They also uh, claimed that the global financial crisis meant that they could not make progress on the scheme, and yet, in the meantime, they suspended, while encouraging people to apply to AFCA, they suspended AFCA's ability to assess those complaints. Now, I know the government's concerned about the system being gamed, and I understand those concerns. But these people deserve redress. The redress that they have won in the courts, they have been encouraged by the government to take their case to AFCA and to the courts. It is what the government advised them to do. The Royal Commission said there should be a retrospective and prospective scheme uh, for compensation, and the determinations that have been made should be honest, honoured. Many of the people impacted by this scheme, the Stirling uh, Income Trust collapse, have had their financial security utterly destroyed. They have had their housing security utterly collapse. They were promised restitution, and I urge the government to act. Senator Lyons. President, well, today um, we saw a disgraceful shutting down of debate by the Morrison government when Labor in this place tried to move an urgency motion to discuss the IPCC's latest report. It came out last night. It should not be a surprise to anyone. It's appalling. And yet I bet in question time today we will hear the Morrison government congratulating each other on how you are doing so well. Well, you are not. And one of the authors reports, an eminent scientific advisor has said, and I quote, I think everyone in the international community would laugh if they would hear that Australia thinks they're doing enough. Of course they're not doing enough, Dr Meinhausen told the ABC. He went on to say they neither have up their targets for 2030 nor have they put a net zero target on the table. They are not invited to many of the talks where international climate diplomacy is now going on because they are seen, and rightly so, as laggard. And yet we saw the leader of the government in this place this morning get up and defend your appalling record. Eight long years of inaction on climate change. Absolute inaction. We've got business leaders, we've got the ag sector, we've got community leaders calling out for the Morrison government to lead on climate change. Yet you've got a Prime Minister who remains stubbornly ignorant to the fact that we need to act on climate change. You've got climate deniers in this Senate and in the House that are holding you back. And it's time you looked Australians in the face and say Order, we Senator haven't Lyons. done enough. It being 2 p.m. Questions, Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister confirm the Morrison government placed its first order of Moderna in May, nine months after the Trump administration had placed its Moderna orders? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't have the specific date when the first order of Moderna was placed, Mr. President. But the, what the Australian government has done is go through a process of full recognition and registration of all of the vaccines that we have utilised in the country, Mr. President. We've had the opportunity to take advantage of the international experience with respect to the utilisation 
of Order. the Senator Colbeck, I have vaccine, Senator Gallagher on a point of order. So, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. Point of order, uh, direct relevance. We were not asking about the registration, provisional or otherwise, by the TGA. We were asking about the original order of Moderna, the actual vaccine procurement strategy. On, on the point of order, um, you reminded the minister of the question. The minister addressed part of the question in his initial response, but given that you've called for the remaining information to be directly relevant, I'm going to ask the minister, I believe information about ordering vaccines in that case would be directly relevant because he's directly addressed the first point you asked rather than a broader comment on vaccine strategy. I'll let you remind him of it. I'll listen to his answer carefully. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, the Moderna vaccine forms a very important of the overall vaccine strategy for this country. Uh, as I said to the chamber a moment ago, I don't have the specific date with me that the first order was placed. I'm happy to take that on notice and confirm that for the chamber, Mr. President. Um, uh, but uh, it forms a very important part of the overall vaccine strategy and the, and the way that this government has managed the introduction of new vaccines into the country has to, be ins has to, in to ensure that we've had full data available to the country via the TGA to ensure that the vaccines that we're utilising have high levels of efficacy and are safe, Mr President. Mr President, we, through the TGA, took just 23 days to approve the utilisation of the Moderna vaccine, Mr President. So we have used all our, all our resources to ensure that we could have access to this vaccine as quickly as it was safely possible so that it could be incorporated into the vaccine rollout program. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Moderna has been administered in the United States since December last year in France, Germany and Italy since January this year, in Singapore since March, in the UK and Canada since April and in Japan since May. Can the minister confirm that as late as April this year, the Morrison government still hadn't even commenced discussions with Moderna to secure vaccine supplies? Order. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, we have at all times worked with Vaccine, vaccine suppliers across the globe to ensure that we have capacity to meet the demands of the vaccination rollout for, for the Australian people, Mr. President. As I've just indicated to you, uh, we approved the data set for the Moderna vaccine in 23 days, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we took the approach all through the rollout of this vaccine that we would utilise vaccines that were fully approved by the TGA. Uh, and assessed through a target to so that we could guarantee to the Australian people that they were getting access to an efficacious and a safe vaccine, Mr. President. Uh, we saw that as importance for vaccine confidence in the Australian community, Mr. President. So we have taken every step to ensure that Australians could be confident in the vaccines that they were taking, and they went through the full and proper approval process. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. More than six million people are in lockdown in New South Wales and unable to get vaccinated as a result of the Morrison government's repeated failure to secure enough vaccine supplies. Aren't these Australians paying the price for Mr Morrison's repeated insistence that it isn't a race and that it isn't not a competition? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, I won't apologise for ensuring that the vaccines that are available to Australians have been through a full and proper Order. assessment and approval process, Mr President. I won't ap apologise for that, Order. and nor will the government, Mr President. It is important, Mr President, from, uh, to ensure that there is vaccine confidence within the Australian community that we have taken the approach that we have. Australians can be confident that the vaccines that are approved for use here in Australia have been fully approved by the TGA, Mr President, that they have the confidence of the TGA and ATAGI, and that Australians can be confident in taking up the vaccines that have been approved for the vaccine rollout in Australia. It's the Labor Party, Mr President, who continue to undermine the confidence of Australians 
with their negative attitude and negative tactics attacking the vaccine rollout, Mr. President. Mr. President, the Labor Order. Party should be ashamed for their approach to the I'm, vaccine rollout. Well, I'm going to remind senators that when I'm hearing from people remotely, there needs to be extra compliance with the standing orders so I can hear the contributions. Order. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to a fellow Western Australian and the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Yeah. Can the Minister advise the Senate how this government's plan is delivering an economic framework to help small and family businesses grow, prosper and create jobs as we chart our way out of the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Small for the question uh, and acknowledge, obviously, that as a small business owner, Senator Small, like those of us on the government side of the chamber, knows that governments put in place economic frameworks that can assist business in prospering and growing and creating more jobs for Australians. Uh, and certainly, Senator Small has been successful in employing a number of Australians back at home in Western Australia. Mr. President, in terms of the economic framework to assist businesses to prosper, to grow and to create more jobs, that is exactly how the Morrison government approached the recent 2021-22 budget, with the Minister for Finance the Treasurer and the Prime Minister delivering a budget that puts in place those policies that well and truly back Australia's 3.5 million small and family businesses. Our economic measures are all about giving businesses the confidence to invest, to take on a new staff member, but also to get back to doing what they do best if they've been affected by COVID-19. Mr President, we're investing $7.2 million to improve and maintain a new employment tour contract, making it easier for small businesses to take on that new staff member, but at the same time to meet all of their obligations. We're also expanding the digital solutions with an investment of $12.7 million, which will support an additional 10,000 businesses to improve their digital capability and further encourage uptake of digital technology in small businesses. Because what has COVID-19 in particular taught us, Mr President, and that is businesses do need to have that digital capability. And of course, on the government side of the chamber, we understand that red tape it strangles business, and that's why we are continuing to back in our deregulation agenda with $134.6 million being invested to make measures easier, to make it easier to employ people and reduce the regulatory burden for businesses of interacting with the government. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is this government helping those Australian people who get out and have a go to keep more of what they earn. Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the 2021-22 budget is continuing to support businesses to keep more of what they earn through measures that we are implementing, such as the temporary full expensing and the lost carryback arrangements. We're delivering a further $20.7 billion in tax relief to Australian businesses that back themselves and invest in their future. Mr President, what we also know is that the initial round of business tax incentives they have been highly effective. Machinery and equipment investment has been growing at its fastest rate in seven years. So what you see is businesses who have that capacity are out there and they're utilising the policies that the government is putting in place to back themselves and to invest back into their business. This means that the local cafe, the local construction company and even the local plumber, they've been able to utilise the policies that the Morrison government has put in place to reinvest in themselves and again prosper, grow and what we're all about, creating more jobs Order. for Senator Australians. Cash. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how are these measures important in supporting Australian businesses, particularly in the context of the risks that those businesses face as we chart Australia's economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the Morrison government's plan to secure Australia's recovery of course means 
keeping taxes low. On the Morrison government side of the chamber, it's in our DNA lowering taxes. And certainly when you look at the estimated $320 billion worth of investment that is expected to be supported by our business tax incentives and create 60,000 jobs by the end of 2022-2023. We understand, in particular, by keeping taxes low and helping businesses keep more of what they earn, after all, that is their money, they've earned their money, we can continue to secure our economic recovery into the future. But, Mr President, I think one of the key contrasts the key contrast between the Liberal Nationals government and those on the Labor side is obviously when it comes to lower taxes, because we did not take as an election policy to the last election $387 billion in higher taxes. That's the gift, That's the gift that the Labor Party would have given the Australian people, $387 billion Order, in higher Senator taxes. Cash. Senator Wong. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Before the horror 2019-2020 bushfire season, Mr Morrison ignored warnings from experts and from former fire chiefs that Australia was unprepared for the dangers. Overnight, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned, and I quote, the intensity, frequency and duration of fire weather events are projected to increase throughout Australia. I ask, will Mr Morrison ignore this warning too? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks Mr President. Well, Mr President, the Prime Minister has already publicly responded to the release of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth report. Uh, the Prime Minister has, uh, has acknowledged the importance of this report, uh, the importance of the report in continuing to inform Australia's effort in delivering emissions reductions, our successful efforts as a nation in delivering emissions reductions, and the importance of unified global action in this regard in dealing with emissions. The government, Mr President, looks forward to the opportunities uh, that will be provided by the Conference of the Parties at Glasgow later this year uh, to discuss the type of progress that is being made in Australia and around the world and the commitments for the future. We look forward to the fact and that we can talk about Australia's emissions reduction, some 20 per cent emission reduction since 2005. Now, I, hear, I hear the interjection from opposite saying how embarrassing. Well, by comparison, Mr President, our 20 per cent stands alongside a 1 per cent reduction in Canada, a 10 per cent reduction in Japan, a 4 per cent reduction in New Zealand or a 13 per cent reduction in the United States. I make those comparisons not to criticise any of those nations, Mr President, but to highlight, Order. in fact, those opposite, those opposite and those who in the debate in Australia seek to paint a proposition that Australia somehow does not achieve emissions reductions, whereas in fact our country has. Our country has in part, of course, by the motivation of the Australian people as well, Mr President. One in four Australian households have rooftop solar, the highest rate of uptake in the world. Last year, Australia saw some seven gigawatts of renewable energy capacity installed in our country, nearly eight times faster than the global average per person. It is this momentum that we intend to continue to pursue, and it is absolutely our commitment to make sure we continue to meet and beat those targets in the future. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. The former cabinet minister and coalition senator, Senator Canavan, has described the IPCC as, and I quote, a dodgy PR firm rather than a scientific body. And he has also asserted that the IPCC have, and I quote, no scientific credibility. Wow. Does Mr Morrison agree with Senator Canavan? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. And the answer to that is, uh, is no. As I said in the primary answer, the Prime Minister has already responded to the IPCC report in a press conference earlier today. Uh, and as I outlined, and the government takes seriously the challenges of addressing global climate change. We take it seriously, Mr. President, uh, as a government, and it's why we're investing some $20 billion on low emissions technologies over the next decade, some $1.6 billion committed just through this 21-22 budget. It's why, in the Prime Minister's recent visit overseas, he signed partnership agreements that now see us in partnership arrangements with Singapore, Japan, Germany and the United Kingdom to deliver the low emissions technologies that the globe needs to be able to deliver and achieve net zero emissions. 
The 21-22 budget particularly dedicated $565 million to progress international research projects, knowing that those international projects of cooperation are the things that will actually deliver the technological changes Order, to get Senator the job Birmingham. done. Senator, Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Right. Senator Rennick has declared, and I quote, climate change hysteria is a cancer that must be destroyed. And I take his interjection, yep, uh, is a cancer that must be destroyed. And Senator Rennick has also accused Australia's Bureau of Meteorology of tampering with data. Yep, Order. and I take the interjection again. He says yep. Will Senator Mr Morrison Rennick. continue to capitulate to the extremes of the coalition party room or Order. will he commit to net Senator zero Wong, by 2050? For the question. Senator, Rennick. Senator Rennick, interjections, particularly during questions, are inappropriate. Senator, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, I'm calling the Senate to order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. What the Prime Minister will do, what the government will do, is to continue to get on with implementing our policies that are making a difference in terms of reducing Australia's emissions. What the Prime Minister and the government will do, which is what you asked me, Senator Wong, is that we will make sure we continue to pursue the policies that are achieving the downwards trajectory in Australia's emissions, that we invest in the technologies that are necessary. Our technology investment roadmap with its stretch targets Order. to make clean hydrogen affordable, not just for Australia, but around the world. Senator to make Watt energy storage Rennick. affordable, not just in Australia, but around the world. Senator to Watt. make carbon capture and storage affordable, not Senator. just in Australia, but around the world. To make Senator low carbon Wong. steel, low carbon aluminium a reality, not just in Australia, but around Order. the world. To make effective soil Senator carbon Watt. a reality, a not times. just in Australia, but around the world. I make those points, it has to be achieved around the world, Mr President. That's why we need the technology breakthroughs, because then not only can Australia reduce its emissions, but so too can other countries, particularly developing countries, through those tech breakthroughs. Order. Again, I'm going to ask senators, wearing masks, it is hard to tell who is breaching standing orders by interjecting. So apologies if I occasionally get it wrong. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Minister, does the Minister for the Environment owe Australia's children a duty of care to provide them with a safe climate into the future? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. that this is the same message that the criminals this morning painted all over the front of Parliament House. Painted order, all over. Order. Senator Hume, um, I won't anticipate Senator McKim, but I'll call you to make your point of order. Thank you, President. And if, if you had anticipated that my point of order would be on relevance, you would be entirely accurate. This was an extremely narrowly scoped question. And it didn't go to the brave protesters Order, raising Senator really McKim. important climate Senator issues McKim. at the front of Parliament House this Order. morning. Given the damage done to the building, Senator McKim, I'll assume you're talking about a protest rather than an illegal act. Senator Hume, um, Senator McKim, while you, you were only speaking for seven seconds, I'm reluctant to call a minister before the first full stop in their answer, but you've reminded the minister. I call Senator Hume to continue. Thank you, Mr President. I don't think that the, the Environment Minister would make any apology for defending this government, the Australian people, against climate vandals, which are the people that deface government property Order. this morning. Senator McKim, you have just Senator, Hume. Heroes. Senator Hume. I'm going to ask you to turn to the Minister, Senator McKim's question. Um, I'm not going to instruct you how to answer it, um, but he has reminded you of it. Senator Hume. Oh, thank you again, Mr President, but I tell you, I'm unclear as exactly what Senator McKim's question is. Does the, does the Environment Minister owe— on, on, on a point of order, Senator McKim, this is, it's question time is not meant to be interactive. I'm, I'm going to— <laughs> unless you're raising a point of order on relevance— well, I am raising a point of order on relevance, Chair. So this is the third attempt 
that the minister has made, and uh, on none of those attempts has she come anywhere well, near addressing first, a very simple question. On Senator McKim, on the first on the first point of order, when the minister is speaking for seven seconds, I'm I'm not going to rule a minister not being relevant at that point, because I haven't had an opportunity to hear what they're going to say. Um, Senator Hume, to continue. Thank you again, Mr President. I think I now understand what it is that, Ms. that Senator McKim is trying to get to. It's nothing to do with the climate, the climate criminals that painted slogans all over the Parliament House this morning. It's nothing to do with the climate criminals that painted slogans all over the lodge this morning. It's nothing to do with the climate criminals. This is my Senator, understanding, Senator, Mr. President. Senator Hume. Senator McKim, on your point of order, I'm assuming you're going to make it on direct relevance. Well, well I am, Chair, yeah. and I just want to make the point, the, the submission to you, that Senator Hume is coming perilously close to disrespecting your rulings. When it comes to interjections across the chamber, I think there are dozens of senators that disrespect my rulings. Um, Senator Hume, I am going to ask you to turn to the question asked by Senator McKim rather than repeat um, how, what, what the question might not be. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So I am assuming, Senator McKim, that what it is that you're trying to refer to is the case that is currently before the courts, the Sharma and Oars versus the Environment Minister case. Is that correct, Senator McKim? Thank you very much. That the minister has a duty of care to young people regarding climate change. So, Mr. President, on the 27th of May 2021, the federal court delivered a judgment declining to grant an injunction preventing the Minister for Environment from approving the Vickery extension project. On the 8th of July 2021, the federal court made final orders and provided further reasons in the matter. The court well, declared Senator that the Minister McKim, for the Environment a, Senator owed Hume, I have Senator McKim on a point of order. Senator McKim. Uh, thank, thank you, President. The, 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 the point of order is again on relevance. I, I make the point that my question did not reference uh, the case that Minister Hume is referring to. We are now uh, three quarters of the way through the time allotted. The question is very simple. Does the Minister for Environment Sorry, Senator, owe Senator children McKim, duty I'll, of I'll take Senator Birmingham before I rule on the point of order. Senator Birmingham. Just, just on the point of order, Mr President, and whilst interjections are, are of course always disorderly, sometimes they can help to clarify matters in the chamber. And I distinctly heard uh, when Senator Hume um, started to reference the case and posed it in the question of, I assume this case is what the question is referring to. I heard cries of yes coming from the Australian Greens corner, so I fail to see how Senator McKim can now suggest that Senator Hume is somehow not being directly relevant to the question he asked, of which it sounds like he and his team confirmed she was being directly re relevant. Order. There are definitely, on the point of order, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't take points of order remotely under the provisions for remote participation. I think, was that you, Senator Thorpe? My apologies. Um, on the point of order, when Senator Hume did reference that case, I definitely did hear see nods and hear acknowledgements of finally from part of the chamber. That happens to be down your end, Senator McKim. You are asking me, however, I think given that this matter is in the public domain, um, I can't instruct a minister how to answer the question, and I believe in this sense she is being directly relevant by turning to this particular issue. There's an opportunity to debate the question answer after question time, but she is being directly relevant. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So the court, Senator McKim, uh, the court declared that the Minister for the Environment owe a duty, of ca uh, duty to take reasonable care to avoid causing personal industry or death to young people in Australia arising from emissions of carbon dioxide to the Earth's atmosphere and determining the Vickery Extension Project. But on the 16th of July 2021, the Minister for the Environment filed a notice of appeal and is seeking an expedited hearing for that. The Minister for the Environment and Order. the government take very seriously their responsibilities under the Act to protect the environment and, in doing so, the interests of all Australians. But as the matter is before the court, it would be inappropriate to comment on this case any further. Senator McKim. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, President. Minister, given your previous answer and your assertion that the minister has appealed Justice Bromberg's recent finding that, in fact, she does owe a duty of care to Australia's children to, to provide them with the same climate, why does the minister believe that she does not owe Australia's children a duty of care to provide them with a safe climate into the future? Order. Order. Senator. Senator Hume, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In appealing the judge's finding about the impact of greenhouse gas emissions, the minister does not dispute that our climate is in fact changing. The notice of appeal simply raises a point of legal argument. Some of the factual findings that the judge made were not based on the evidence before him. Senator McKim, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. The uh, appeal papers lodged by the minister, in fact, and I will quote directly from them, argue that Justice Bromberg erred in finding that the minister owed a duty to take reasonable care to avoid causing personal injury or death to per persons under the age of 18 arising from the emissions of carbon dioxide. Given the IPCC report released last night. How can you possibly look Australia's children in the eye and argue that you don't owe them a duty of care? Senator Hume. Possibly look any Australian in the eye and say what happened this morning at Parliament House was not a crime. A crime. Duty of Order. care. That was a crime. Order. And you're defending them, Senator McKim. You're defending Order. them. Senators McKim and Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson, at least pretend to abide by the standing orders rather than act with mock outrage to show contempt for the Senate. This place works when there is a modicum of responsibility in the way we act. Senator Hume, have you concluded your answer? You've concluded your answer. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on maritime security threats in the Middle East region? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Smith for his, uh, his question. Mr President, the Australian government unequivocally condemns the armed drone attack on the civilian tanker MV Mercer Street in waters off Oman, which has been attributed to Iran. Iran's reckless, unlawful, deliberate and targeted attack on a merchant vessel is a clear violation of international law. Australia offers its sincere condolences to the families and friends of the British and Romanian citizens who were killed in this attack, conducted by a drone that was filled with explosives and deliberately flown into the bridge of the tanker. Iran's denials, denials of responsibility for the attack are not credible, Mr. President. The Australian government fully supports calls for this Iranian escalation of attacks on civilian shipping to be addressed by the United Nations. Such attacks are now a lethal risk to all merchant shipping in, international merchant shipping in the region. Iran's deliberate attacks on shipping, whether from limpet mines or drones or any other means, must cease, and those responsible for giving orders and carrying out the attacks must be held to account. That the MV Mercer Street also had connections to Israel makes this act more concerning. Iran's shadow war continuing against the State of Israel breaches every foundational principle of the international community of nations and the key obligations of all member states of the United Nations. It is appropriate for the United Nations to address this conduct and its impact on regional stability and the disruption of peace. Mr. President. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate on other threats to regional stability in the Middle East? Senator Payne. Mr. President, yesterday, the 9th of August, marked 76 years since the last use of atomic weapons in armed conflict at Nagasaki. The resolve of the international community to prevent the acquisition and use of nuclear weapons has grown year on year. Today, more than ever, the global community insists on compliance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and supports the inspection and verification work of the International Atomic Energy, Authority, Energy Agency. The Australian government calls on Iran to work in good faith with the parties, including to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, to return to compliance with the NPT, to allow complete IAEA verification of its peaceful intentions for nuclear technology and to reverse its steps towards weapons-grade nuclear material. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise of other concerns in the Middle East? Senator Payne. Mr President, against last week's anniversary of the tragic port ex explosion in Beirut, which we marked here in this chamber, Hezbollah chose to launch a number of rocket attacks into Israel. Israel made proportionate responses, Mr President. 
Hezbollah's use of, human, of villages as human shields is against international law. And in this regard, the courageous actions of Lebanese civilians to stop one of the Hezbollah mobile rocket launchers from escaping is worthy of public recognition. This action resulted in the arrest of the terrorists. Iran's well-documented supply of funds and weapons to terror organisations like the Hamas brigades, Islamic Jihad and others fuels instability and violence, Mr President. And Australia joins international calls for Iran to also cease the abuses of human rights inside Iran, particularly the persecution of religious minorities, including the Baha'i, Sunni Muslims, Christians and Zoroastrians, amongst others. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Reports indicate that Mr Morrison will pursue freedom incentives, and Mr Morrison has said that Australians who have a vaccine will have vaccine certificates by October this year. Does this minister support vaccine certificates, and does he support these certificates being mandatory for air travel within Australia and overseas? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator O'Neill for uh, her question. There's a few things that are relevant to, uh, to that question. It, uh, it is important that, uh, that Australians be in a position to be able to uh, provide a form of proof of vaccination. Uh, the importance of that uh, is likely to be the case for a number of reasons, not just uh, medical reasons. Uh, that's why uh, the government has been working in terms of the technology uh, to enable people to be able to download their vaccine certificate uh, as, uh, as part of their uh, Apple Wallet uh, uh, technology platforms, for example. It's also why work is underway uh, for, um, uh, for uh, high security proof of vaccination uh, linkage to um, uh, passport type documents for international travel. Uh, a number of countries of the world have made it clear already that uh, that uh, vaccination may be uh, an important part or, uh, or a requirement in relation to entry to their nations in the future, and so Australians uh, will likely need and require that sort of uh, technology and support to be able to, uh, to make uh, a proof of vaccination and demonstrate that as part of their travels and their engagements. Uh, in terms of uh, requirements in relation to vaccination in Australia and for uh, domestic travel. Um, uh, airlines themselves, uh, some have indicated that they uh, expect this to be a requirement for, uh, for travel. Uh, those, uh, those are at this stage commercial decisions. Uh, governments have made certain decisions in relation to certain workforces, especially uh, those such as, uh, as aged care sectors where public health orders uh, could be used in relation to uh, vaccination. And uh, once again, uh, having effective proof of vaccination uh, may well be uh, a relevant consideration for people in those workforce environments or also for those perhaps visiting aged care facilities or the like in the future, uh, which is why having such technology available is important, Mr President. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Senator Canavan has declared, and I quote, I'm dead set against any vaccine passports. I know many of my nationals' colleagues will not be supporting any kind of rollout of vaccine passports in this country. Does this minister agree with Senator Canavan? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, I'll let Senator Canavan speak uh, for himself, particularly uh, in relation to the fact that uh, uh, I think you would find there is. Uh, some distinction between uh, what some may uh, declare vaccine passports to be uh, or some extension that some may make to what they believe vaccine passports could be used for uh, uh, versus what the reality uh, may end up being in terms of uh, how they are applied or used. Uh, I would hope that, uh, that all Australians understand in terms of the way I have explained the likely need uh, for technology platforms uh, that can provide proof of vaccination uh, as being uh, a sensible thing for people to have, to be able, as I say, to facilitate uh, their ability uh, to travel internationally in the future and what are likely to be changed circumstances, uh, to be able to work in sectors where there are requirements for uh, vaccination or to be able to meet other uh, potential public health requirements that states or territories uh, may impose uh, to continue to successfully manage COVID-19. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. 
When discussing vaccine certificates, Liberal Senator Alex Antic said, and I quote, the Nuremberg Code arises in the ashes of World War II, where I suppose there were medical procedures being done on people against their will. And you know, wow. it's a very, very slippery slope that we get into if we start doing this. Does this minister agree with Senator Antic? Wow. Wow. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, I can't say that I'd heard uh, heard that quote until the senator uh, used it. Order. I, I'm. I thank, thank you, Senator O'Neill. Thank you. Uh, I want to emphasise, uh, because the quote suggests perhaps a misunderstanding, that there's going to be some compulsion for people to have uh, a vaccine. The government's always been very clear uh, that uh, that uh, Australians uh, will face a choice in relation to getting vaccinated. We do urge all Australians to exercise that choice. We urge all Australians to exercise that choice. And Mr. President, I'm very pleased that some 234,899 Australians uh, turned out yesterday uh, as part of the vaccination program, uh, pushing the number of people uh, and vaccine doses administered to some 13.958 million uh, people across Australia. And that, Mr. President, uh, is a demonstration of the momentum that is building across a rollout that has now seen 44.7 per cent of Birmingham, those aged over 16 receive at least their expired. first dose. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Selger. Can the Minister advise the Senate on how Australia is supporting the economic needs of our partners in the Pacific and Timor-Leste as we chart our way back from the COVID-19 pandemic together? Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, yes, I can. The pandemic continues to have a profound impact on Australia's economy, as it does on our Pacific and Southeast Asian neighbours. Now, economic recovery is a shared challenge, and we must face it together. Australia has continued to be a strong and steadfast partner to nations in our region throughout the pandemic. And all Australians, I think, can be proud uh, of the significant support we are providing to our friends uh, and neighbours. The economies of the Pacific, especially those reliant on tourism, are suffering badly. Australia is committed to supporting our Pacific family and is ready to respond to new challenges as part of our Pacific step up. Now, through our partnerships for recovery, the government has made our highest ever contribution to Pacific development in 2020-21, providing an estimated $1.7 billion dollars to the region. Now, our funding is supporting the twin goals of health and economic recovery in the Pacific. The funding delivers critical financing to the Pacific and Timor-Leste to help mitigate fiscal crises, maintain essential health services, sustain aviation connectivity and protect the most vulnerable people. Our funding is providing direct financial support to Fiji's budget, uh, which is bolstering social protection schemes for those in need. In PNG, we are supporting a new child nutrition grant, the first social protection payment of its type to be introduced. We have also restarted Pacific Labor initiatives to boost economic activity and incomes for Pacific families, as well as to support our farmers and industries meet critical workforce needs. Australia has also directly facilitated the delivery of over a million vaccine doses which will reach $1.5 million, million by the end of this week and over 100 tonnes of humanitarian supplies on more than 400 Australian-supported flights. Our commitment and support to the Pacific and Timor-Leste is deep and enduring, and we will always support our Pacific family in their time of need. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is Australia working with nations in our region to deliver world-class infrastructure to support long-term economic recovery and grow future prosperity in our region? Senator Selger. Well, thank you. Well, through grants and loans provided by the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, the Australian government continues to invest in high-quality and transformative infrastructure projects across the Pacific. We're helping Pacific nations to deliver uh, projects that they have identified as priorities for their people and we are lending on sustainable terms uh, that will not add further debt distress to their budgets. Now, in Palau, uh, we are financing the Palau submarine cable, which will see fast, reliable, high-speed internet 
connecting Palau to the world. The Tina River hydropower and transmission system in the Solomon Islands will deliver large-scale clean energy for Honiara and surrounding communities. And in PNG, I recently announced Australian support for the redevelopment of PNG's major ports and the transnational highway, truly nation-building infrastructure which will transform PNG's trade-based economy. Now, with a future AIFFP investment pipeline of over one billion dollars, Australia is more committed than ever Order. to working Senator with Pacific Selger, nations time for the to support has them in their... Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How is Australian support contributing to economic stability and job creation throughout the Pacific, as well as for Australian businesses? Senator Seselja. Well, thank you. Now, supporting the region's economic recovery recovery is critical to Australia's own recovery and to securing jobs both in Australia and across the Pacific. On Pacific Labor programs uh, are high priorities for nations in our region and indeed is one of Australia's highest priorities for the Pacific. Now, Through the Pacific Labor Scheme and the Seasonal Worker Program, we're providing valuable employment opportunities to more than 14,000 Pacific and Timor-Leste workers, which is not just boosting the workers' incomes but helping to stimulate the economies of the region. These workers are meeting the critical workforce needs of hundreds of Australian businesses in a range of sectors, including horticulture, meat processing, tourism and aged care, just to name a few. And as the Prime Minister announced uh, on Friday at the Pacific Island Forum Leaders' Meeting, we will double the number of Pacific workers in Australia between now and March next year. This is all part of our plan to secure the economic recovery and protect jobs both in Australia and across the region. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Ms. Minister Seselja. Senator, it's no secret that I've been sceptical about climate change in the past. I used to think all this stuff about climate change was absolute rubbish. That was only in 2017. Since then, I've listened and I've watched and I've changed my mind. And I think a lot of people like me have changed their minds about climate change too. Because anyone can see that the weather we're getting now is not natural. And that report from the IPCC yesterday should scare the hell out of us. Senator, unless something changes, we're going to hit 1.5 degrees of warming within two decades. It is time for your government to stand up and admit that you were wrong too. Will you admit that we need to tackle, that we need to change tack here and do something very different to stop this from happening or at least slowing it down? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Lambie for her question. Uh, there is no doubt that the Australian government takes the issue of climate change and emissions reductions uh, very seriously, and I'm pleased. I'm pleased that Senator Lambie is uh, is calling for action. But I can I can take Senator Lambie and the Senate uh, through some of the measures that we actually are taking, which demonstrate how seriously we take this issue. So, uh, when Australia makes commitments to reduce emissions, unlike perhaps uh, some other nations, we take those very seriously and we deliver on those commitments. Uh, it's not just about making a commitment, it is about delivering it. So uh, for between 2005 and 2019, we reduced our, between 2020, we reduced our emissions by 20 per cent. Now we look around the world, there are many countries, uh, many countries in the OECD, uh, in fact the average is about 9 per cent, so we're about double the emissions reductions of advanced economies. If you look at the G20, about half of G20 economies have seen their emissions uh, increase during that period. So we take that very seriously. We take seriously uh, our investment in renewables, which, uh, when we see in, in relation to solar, is at the highest levels in the world uh, on a per capita basis, much higher on a per capita basis than other countries. And I, I hear the interjections from the Green senators there, always making a constructive contribution on behalf of their activist arm that we saw outside parliament vandalising this place today. But unlike the Greens, uh, unlike the Greens, we actually believe that when you take these measures, you need to do it in an economically responsible way. One of the uh, well, one, well, I do. Well, one of the other areas, one of the other areas we are doing is we are supporting climate resilience in the Pacific. We are doing that through significant investments of hundreds of millions of dollars. If we were to take, take the Greens' advice and destroy our economy tomorrow on the altar of uh, their climate goals, we wouldn't Order. be able to support our Pacific partners. So we're doing our bit. We're working with our international partners to lower emissions, to see more investment in renewables, but we'll do it in a way that is sustainable for our economy and jobs Senate as well. Order on my left. Order. 
Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Swen, uh, France and Sweden replace their whole coal fleet with nuclear power, and they now have the lowest per capita carbon emissions in the world. Meanwhile, we've got nearly a third of the world's uranium here, but for some reason, we won't use it ourselves. This government says that we can cut Australia's emissions using technology, not taxes. If you're actually serious about that, will the government consider replacing our coal-fired power stations with nuclear power? Senator Seselja. I'm, I'm hearing less hear hears from the Greens for that question uh, in, relation to, uh, in relation to nuclear power. But look, when it comes uh, to that issue, and I thank uh, Senator Lambie for the question, uh, Senator Lambie would be aware that uh, there is a moratorium on nuclear generation in this country, and of course, uh, we believe as a government that any changes to that would require bipartisan support. There's been a blanket anti-nuclear stance from the Labor Party, I think, since the 1970s. So, uh, what we've said in relation to this technology, uh, like all technologies, we are watching uh, developments. Last year, the Morrison government released Australia's technology investment roadmap. In the roadmap, small modular reactors are identified as a watching brief technology. Uh, there is no doubt. Uh, that we, we need to take action uh, in this space. But when it comes to the issue of nuclear, uh, we all know uh, that when you have a blanket ban on one side of politics, and given the long lead times that are needed for this type of investment, uh, we know that there are significant challenges to the ability uh, to look at that type of technology. But when it comes to other moves, uh, we're doing it through renewables, and we're doing it through a technology, not tax, taxes approach, which is where Order, we're going to be Senator taking it Selger. into the future. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. In 2015, I did a fuel security, and the biggest thing we had was nuclear power, and it was made very clear it would be a 10-year turnaround. We're still sitting here now, six years later, six years later, and the Liberal Party is still on, hasn't even got past the first base of doing anything about nuclear power. So please stop the wishy-washy and can get up, and give me an explanation of what you intend to do when we own nearly one third of the world's uranium, and you're still sitting on your butts and not doing anything about nuclear power for this country. Senator Seljo. Uh, well, thank you very much, Senator Lambie. I, I, I think I, I largely addressed uh, your second supplementary in the answer to your first supplementary. Uh, so I don't know that there's much I can add, and certainly not much that I could add uh, which, would, which would satisfy your answer. But what I would say is this. Uh, when it comes to taking action uh, on climate change, uh, reducing emissions, uh, we always have to take a very practical real-world approach, and that is what this government uh, has always sought to do. It is taking the issue seriously, but it is also recognising uh, that if we don't work uh, for global action with countries right around the world, uh, if we don't work to support existing industries, if we don't make sure that we have strong uh, baseload power to deliver, uh, then our economy uh, would go backwards. We would see jobs shed, uh, and it would all be for naught uh, if, we are, if we are sacrificing our economy and not actually seeing it move the dial when it comes to the environment. So we take a very responsible approach which balances all of these realities Order, as laid out in earlier, Senator earlier answers. Billick remotely. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The Morrison government has sent more than 11,000 debt notices for $32 million to social welfare recipients who receive JobKeeper. How much of the $13 billion in JobKeeper payments it paid to companies who saw an increase in profit has the Morrison government sought to recover? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Billick uh, for the question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, it's important as always that, uh, that where uh, programs are operated uh, and claims have been made against the uh, guidelines, conditions, or eligibility of those programs, uh, that steps are made uh, to recover uh, those funds. Uh, that's the case in relation to JobKeeper, like any other program. Uh, and whilst, uh, whilst Senator Billick, you have chosen to highlight uh, one component uh, of the recovery activity, and that is uh, in relation to uh, individuals who may have been in receipt uh, of other payments, such as uh, JobSeeker, uh, whilst also receiving JobKeeper. Uh, it is also the case that the Australian Taxation Office uh, has been pursuing uh, significant instances uh, of uh, overclaims, overpayments or inappropriate claims uh, with businesses. In fact, as of August, some $296.6 million uh, 
uh, has been identified uh, by the Australian Taxation Office with Australian businesses, uh, and the government takes very seriously uh, recovering those funds as well. Uh, approximately $185.5 million of those funds has been recovered to date. Uh, so, Mr President, on all of these fronts, what we are assessing against is the eligibility of businesses or individuals to the payments they received according to the guidelines at the time. It shouldn't be confused at all, Mr. President, of course, with some of the claims people make uh, about receipt of JobKeeper, which was entirely within the guidelines as they existed at the time. And those programs, that program in particular, has been identified by the Reserve Bank to have saved around 700,000 Australian jobs, uh, Mr. President. A crucial program in terms of keeping businesses afloat during a time when right across Australia they were having their doors shut, and in having the doors shut, of course, they were faced with the proposition of having to stand down their staff. JobKeeper avoided that, and it helped to ensure Australians kept their jobs and our economy was in Order. the strongest possible Senator position for recovery. Gillick, a supplementary question. Will the Morrison government seek to compulsorily recover a single dollar of the $13 billion of taxpayer money it paid to companies despite them seeing an increase in earnings during the pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I'm, not, I'm hoping that I heard all of Senator Billick's question uh, correctly there, uh, and because of part of the reason why I'm not sure whether I did, because uh, I think I answered Senator Billick's question in the primary question, that in terms of uh, the government seeking to recover funds from Australian businesses. Order, Senator. I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Point of order. Uh, if I could direct relevance, but perhaps I could assist. Uh, it was compulsory recover. <laughs> Senator Birmingham to continue. So, in terms of uh, in terms of recovering uh, funds from Australian businesses and compulsory recovering funds from any Australian businesses uh, that made inappropriate claims. Uh, the Australian Taxation Office uh, has the power uh, to be able to pursue and to recover funds uh, where necessary. Uh, as always, we use uh, the powers uh, judiciously, uh, be they individuals or businesses, uh, and, where possible, uh, repayment plans are negotiated or agreed uh, between parties. As said in the primary question, some $296.6 million in overpayments have been identified. Many of these were honest mistakes. But nonetheless, $185.5 million has been recovered, and the government will continue to pursue recovery uh, of the residual Senator amount. Birmingham. Senator Billick, a final supplementary question. While it's hounding social welfare recipients for $32 million, the Morrison government is happy to leave $13 billion in the pockets of companies that saw an increase in earnings, and is happy to use $660 million of taxpayers' money for car park courts like its Liberal Party money. When it comes to spending taxpayers' money, why is it one rule for those struggling on social welfare and another rule for everybody else? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. And, uh, and I note Senator Billick uh, saying, uh, why is it one rule for some and another for, uh, for others? Well, I can't help but think, Mr. President, you know, why is it the Labor Party pick on some but not others? Uh, why is it, of course, that they're after businesses or they're after religious organisations? But they overlook the millions of dollars that trade unions also received. That they Order. overlook the millions of dollars that trade unions received. So you know, why is it that they're so Order. selective in terms of who it is that they hate, who it is that they wish to vilify? The simple facts are that Australian businesses were having their doors slammed shut last year right across the country, in every state, in every Order. territory, as lockdowns and shutdowns occur. JobKeeper was born with Order. the simplest of eligibility criteria to seek to make it easy to save those jobs. It worked. It saved 700,000 jobs. We're not going to vilify Order. the businesses who were legitimately able to claim it, but I do note the hypocrisy of those who seem to overlook the trade Order. unions who are happy to Senator take the cash. Birmingham. Order. Order. Senator, Senator Van. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts, my fellow Victorian Senator, Senator Hume. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting businesses to access cheaper and faster broadband as part of our plan to chart Australia's way back 
from the COVID-19 pandemic. The Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Van for the question and for his enduring interest in uh, the connectivity and connection of all Australians to the NBN network. Mr. President, I am extraordinarily pleased to confirm that NBN Co will establish an additional 44 business fibre zones, providing access to ultra-fast business-grade broadband at reduced prices for an additional 60,000 businesses in Australia. Following Order. this announcement, NBN Co will ha now have a network of 284 business fibre zones nat nationally. Senator and that will cover 850,000 businesses. Well, no, I'll happily take the interjection. I'll happily take this interjection. Uh, Mr. President, because this government will not be lectured to you by those opposite on the NBN. This government has delivered the NBN efficiently and economically when Australians needed it the most. In fact, today there are over 11.97 million premises ready to connect. 99 per cent of Australian premises can now order an NBN service. More than 8.2 million premises have already connected to the NBN, and 75 per cent of homes and businesses are on 50 megabits or higher plans. In fact, following this announcement, the NBN Co will have a network of 284 business fibre zones nationally, covering over 850,000 businesses. Order, now, as Senator well as extending the business fibre zones footprint, NBN Co is further discounting its already competitive wholesale prices for business grade broadband in order to support more business access, uh, dedicated business grade fibre services. New and existing businesses within business fibre zones will benefit from further wholesale pricing reductions of up to 37 per cent. And for a business already within an NBN Co business fibre zone, Zone. This morning's announcement means savings of as much as $1,800 each and every Set year. Order. Businesses within those business fibre zones will benefit from access to NBN Co's premium business grade product, um, product enterprise Ethernet at no upfront cost, as well as CBD equivalent pricing, irrespective of where the business is located. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what do NBN Co's promising financial results that were announced today? mean for Australians. Senator Hume. Uh, th th thank you Senator again. Senator thank let you the again, Minister start Mr. before you interject. <laughs> Senator Hume. Thank you again, Mr. President. Well, I am extremely pleased to welcome NBN Co's announcements of its strong connection performance and the financial results for the 2020 and 2021 financial year. As I said earlier, there are now nearly 12 million premises ready to connect to the NBN. There have been 930,000 new connections in the year, with a total of 8.2 million premises now connected. Now, this represents around a 13 per cent increase on last year. Revenue has been growing as more households and more businesses are using the NBN for high-speed broadband. And it's ex extremely pleasing to see that 17 per cent of premises have chosen their plans from their retailer that provide download speeds of 100 megabits per second or even higher. The NBN Co is now generating positive operating earnings as me measured by EBITDA, measured by earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and amortisation, and is in fact now $1.35 billion Order, for the Senator year, Hume. which is a turnaround Time of $2 billion. From... Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how will NBN Co look to further improve the connectivity experience for Australians? Senator Hume. Mr President, NBN Co is now entering a new growth phase and is making new investments to provide even better broadband to all Australians. NBN Co is now focused on its $4.5 billion network investment plan to deliver gigabit capacity or capability on demand to 75 per cent of premises in the fixed line network as soon as 2023. In fact, in fact by calendar year end, the company plans to initiate a small volume launch of fibre to the node and fibre to the premise upgrades, making up to, one t up to 10,000 premises eligible to access the NBN Co's home ultra-fast plans, offering download speeds of up to one gigabit per second. It's forecast that 75 per cent of premises on the fixed line network, or around 8 million premises, will be able to access the highest, the highest speed home ultrafast services as soon as 2023. Order, Senator Hume. Senator Seward. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Qu Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Government Services, Minister Reynolds. Minister, the government has issued 11,771 people with a debt notice after a review of the income support payments and any job keeper income that they were paid that were paid to them by their employer. Have people in lockdown in New South Wales, Victoria, and recently in Queensland received these debt notices, and when did they receive them? The Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank uh, the Senator for her question. Uh, as those in this chamber know, it is the long-standing principle of Australia's social security system that people should be paid correctly according to their individual circumstances. The process ensures our social security system is sustainable into the future because it means that taxpayers only pay recipients what they're eligible for, no more and no less. It's the responsibility of people rece receiving the job seeker payment or other related social security repayments to report their employment income correctly and accurately to Services Australia. And that includes if they were also receiving job keeper in addition to job seeker. Services Australia communicated widely, including through the agency websites and social media channels, to inform customers of their obligation to report job keeper income as income and how it, could be impact, how it could impact the remainder of their income support. Around 79,000 individuals were identified as being at risk of incurring an overpayment uh, as they were declaring minimal income and were contacted by Australia, Services Australia from July last year, that is 2020. When a person is overpaid, my agencies will always write to them to let them know how much they were overpaid Order, and Senator explain Reynolds, why they Senator owe the money. Seward on um, order. This, Senator O'Neill, Senator Seawitt, on a point of order. Point, point of order. I did specifically ask about the number of people in lockdown in, that have received debt notices. And I appreciate the minister's additional information, but I particularly want to know about that. You've reminded the minister of that part of the question. I have been listening carefully, and until this point, I, I do consider the information to be pr being provided to be directly relevant to the subject of the question. You've reminded the minister, though, of, your, of, your, of that part of the question. I call the minister to continue. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And in this case, given the complexity and the importance of this issue, I think that the context uh, is vitally important. So, if someone was in receipt of both JobKeeper payment and an income support payment, they needed to report the JobKeeper payment amount like any other employment income, and this was always very clear to recipients. Um, under, under job, so just make it very clear also that no individual has had to pay back JobKeeper, whereas um, Senator Birmingham has already uh, clarified uh, that 296. Uh, million has been identified as being overpaid to businesses. Order, Senator Reynolds. Senator Seawitt, supplementary question. Thank you. Um, I still don't know how many people in lockdown have these notices. Um, did, you, did the government give any consideration to the fact that people who receive these payments may now be unemployed and continue to be experiencing financial distress? Senator Reynolds. Look, thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, I presume what you're talking about is last year during uh, JobKeeper when that was active, because obviously we have a, a improved the system of payments from the COVID disaster payment process. But as at the 30th of April, if that is the case, uh, Senator Seward, as of the 30th of April this year, 11,771 customers had a debt raised after completion of their JobKeeper compliance review which totals around $32.8 million, and this work is uh, ongoing. Uh, and as always, uh, if uh, clients are in financial distress or uh, have other problems, they can always talk to Services Australia to seek some relief. Senator C, with a final supplementary question. The government claims that both Job Seeker and Job Keeper programs have strong compliance frameworks, yet you have gone after those on income support as per usual and let billionaires like Jerry Harvey off the hook. When will you issue billionaires like Jerry Harvey with debt notices? Senator Reynolds. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I just completely reject the premise of that question? And uh, it's been very interesting. Labor have been deliberately conflating the repayment of JobKeeper payments uh, that were due back from businesses in terms of compliance activities and individuals. So the fact is, as I've just said, $296 million has been identified in overpayments to businesses, and $185 million has been recovered from businesses so far. And while I'm at it, you might like to also ask Labor, and, uh, <laughs> and in, because unions, unions receive $22 million worth of JobKeeper, and I bet you not a single cent of that has been repaid. And in fact, $7.4 million of the union's JobKeeper money went straight to the Labor Party. So how about asking them about the unions and their payments that they would have received from JobKeeper payments themselves? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. But I, I do acknowledge the last question came from Senator Seward, who had a notable announcement today. I know we will all have an appropriate time to uh, farewell Senator Seward. In the meantime, no doubt she'll keep holding us all to account too. I understand um, Senator Colbeck would like to add to an answer. Senator Thank Colbeck. you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I took, undertook to provide some more information on Moderna in response to Senator Gallagher's question. The Moderna deal was announced on the 13th of May following the completion of negotiations with Moderna. Once the TGA received the regulatory submission from Moderna, the TGA then took 23 days to review and approve it. Mr. President, the Australian government has secured 25 million doses of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine to further diversify our vaccine portfolio, as well as provide access to a booster variant vaccine, should this be required in the future. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Minister Colbeck. So we now move to taking note. Are there any uh, motions to take note of answers? Uh, Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Madam Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham to the questions yeah, yeah. asked by uh, Senator Just a Bill. moment, uh, Senator McAllister. I'll get uh, Senator Gallagher to move that we take note. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, of items. Um, thank you. Do you have an issue? I move that the Senate take notes of questions asked by Labor. Um, Senator Billick to Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Thank you. Please continue, Senator McAllister. Well, thank you, Deputy President. Earlier this year, we found out that 13 billion in job people went to firms that increased their turnover during the pandemic. It went to Monaco-based billionaires. It went to men's-only clubs. It went to the highest fee private schools in the country. It is a shocking amount of waste. 13 billion is more than the government spent on the childcare subsidy last year. It is more than the government spent on public schools last year. JobKeeper was supposed to go to the firms that were suffering to support the connection between those firms and their workforces. It was never meant to go to highly profitable firms. And like so many things offered by this government, it's a good idea implemented very badly. And just reflect on what it would have meant had the Morrison government avoided this waste. It could have afforded to extend JobKeeper to the one million cattle workers who missed out on any support. It could have saved additional people from losing their jobs and their livelihoods during the first wave of the pandemic. And now, now we would have more to spend on supporting Australians that are currently affected by lockdowns and struggling to pay the rent and put food on the table. The Prime Minister has never asked any of these recipients to pay back a single cent. He has said that calls to pay it back are the politics of envy. And Minister Birmingham has said that we shouldn't shame and vilify the businesses who took billions in JobKeeper while turning profits. The Morrison government continues to resist Labor's calls for transparency and for accountability. They refuse to crack down on businesses that won't turn back payments despite turning monster profits. It's a strong contrast with what's been reported today. 11,000 people who receive income support payments have been sent debt notices of almost 33 million. 
And many of these are vulnerable people, people who su sought support during the worst health and economic crisis Australia has faced in nearly 100 years. And these people shouldn't be punished. There's two stories, two stories, aren't there? There's one story for the rich and powerful, and there's another story for those that aren't. But it's very on brand for this government. This is the government, of course, that set up the robo-debt scheme, and it's worth reflecting on what the federal court thought about the impact of that scheme on those who suffered under it. Justice Murphy said one thing stands out. The financial hardship, anxiety and distress, including suicidal ideation, and in some cases suicide, that people or their loved ones say was suffered as a result of the robo-debt scheme, and that many say they felt shame and hurt at being wrongly branded welfare cheats. That's what he said. And the double standard is quite breathtaking. No effort, no effort spared to claw back money paid to some of our most vulnerable. No effort at all expended on clawing back money from big business. Indeed, the government actually seems pretty relaxed about handing out money to billionaire shareholders and CEOs, just as long as nobody knows about it. Transparency is actually not a radical solution or an idea, is it? Both the New Zealand and the US governments keep public databases of companies that receive income support. But the Morrison government is so opposed to transparency that it made it clear yesterday that if the uh, opposition and crossbench insisted on transparency provisions, they were willing to delay the JobKeeper legislation that was debated yesterday. And it really says something about this government. It says something about the Prime Minister, that he is prepared to let the livelihoods of Australians on COVID support payments be collateral damage in his fight against transparency. And that's an outcome Labor didn't want to risk. But we strongly believe that the public deserves to know how its money is being spent. Transparency is a basic obligation, never more important than in a time when we need our citizens to have trust in our government. And that is why we will keep looking for opportunities to force the Morrison government to reveal just how much JobKeeper money went to firms that actually increased their turnover during the pandemic, because Australian voters deserve to know. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, and I seem to recall uh, it wasn't all that long ago uh, we had Labor actually uh, condoning uh, the robo debt scheme. Uh, they themselves were the ones that brought back in uh, the averaging scheme under the Paul Keating government in the late 80s. Uh, and I'll quote from uh, the member for Sydney, Tanya Plibersek, is it minister, member for Sydney? Uh, who said uh, um, the people who fail to come to this arrangement should settle their debts. Um, there was also the quote uh, from uh, uh, Bill, uh, member f oh, this was, this was uh, member for Sydney, if people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. Um, and, you know, this is also uh, from the former uh, deputy uh, opposition leader. The automation of this process will free up resources and result in more people uh, being referred to the tax garnishee process, retrieving more outstanding debt on behalf of the taxpayers. And from the member from Maribong, uh, Maribong, sorry, apologies, I don't know how to pronounce that wrong. It is important. It, it is important that the government explores different means of debt recovery to ensure that those who have received more money than they are entitled to repay their debt. And uh, the, uh, Chris Bowen, what's his name? I'm not sure. My apologies for that. Um, McMahon. Uh, he's also called for an apology, uh, sorry, a refund of uh, uh, money uh, collect, you know, overpayments. Uh, through the robo debt scheme. Now, no one's um, saying that the scheme was perfect and that we haven't made mistakes. We vote up to that. Um, but you know, we will never apologise for trying to automate uh, you know, processes in, in terms of tax and transfer system 
in this country. But when it comes to talking about uh, subsidies for the rich, uh, I think Labor should take a good look in the mirror themselves, because we, we just, uh, as, as uh, the Treasurer pointed out yesterday, uh, the unions themselves received $22 million uh, in JobKeeper fees. Now, uh, given the enormous billions of dollars, the, the billions of dollars they collect uh, every year from superannuation fees, uh, they themselves are the last people who need handouts in a time of a crisis. And let's be honest, I mean, the union industry really today is nothing more than the finance brokering arm of the industry super funds. You have to ask yourself why they aren't being taxed. Now, I know Labor love to complain about, you know, the, the coalition loves to give tax breaks to big business, but if there was a big business in this country, it's the industry super funds. It's the industry super funds and their uh, uh, brokerage, brokerage arm, the, union, uh, the unions themselves. And when you look at the amount of uh, money these guys, the unions collect uh, by threatening to go on strike with these tier one builders, I mean, in Queensland, you know, they threaten to go on strike if it gets hotter than 30 degrees. Uh, which is a bit of a joke, really, because you know, anyone knows after September in, in Queensland it's 30 degrees quite often, so I'm not quite sure when we expect to build anything, get anything built in Queensland. Uh, so good luck on, on, with the Olympic Games for that. Uh, and of course, the other one is the great big renewable energy subsidies uh, that also go to the big end of town. I mean, we've got $10 Senator billion. Dollars, uh, Senator Rennick, I have been listening carefully, and you have drifted yeah. off the taking note response, and I'm listening carefully for a segue back, and I haven't heard it yet. I'm, I'm segueing back to the to the notion that you know basically I know uh, Senator McAllister was implying that we are always giving tax breaks to the big end of town, and we were looking after the big end of town. And I'm merely pointing out, Madam Deputy Chair, that you know Labor should look in the mirror. Labor should look in the mirror and look at how they look after the big end of town. Uh, and you know, as I was pointing out, whether it be the unions. Or whether it be super funds, or whether it be you know large corporations that get generous subsidies for energy, and, I, and, I, and I'm agnostic here. I don't think any energy company uh, should be getting um, government subsidies. Uh, I know you know one of the big myths is that somehow uh, our agricultural industry and our fishing industry and our timber industry and our mining industry get free uh, diesel subsidy. Uh, subsidies. That's not true. They're actually rebates, um, i.e., they've paid the money and they're getting back what they Senator paid. Rennett, so it's mutual. You do need to uh, get back. To okay, the so I'm coming back response. to robo debt. And can I say that technology, albeit flawed, and I've worked on many uh, IT projects myself, and I can tell you, you can always take the cost of an IT project, double it, and times it by three, because that's how much it'll end up costing. Um, but look, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to take on board. I, I would love to actually look at that robo debt stuff myself, because having come from a, a, a systems implementation program, uh, I'm sure there's ways we could fix the system. But you know, we were trying to do the right Thank thing. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Your time has now expired. Um, Senator Brown. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I'm always interested to, uh, listening to the coalition talk about robo debt. They never talk about the fact that they had to say sorry. They never talk about the fact that there was a $1.8 billion awarded to the people, to nearly 500,000 people, victims of their robo debt scheme. They never talk about the fact that the judge said it was shameful and unlawful. They never talk about any of that. They try to blame the Labor Party. When, of course, this was a scheme designed by the Morrison government. And what is happening now and what happened in question time today, what we got was responses relating to the job, job keeper was the rank hypocrisy of the government when it comes to enforcement and compliance measures applied against those that are most vulnerable. And the interesting thing was Senator Birmingham's response. He tried to throw back to the Labor Party, you, look, you just look after those that can't look after themselves, the more vulnerable. Yes, we do. I mean, seriously. It is quite clear in the responses that we got that there are two standards here. One for big corporations that have done well from this pandemic. Now, JobKeeper was good for people that were the prop where they were losing their profits. I know that. I know two people that 
um, received JobKeeper, two companies, to, that received JobKeeper. You, know, you can have a, a little chuckle behind your mask over there, Senator, but, that, but they had to show that they were going backwards in profit by about, oh, from memory, about 30 per cent. So this is really interesting when you talk about the guidelines here. So we've got one, one uh, standard for big corporations that have done well and another for ordinary Australians struggling through the repeated lockdowns and border closures, trying to make ends meet, trying to put food on the table. It's, it's just a form of uh, hypocrisy that we really have come to expect from the Morrison Liberal government. <clears throat> One rule for the rich and powerful, you know, where you get off scot-free with taxpayer, um, taxpayer support and when businesses have never been better, and another for the working people of Australia who have just tried to do the right thing, faced with some of the most difficult circumstances Australians have experienced in generations. Because as we've seen highlighted in this place, this is a government more than comfortable, indeed from what it appears overly eager to send more than 11,000 debt notices to welfare recipients who receive JobKeeper while simultaneously handing out an astonishing $13 billion in JobKeeper payments to companies that actually increase their earnings. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about companies that made increase their profits. That's what we're talking about. They didn't need the JobKeeper. They inc increased their profits during the pandemic. Just think about, just think about that. And I really ask the senators on the other side to just think about that. $13 billion to line the pockets of businesses who didn't need the support. Meanwhile, there were hundreds and thousands, most probably millions of Australians out there, who had their income smashed it, in desperate need of support, a great many of whom this government has ignored. Think about all the Australians who work in the gig sector, struggling, ignored by the Morrison Liberal government, while their industry was shuttered. In many, if not most parts of the country, it's shuttered again while the rest of the nation has to deal with cancelled shows, gigs, and entertainment and sporting events that ordinarily employ hundreds of thousands of Australians, where is the support for these workers in our creative and arts industries? What about our academics and other university sector workers? Denied JobKeeper. Tens of thousands put out of work because of the decisions made by this government, decisions by, made by Mr Scott Morrison a Prime Minister who turns the other cheek when millions of Australians need support because you know he doesn't hold a hose, not his problem, but when it comes to corporate welfare for the most successful firms in the nation, hello, here's a cool $13 billion in cold, hard cash. No questions asked. Take it. Thank you, Senator um, Brown. Your time has expired. Senator McMahon. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Um, I would, I would like to respond um, to senators that have um, taken note of answers to the question uh, from Senator Billick to Senator Birmingham. Um, I must admit I am a little bit confused, perplexed, having conniptions even. Um, when we first talked about JobKeeper, when the Prime Minister first announced JobKeeper, those on the other side canned it. It'll never work. What a stupid idea. Um, it turns out that they were wrong. Uh, in fact, they were more than wrong. Uh, this was a, a revolutionary scheme. Uh, it hadn't been done anywhere around the world on the scale that it was proposed to be done here. And it turns out it was a wonderful scheme that saved many, many jobs and many, many businesses. Um, let's face it, we all understand, well at least those of us on this side understand, that uh, the vast majority of Australians that are employed in private enterprise are employed in small to medium businesses. So there's literally no point in saving jobs. I mean, you can sit someone down in the corner and you can pay them money to keep training for their job, but if they're not working for a business, 
that, that job doesn't exist. You can, you can save them and you can keep paying them and keep them ready to work, but if in the meantime all of those businesses that employ those workers cease to exist, then, then you've got nothing for them to come back to. So despite the criticism from Labor, JobKeeper was a very, very good thing that this government brought in. And I'm constantly told by businesses in the Northern Territory as I travel around, thank you, it was JobKeeper that saved us. We would not be here today if it weren't for JobKeeper. Now, of course, on this side of the chamber, we seem to have not gotten the crystal ball that those on the other side have, because they seem to be able to look into it and predict what's going to happen. The, there, was, there was doom and gloom at the start. The whole country was locked down. There were predictions of huge levels of unemployment, huge levels of unemployment. We thought many people would be unemployed, many businesses would go under, and uh, we would have no economy left uh, when we finally got on top of the pandemic. Now, fortunately, and, and we felt this on, on this side as well, we thought that, that this was going to be a tragedy. We had to stop in and do something to stop that from happening. And we did this. We stood up and we got in with JobKeeper, saving those businesses. Now, we couldn't predict how the pandemic would go and how the economy would respond. And some quite amazing things happened that we certainly didn't predict, that nobody predicted. I, I was amazed um, in the Northern Territory at the time of the first lockdown. Fortunately, we've only had one tiny one since. We're very lucky. But um, <clears throat> going around and talking to business and seeing how business innovated and managed to get through, and businesses that in fact thrived in the lockdown. I, I remember speaking to one particular business in Tennant Creek who thought that um, it was a, a family-run business and he thought that they were going to go under. But it turns out they became incredibly busy because they had a few different businesses, but one of them was supplying skip bins. Now, who would have thought that a pandemic would create a demand for skip bins? And yet it did, because everyone was cleaning out their homes and yards, needed to dispose of it. So this business boomed. And many other businesses boomed, and many recovered and are doing really well. Now, they're penalising us, or trying to penalise us and criticise us for the fact that we did something that helped business not only survive, but thrive. And we now have an obligation to taxpayers to recover money that was paid either accidentally or in some cases claimed deliberately when it shouldn't have been paid. There is nothing wrong with that. And we are not targeting poor people. This is across the board to anybody who received payments that they were not entitled to. There is nothing wrong with recovering funds on behalf of taxpayers. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Your time has expired. Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, Senator McMahon said at the commencement of her remarks that she was confused. Uh, that was the strongest part of her contribution. And nothing that she said over the succeeding five minutes did anything to undermine the perspicacity of that original remark. I think, in fact, the government itself is willfully confused, is absolutely determined to put its own interest uh, and the interest of its mates ahead of the interests of the people in Australia who they should be actually looking after. We are in the depths of a social and public health and economic crisis. More than half of the country in lockdown, in some parts of the country, like Sydney here, with no end in sight because of the government's failure on vaccines. And in the middle of this crisis, when people are uncertain about their jobs and household incomes, fearful for the future, the Morrison government decided to issue 11,771 of our most vulnerable Australians, the people least secure in this COVID crisis with debt notices because of JobKeeper. Notices 
for amounts of money that may be nothing to the people who sit on the government side of the chamber, a few hundred dollars here, a few thousand dollars there, but those notices will strike absolute fear into families right across the country. Uh, and it's the hypocrisy. I may well be in Sydney and not in Canberra with you today, but you can smell the hypocrisy from here. You can see the absolute misallocation of priorities and you can see the absolute willful determination of this government to look after itself and its mates rather than the interest of ordinary Australians. Contrast the approach of the government in terms of compliance uh, and protecting and, and, and going after welfare recipients with its approach on two other issues. Previous senators have pointed out uh, that in terms of the government's approach to corporate recipients of JobKeeper, uh, that there's an entirely different approach. One company, Harvey Norman, received $22 million. It recorded a $462 million profit. Half of that on the back of taxpayer receipts. Uh, Mr Harvey alone re received $78 million. 30 ASX companies recorded higher profits and received hundreds of millions of dollars in JobKeeper allowances. A complete misallocation of resources and priorities uh, problems that were easy to foresee. Contrast it with the government's approach to how it approaches public money when it's looking at its own interest. Every week there is another rort scheme. It was sports rorts, over a hundred million dollars, where public money was misdirected away from the interests of community sports clubs to the Morrison government's own re-election prospects community development rorts, hundreds of millions of dollars allocated in an entirely partisan way, regional rorts, hundreds of millions of dollars allocated in an intensely partisan way for the government's own narrow political priorities, infrastructure rorts. And of course, this week we discover car park rorts, where the government's allocated money in an entirely partisan way ignored all of the recommendations of the department to allocate money to marginal electorates, some of whom didn't even have a railway station adjacent to the car park that they were building, and allocated in an entirely political way. Well, there's no interest in accountability for hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars misused for the Morrison government's narrow partisan interest, no interest in public accountability and recovering billions of dollars that's been shoveled out the door, uh, not to achieve its purpose of protecting people's jobs, but as lifted corporate profits uh, and lifted shareholder uh, dividends and lifted executive salaries and produced zero jobs in the process. This government has entirely lost its way, lost its capacity to act in the public interest. It's got no interest in that accountability. It just wants to put pressure on ordinary Australians Thank who are the Senator most vulnerable. Ayers, your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Acting Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given to uh, Senator McKim. Uh, from Senator Hume, representing the Environment Minister. Senator McKim was asking the very important question. Does the Environment Minister of Australia have a duty of care to our nation's children? And the reason this is an important question is because right now we are confronted with some of the most damning and serious scientific facts that humanity has ever seen. We are facing catastrophic climate change, catastrophic weather events and a threat to the whole of humanity. And yet what we see from this government is a response that is glib, that is full of spin and that is more of the marketing regimes of madmen than it is of a responsible government. And while this is unfolding, we have right on foot 
an appeal to the Federal Court of Australia of our own Environment Minister to deny that as a minister of the Crown that she owes a duty of care to Australia's children for the impacts of global warming and climate catastrophe. Last night, the UN's IPCC handed down a very chilling summary of what our world faces if we do not act. It is crystal clear that this is the decade that we need drastic action to cut carbon pollution if we are to give our planet and humanity a fighting chance. And I think about the responsibilities as adults in this place, as parents, as politicians, as leaders, to not just the next generation but to today's young people. When we are facing a cliff that if we go over, it's going to be very, very difficult, in fact, near impossible, to return. We have to get out of fossil fuels. We have to end the expansion of coal, oil and gas, and we have to transition faster than ever to renewables and clean energy sources if we are to get our climate back on track. We need to be investing in our environment and, bi and biodiversity to help Mother Nature repair herself. And all the while, we have the Prime Minister spinning and spinning and spinning, pretending that he is doing everything in his power, gaslighting the entire nation, undermining the health and the safety of our children, putting at risk our economy and our trade relations across the globe. Who is the Prime Minister trying to fool? The climate is reacting because it is in trouble. The environment is in collapse because we are polluting it. Our children are demanding action because they have been taught science, understand it and want better from our political leaders. The marketing and the spin is not going to get us out of this crisis. What we need is deep cuts to carbon pollution, and we need them now. Current policies have us on track for a four degrees warming of our planet. That is a catastrophe. We are running out of time. If we don't turn this ship around, we will face even more severe bushfires, more severe flood events, more severe weather, famine, drought, disease. That is why we owe our children a duty of care, because we have been warned. We can't pretend we don't know. And having a nice pithy line in a press conference from the leader of the nation does nothing to help reduce the pollution and to put our climate back on track. Australia needs to get with the program. Our Prime Minister needs to read the science. His government needs to stop the denial and stop the delay and owe our and they owe our children Order. a duty of Senator care. Senator Hanson Young, the question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. We'll go to a petition. Clerk. A petition has been lodged as noted on the dynamic red. The terms of the petition will be incorporated in Hansard. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fieravanti Wells, I understand. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the give, giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number two for 11 August 2021, proposing the disallowance of the, of the Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Rules 2020. So notice given. Are there any other notices of motion? 
If not, I shall proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted, Senator Urquhart. That leave of absence be granted to Senator Stirl for the 3rd to the 12th of August for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Any other matters? I understand the clerk has not received any postponements or extensions. So I shall proceed to the discovery of formal business. I understand business of the Senate number one is to be debated, so I'll go to business of the Senate matter number two. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number two be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, I'll now come to government business. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the consideration of disallowance motions be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Matter number two, Senator Dunningham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number two proposing the exemption of the bill from the cutoff be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bell. The question is the motion moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 5. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I'll now move to general business. Um, someone moving a motion on behalf of Senator Rice, number 1185. Senator Seward. Uh, on behalf of Senator Rice, sorry. On behalf of Senator Rice, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1185 propose the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act relating to targeted sanctions for human rights violations and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act relating to targeted sanctions for human rights violations and for related purposes. Yes. Senator Seward. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memoran memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Seward. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? It is. Thank you, Senator Seward. Uh, 1207, Senators Hanson Young and Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1207, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young and myself, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Wish Wilson. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The associated costs of the minister's travel will be publicised in due course, as with all ministerial travel. Question is the mo Senator Roberts. A short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. We strongly supported ensuring ministers are accountable, but this is intrusive. We will not be supporting it. UNESCO, China chairs it. China is attempting to bully us, threaten us, get even. China is acting as a globalist agency on behalf of a globalist agency. The Greens are doing China's dirty work. The Greens are working for our enemies. We will not be supporting this. Senator Wish Wilson. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is not granted. Senator Wish Wilson. The question is that motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson, number 1207, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 1207 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes and Senator Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 16, noes 18. The question is resolved in the negative. Senators, please remain in the chamber. Senator Seawitt, number 1208, in your name. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1208 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seawitt. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 1208 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes and Senator Smith tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 18, noes 14. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Waters, your matter number 1209. This notice of motion number 1209 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters, number 1210. Thank you, President. Before asking that uh, motion number 1210 be taken as formal, I seek leave to amend the return date for this OPD from Thursday, the 12th of August, to Monday, the 23rd of August. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Waters. Thank you very much. I uh, ask that general business notice of motion number 1210 as amended be taken as formal, and I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. That concludes the discovery of formal business, I think, colleagues. I'll give people a chance to come back to their seats or exit the chamber. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 today, 14 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Waters proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate, and with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. I call Senator Seward. The motion that the world is rapidly warming and, unless emergency action is taken, it could reach 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures within the next decade, putting Australians at risk of more frequent and more intense heat waves, fires, droughts and floods, and in fact poses a risk to humanity. And as the was commented yesterday. This from the IPCC and the Secretary General, the UN Secretary General, this is a code red for humanity. And for some of us, we have been saying this and urging action, campaigning for action for years. I personally have been campaigning for this for over 32 years with basically the same message. Climate change is coming. Climate change is happening. We risk everything on our planet through our inaction on the threat of climate change. And now we are facing the reality. Bushfires around Australia bushfires in Northern Europe, bushfires in Northern America, floods, loss of rainfall. That's been happening in my home state in Western Australia, in the southwest of WA, for decades. You can see it step down. Yet what happens? No action. No action. This is, should be a time where this place comes together and shows leadership in the face of this massive crisis, the catastrophe that we face. As a species, we 
have threatened every species on this planet. It's not just about us, folks. This is about every species on this planet. The IPC6 assessment report is clear. Climate change is widespread, rapid and intensifying. Climate change and its impacts are accelerating across the planet. Unless we make immediate and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees will be beyond our reach, and that is fast disappearing. The report sets out five new emission scenarios illustrating possible climate futures. It paints a terrifying picture for Australia, one that has been warned about for years. The, the intensity, frequency and duration of fire weather is projected to increase throughout Australia as global temperatures rise from 1.5 to 2 degrees and beyond. Heat waves, floods and other extreme events will become more widespread. And if that doesn't break my heart already, my heart breaks further when you learn about what's going to happen to our oceans. There will be a further increase in marine heat waves, ocean acidity and ocean acidity in Australia. This poses severe challenges for our beautiful, world-renowned marine ecosystems, including precious places like those in WA, Ningaloo and Shark Bay, places that we hold dear to our hearts in Western Australia. Scientists are virtually certain that, that global mean sea level will continue to rise over the 21st century. Even under the most ambitious cuts to emissions, the, ocean, the world's oceans will probably rise between 28 to 55 centimetres. But if emissions remain very Thank high, you. seas Senator will Senator rise Senator between 63. Time has expired. I now call Senator McMahon. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise today to speak on this uh, matter of public urgency. Um, the MPU today warns of more intense heat waves, fires, droughts and floods. But I can tell you now what we are going to see more of is the despicable behaviour that we saw out the front of this building this morning. We're going to see more of this vandalism criminal behaviour and terrorism. Yes, terrorism, Madam Acting Deputy President, because what these people are doing is terrorising employees who are just going about their daily jobs, doing their work and not expecting to have to be confronted by people bearing cans of paint, um, buckets of goodness knows what. Um, super gluing themselves all over the place, um, made by the oil and gas industry, by the way. Um, these people should not have to expect to have this sort of terrorism perpetrated on them at their workplace. And we didn't just see it today. We saw it last week at the Department of the Environment, at the Department of Agriculture. Um, employees going about their daily work, working for the people of Australia, um, working for the government, being terrorised by these despicable bunches of people. And these people over here to my right condone this sort of behaviour. They don't only condone it, they encourage it. And they think it's a good thing. And some even choose to congratulate these terrorist groups for perpetrating this sort of behaviour. Um, um, Senator McMahon. Thank you for taking your seat. And, and a point of order, I understand, Senator Seward. What is the point of order? These groups are not terrorist groups. Senator, and Senator, Senator McMahon Seward, is instilling is fear point. into the community. Senator it's Seward, outrageous. please resume your seat unless you're willing to articulate what it is that you are making a point of order on. Is it on relevance or another matter? Uh, the fact that Senator McMahon is labelling no, environment that groups is a debating as terrorist point. groups. Sorry, Senator Seward. I call Senator McMahon. Senator Seward, I use the word terrorist in the true meaning, that they are terrorising, and that is exactly what they are doing. They are terrorising people, they're terrorising employees, they're terrorising people in this building, and they're terrorising the general public. So that is exactly what they are doing. They are inflicting fear and terror into the general public. So that is exactly what they're doing. Um, 
This government does take environmental change, climate change, warming, cooling, whatever is going on seriously. And we are committed to doing our part to fulfilling Australia's commitment. We are on track to not only meet our 2030 targets, but in fact exceed them. But let me say, and I think it's important that we do play our part in um, all types of pollution, whether it's emissions, whether it's plastics, uh, a whole range of uh, factors that are affecting our environment. We must play our part. But throughout history, the temperature of the earth is dictated by sunspot activity. We have no control over sunspot activity. There have been periods of the medieval warm period where the earth has warmed, there's been ice ages, and in fact a lot of scientists predict currently that we are heading into a period of low sunspot activity. So that doesn't take away from our, our obligations to play our part. But uh, it, it is certainly not that the temperature of the earth is completely controlled by carbon emissions. That, that is a falsehood. That is not a fact. Um, if we are serious about lowering our emissions, if we are really serious about, um, about Australia meeting our targets and exceeding our targets and lowering our emissions and still having a reliable, affordable, dispatchable energy, then I, um, I refer to Senator Lambie's question during question time, why are we not looking at nuclear power? Um, this has to be a consideration in our energy mix if we are to meet our targets and not destroy our economy and our way of life. And if we look at the developed nations around the world that have low emissions, um, countries like um, uh, countries in Europe, uh, the UK, America, um, they all have nuclear power as part of their energy mix. Um, in fact, uh, all of the developed countries that have low emissions footprints um, have either nuclear power in the energy mix or access to large hydro schemes. Um, so I, I would say that if we are serious about um, meeting and exceeding our targets, we should be looking at nuclear power. Uh, Canada, 15%. UK and America, 20 per cent. Uh, we have abundance of fuel here in Australia. Your time has expired. I now call Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much for the call. Well, I think, in a way, Senator McMahon's contribution really highlights, again, the failure of, of all of us, really, to work out a way forward on how we deal with the issues that are raised in the IPCC report. I mean, it is with some sadness and despair, actually, that I have to give a speech today trying to argue about the need for change, the need to address climate change. This is the sixth report that clearly, uh, based on science, that clearly makes the case uh, for the urgent need for change, and yet. You know, here we are in this place, you know, leaders, all of us here, elected to do a job, and we still can't agree on the way forward. I mean, that has been the problem that has plagued this parliament for more than a decade. Uh, and meanwhile, the science keeps coming in, the evidence keeps coming in. Every summer, we see the bushfires get worse. Every winter, we watch the fires in the Northern Hemisphere get worse. The floods, the natural disasters that come and hit our shores, the plight of people in the Pacific, it's commonly understood. Even the ACT resident climate denier today now with ministerial responsibility, kind of acknowledges that. I mean, this is the world that our children are growing up in. My children, who had to remain inside because the smoke was so thick in the ACT, we had the worst air pollution anywhere in the world about two years ago from the fires that were all around our borders. This is the world that my children are growing up in. 
they get it. Overwhelming majority of young people get it because they see and they've got a stake about what happens. And yet here we are, the leaders of the country from a political sense, and we're still working out what to do and whether to convince each other and pointing the finger. I mean, it's just devastating. I used to believe in good policy being made out of chambers like this. That's why I got into politics, to make a difference, to be part of the debate. I used to believe that governments could bring people together. They could show leadership and they could when they reach across the aisle and when they bring stakeholders together, make good policy in the national interest. And yet, for the past eight years, I've watched the politics of climate change get kicked across this, weaponised, and where there seems to be now, from the government's point of view, a moratorium on good policy. They're not even interested because it's about power. It's not about policy. It's not about the future. It's not about making sure the decisions we make today, which give us a fighting chance of making sure that our kids and our grandkids don't inherit a dying planet. It's not about that anymore. It's about power. It's about dealing with division and disagreement from within the government. Every time Labor has said, we will support you on this policy, one of your many different policies you've tried to get up before, let's pick the one that you used before you necked Malcolm Turnbull, when we reach across the chamber, not, it's not what we would have done, but it's a step in the right direction. What's the response? You get rid of the Prime Minister and completely walk away from it, and another two or three years is lost. Meanwhile, we get these reports that tell us you've got to act, and if you don't act, it's going to be a disaster. And then we just, the government just trots out with its three dot points that it's been using for the past few years. One, you know, our emissions have gone down. Two, Australia beats 2020 targets. Meet and beat, I think, is the language. And three, we committed to Paris and a flimsy commitment to 2050 as soon as possible or preferable. And that's the only answer we've got. I mean, surely we're better than this. You know, we have to convince people from here. I get that not everybody across Australia agrees with where the Greens are. A lot of people don't. The majority don't. So lecturing from that side doesn't work. So there has to be somewhere in the centre where people from your side and our side and their side can find some common place to deal with the disaster that this report clearly shows will happen if we don't do more. You know, and that's what the community expects from us. For those that don't believe, to engage with them, to understand their worries. I get that there's people worried about their economic future. What does it mean for them, for jobs, for their job, for their kids' job, for their livelihood? Change is hard. Leading change is hard. Being in government is hard. I get all that. But someone has to lead, and people expect the government to lead the elected government of the day to lead, not to point the finger at everybody else and use slogans like technology, not taxes, and just keep saying it and saying it and hope that that is the message that gets through, but go deeper, convince people, talk to people, tell them what it's going to be like in their region when climate change, as outlined in this report, lands on their doorstep. But for the people in power now, they don't care. They'll be gone. It won't be Scott Morrison answering to people as fires and flood and drought change the way we live. 
It won't be him answering to that. It will be some other person, probably not in the parliament yet, who will be faced with explaining why there was a decade of lost opportunity from this government. It will be up to that person to explain to generations why the changes that are brought in then are going to be harder, where the lives are going to be harder, where livelihoods are going to be harder, because we didn't take the message seriously. If I have to listen to another government member saying, we take this seriously, we are acting, it's a load of rubbish. It's absolute rubbish. What they are doing is working out how to stay in power. And that is a disgrace when this is one of the biggest issues facing this country. You can pretend all you like that it's not coming, but the history books will show we were warned. We should have done something more. And it won't reflect well on this government, not that I think that will matter to them, because I don't think it does. Probably won't matter to Senator Roberts either, who's sort of smiling through this presentation. But it matters to people who want good policy in this country, who want to make sure that future generations have jobs, have livelihoods, compete in a global world. You know, that matters. And it matters to me that my kids and their kids thought that this generation tried to do something more than tried, actually did something. And that's what motivates people to actually call for serious action on climate, because this report is damning. It is scary. And I know people will try and pass it off and go, oh, it's just another report. It's not true. I'm sure we'll have a presentation from Senator Roberts soon. But they've been right so far. And anyone who watches the floods, the fires, the natural disasters, crits crossing between the northern and south southern hemisphere knows it's true. And we should be better. We should be able to do something. And we should be able to work together to do it. It might not be exactly what we want, but we should do something more. And it should move beyond slogans and power and into actually doing the job that we've been elected to do, which is to look after not only people now, but generations into the future, and that's the big failure of this government Thank you. today. Senator Gallagher, uh, I now call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This is not a matter of urgency. Even the Greens' motion says it could, the temperature could reach 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. So what? It does not say anywhere in that report from what I've been told, and I will be reading it, that it will. Senator Gallagher is completely wrong. This is not an emergency, uh, not a matter of urgency. It does not show what will happen. It says what could happen. There is no empirical scientific evidence that backs this up. Science is decided not by emotions or whims or daughters saying that the smoke in the air, mummy, that must be climate change. That's not it. It's not decided by Senator Watt and Senator Wong having, a, having an all-out battle with the Greens this morning. And not once did anyone talk about the science. Not once that happened. Instead, they were talking about each other and who was going to get their votes off the climate alarmists. That's it. So we, have now, we are now at date 701, almost two years since I challenged Senator Waters and Senator Di Natale in this place to provide the empirical scientific evidence that shows that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate and needs to be cut. I also challenged them at the same time, 701 days ago, to debate me on the science behind the climate alarm and also the corruption of climate science. Not once has she since presented any such evidence proving causation of human uh, uh, human-induced human climate change. Not once. I also challenged her almost 11 years ago in public. I've never seen a person move so quickly. She jumped to her feet and said, I will not debate you. Why? Because like Extinction Rebellion damaging this parliament, they are down just spouting out emotion, fluff, nonsense. But it's emotionally ridden. 
uh, nonsense. And that's what gets people in. So let's have a look at some facts. I've challenged the CSIRO to provide me with facts. In the course of three presentations from the CSIRO, the CSIRO said, has never admitted, has, has admitted that they have never said that carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger. Never. They have admitted that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. Not unprecedented. They've happened before. And in fact, they've been four degrees warmer before. Not worried about 1.5. 1.5 would be beneficial to the planet and to human society. CSIRO thirdly cited papers that do not show the rate of temperature rise is unprecedented. When they couldn't prove that the temperature is unprecedented, they said the rate of temperature rises. We've gone now nearly 26 years without any increase in temperature. Just normal cycles. Fourthly, the CSIRO relies not on science, on data, but on unvalidated models giving erroneous projections. Same as, this, as the IPCC that Senator Gallagher is, is uh, referring to. The CSIRO, and this is the clincher, has never quantified any specific impact from human carbon dioxide on climate. Never quantified it. They can't tell us what CO2 will do, what our carbon dioxide will do. But we've blown on our power bills a staggering $13 billion a year in additional costs on subsidies for climate change and so-called renewables. That is $1,300 per household. That is what is staggering. That is the catastrophe that's looming in this country because of gutless Liberal Nationals, dishonest Labor Party and ins insane Greens. That is the crisis we're facing. Thank you, Senator Roberts. And I call Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Miss Acting Deputy President. And I note my colleague, colleagues uh, like Senator McMahon, who have raised in this place today uh, the unlawful protests and the desecration of our national parliament by criminals earlier today. And I also note the shamefully vocal defence of those criminals mounted by the Greens in this very chamber. In fact, it almost leads me to channel Peter Costello in asking how do the Greens sleep while their prams are burning? Because this is a government that could walk and chew gum at the same time. Not only are we taking meaningful action on uh, the very real challenge of emissions reduction, which I'll get to in time, but we've also undertaken very significant reforms and important reforms to the Australian charities and not-for-profit sector to ensure that no organisation that hides behind the tax deductions and the legitimacy of the charitable status afforded to them undertakes and resources the sorts of profoundly illegal and offensive behaviour that those Greens over there support in this place today. But We've also heard criticism from the Labor Party today that you know, somehow achieving emissions reductions in real terms, such that our emissions today are lower than they were in 1990, somehow achieving emissions reductions of 20 per cent on 2005 levels, somehow beating Japan, the United Kingdom, the United States and South Africa in achieving emissions reductions since 2005 isn't enough for them. And it would seem that the only thing they're looking for is job-destroying taxes, looking for blank cheques and meaningless inter international commitments. Well, this is a government that won't stand for that. We stand for ambitious action on climate change, but only where it can be met and supported by a clear plan, a costed plan, and one that supports Australian jobs. And that's why. The Morrison government stands proudly behind its technology roadmap that supports uh, a lower carbon intensity future, not only for the Australian economy, but also for the rest of the world. Because the reality is that it, climate change and emissions reduction is a global problem. The developing world accounts for more than two thirds of carbon emissions, and China alone accounts for more emissions than all of the OECD economies combined, which is to say that Australia's 1.1 per cent contribution to global emissions can't of itself solve this problem. But we have a very legitimate place at the global table when these matters are discussed because of our impressive track record 
uh, of actual emissions reduction and because of our ambition to reach net zero as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. That, Madam Acting Deputy President, is a powerful message and one that resonates with the Australian people. The Australian people who enjoy jobs in the resources sector, who enjoy jobs in advanced manufacturing, who see opportunities that loom on the horizon as this government makes the investments in things like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, electric vehicle infrastructure and heavy vehicle efficiencies that those opposite joined up with the Greens to vote against. $192.5 million of money invested into renewable technologies, and those over there voted against it just six weeks ago in this very chamber. That exposes the hypocrisy and the baseless lies that are trotted out each day, and they contrast most starkly with the actions of a government that has not only achieved real emissions reduction, but achieved such a significant level of emissions reduction that we stand proudly at the forefront of the global effort on this issue. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, thank you, Senator Small. I call Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, for anyone who takes the time to look at the IPCC report released yesterday, uh, it is genuinely concerning reading. Uh, and in some respects, it simply repeats things that we have known for some time. Uh, that we do face an extremely big challenge around climate change, but it is brought into stark relief when you look at the data uh, and the evidence that that report presents. Uh, in particular, the evidence in this report regarding the likely impact of climate change on our regions makes for very stark reading. And even if you just look at what it has to say about Northern Australia, one of the regions, uh, anyone who cares about the future of Northern Australia should really have pause for thought and should really be committing themselves to taking action. Just a couple of things that the report has to say about Northern Australia. It observes that Northern Australia has already seen a rise in annual rainfall and heavy rain events and that the region will face heavier rainfall in future. Uh, it, it, the report states uh, that heavy rainfall and river floods are projected to increase in Australia in the future. It has similar things to say about sea levels, coastal flooding, uh, about sea er shore erosion uh, and bushfires and cyclones as well. It is very clear from this report uh, that it is our regions in particular uh, which will bear the brunt of our failure collectively as a nation to take action on climate change. So for every LNP politician who likes to come in here and bang on about how much they care about the regions, they are actually betraying the regions. They are betraying regional Australians through their continued refusal to take action on climate change. Because when we see bushfires, they don't happen in the Sydney CBD. When we see cyclones, they don't happen in the Melbourne CBD. They don't happen on Collins Street. They happen in regional Australia. Bushfires, cyclones, floods overwhelmingly happen in regional Australia. It's our regions that are on the front line when it comes to the effects of climate change, and it's our regions who are being so grossly let down by a government that pretends to be on their side. Uh, what is the government doing to protect our regions from climate change? Well, the answer, as with so many other things, is nothing. This is a government, this is a Prime Minister that never takes responsibility, uh, whether it be for COVID, whether it be for bushfires uh, through the black summer or now when we face this big climate change challenge. It's a government that is always slow to act. We saw the Prime Minister ignore repeatedly warnings and requests for meetings from fire chiefs before the black summer bushfires. All they wanted to do was come and warn him about the risks and encourage him to take action. He ignored them. He refused to meet with them, and we saw the devastating effects afterwards from this, this Prime Minister failing to take responsibility, failing to lead the nation and being slow, so slow to act. So this government's ongoing uh, ignorance 
of the risk of climate change, this government's ongoing refusal to take action on climate change is literally putting Australians at risk, especially in regional Australia. And at the same time, the government's refusal to take action on climate change is denying regional Australians opportunities, because there are opportunities that come for our regions if we take serious action on climate change. We are already seeing businesses around regional Australia come to grips with the challenge, adjust and, in fact, make money and create jobs out of this. Not that long ago, I was at the Sun Metals refinery in Townsville, one of the biggest energy users in Queensland, which is already progressively moving uh, its power sources to solar, and it's on track to convert to, to um, uh, carbon neutral power in the next couple of decades. This is happening now. Companies are creating jobs in regional Australia about it, uh, through making this adjustment now. It's why people like the National Farmers Federation are on board for net zero emissions. It's why Rio Tinto, why BHP, why Santos, why Origin, why every big energy producer and consumer in the country is on board, and the only people who aren't on board are this government. This government because it doesn't take action on climate change, is literally chasing jobs out of regional Australia and into other countries' arms. I want to see these jobs created in places like Gladstone. I want to see them created in Rocky, in Townsville, in Darwin, in Cairns. I don't want to see them created overseas, but we need a government that is prepared to take action on climate change and grasp this opportunity. Thank you, Senator Watts. Uh, and I call Senator Faruqi remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's a code red for humanity. That's what the United Nations has called the IPCC's latest warning on climate. The world is heating faster. We're closer than ever to catastrophic change. And once we hit the tipping point, the climate dominoes will fall, threatening our very existence. The new IPCC report is our starkest warning yet. But the Prime Minister's lack of action on the climate emergency heralds the death sentence for our lands, our forests, our rivers, our oceans and animals. There's literally not a second left to waste. It's not too late. If we heed the warning and take urgent action, we can still avoid the worst impacts. The report does make for grim reading, though. The catastrophic floods and fires we're already living through will become the norm. Heavy rainfall and river floods are projected to worsen across Australasia, and the report warns the intensity, frequency and duration of bushfires will increase throughout Australia. Experts say that Australia needs to reduce our emissions by 75 per cent by 2030 to avoid irreversible climate change. So at this time of climate collapse, where is Mr Morrison and his government? They are busily fudging numbers and misleading people about our emissions. They are lobbying to override scientists as UNESCO, who recommend the Great Barrier Reef be lifted as endangered. They are doing dirty deals to dig up more dirty coal and gas with public money. You are the criminals, not the activists trying to save the planet and pushing you to take responsibility. And while the Liberals are burning through Australia's carbon budget at the risk of catastrophic climate damage, Labour is giving up on the climate action needed and is letting them off the hook the alarm bells are ringing, yet both major parties have decided to look away. They've sold out to their pals and donors in the fossil fuel industry. And what a victory for the coal, oil and gas corporations in their race to stockpile profits while the planet burns. Being slaves to the coal barons is turning all our futures into ash. Millions of lives depend on our response to the climate crisis. Generations across the world will be deprived of the opportunity to live a dignified life if we don't act. So you are stealing their future right in front of their eyes. And they will have to live with the wretched reality of your inaction. Morrison and co are perpetrating an intergenerational theft so enormous, it wouldn't be believable were we not witnessing it with our very own eyes. If there's no action, the report warns, we will hit 1.5 degrees C of global warming by 2030. Our forests will burn, sea levels will rise, rivers will dry up and also flood. Our wildlife will suffer. Who has forgotten our last summer when deadly and tragic bushfires in our own backyard ravaged our forests and wildlife and consumed lives? These climate disasters will only intensify as the earth continues to heat up. I can barely contain my anger when I say that we're sick 
of you, Mr. Morrison. We are sick of your drivel. We are sick of your inaction. Do something, literally anything, Prime Minister, to turn back the clock on your criminal inaction. But you won't. So you and your lot need to be kicked out. And the Greens in shared power is the only way we'll get emergency action on the climate crisis. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. I'll call Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Now, for a party that clings to the idea of globalisation, open borders, no borders at all, just open up all the countries across the world, one world or whatever it is that you believe out on the fringes, they love to say Australia should open up. Whomever wants to come, whenever they want to come, no need to embrace our Australian culture. In fact, they openly and actively talk Australians down. But when it comes to climate, when it comes to climate change and the discussion around that, Australia can do it all and there's no need for any global response or participation by any other nation. There's no need for the rest of the world to participate at all. So whilst they sit idly by, and perhaps it's because they were superglued to something, they sit by as their ideologically aligned China continues to build more and more coal-fired power stations. But perhaps communist emissions don't count when it comes to this lot. Just don't see what other reason there could be. But here's the thing, guys. I'll let you in on a little secret. If we as a globe are going to tackle global emissions, it needs to be a global effort. I know that sounds crazy and way out there and just a little bit too much for you all to handle. But when we find ourselves in a position where half of the G20 member nations actually increased their emissions, all while Australia's fell faster than Canada, fell faster than New Zealand, Japan, Korea, fell faster than the United States. But yet, here we are, as you can contribute hot air, and pretty much that's it, to this current conversation. But you're well and truly keeping the current leader of the opposition company. As those opposite abandon their 2030 target, so in effect walking away from the Paris Agreement, when asked about this, the current leader of the opposition, all he could muster, and I really I, I do hope that I do this justice. Well, well what we do is, in government, uh, of course, what we're doing is that we're encouraging the current government. I mean, um, thanks, I think. It seems to be hot air, indecision, paralysis, the beating of the leadership drum. I guess that in part could explain why just last week those opposite voted against the technology investment roadmap. They voted against technology. Because we know, for those opposite, it's purely about taxes and nothing else. Not for us on this side of the chamber. We're here for technology. We're looking to the future, investing in innovation, investing in our regions. I've personally been thrilled to see the $20 billion that's been invested by the Morrison government across the country up to 2030. And this $20 billion over the next decade will drive $80 billion of total public and private investment over the decade. And this investment will create around 160,000 new jobs. But yep, sure, you guys over, over the other side, you just keep on voting against those jobs and keep on voting against the jobs of those workers in the Hunter region as you walk away from the miners, but on top of that, walk away from the energy hub that the Hunter region is becoming, all as you continue to march to the drum of the inner city latte left. Not us on this side. We are looking at technology, not taxes. Not destroying jobs or imposing taxes and new costs on households, businesses, 
or industries. In fact, in the Hunter, we have organisations like Batmobile, Energy Renaissance, as the, energy, the region moves towards becoming a hydrogen hub, partnerships between industry and the University of Newcastle. So I thought I might take the time to explain to you what some of this investment looks like, what some of this innovation looks like, because I'm not quite sure the intellectual fortitude, the depth of understanding exists for you to understand how some of these things look. Um, order. Senator Hughes, could you make your remarks through the chair and cease using the word you? Thank you. So, thank you, Chair. I apologise. And just as I explain a few things around some of the innovations that we have invested in, we all know Australia's resource sector is world class. And through the Morrison government's $1.3 billion modern manufacturing initiatives, we're actually helping to unlock enormous potential by providing targeted supports for projects that would deliver big re rewards for local economies, not only creating more jobs but generating export opportunities. So in July, we announced a grant of $4.5 million for Batmobile equipment in the Hunter to build heavy battery electric vehicles for underground hard rock mines. So this will deliver Australia's first commercially operational viable alternative fleet to a diesel fleet. This will catalyse the electrification of global hard rock mines and deliver emissions reduction, as well as safety and productivity outcomes. One of my favourite organisations that's showing to itself to be so innovative throughout the Hunter region is an all, a company called Energy Renaissance, and they've been working some great partnerships with the CSIRO, amongst others. But what they're demonstrating is that here in Australia, we have all the right skills and natural resources, expertise, and an abundance of solar energy to create batteries and a renewables manufacturing hub. We know that the economic impact of COVID has created a greater urgency to build industries and create jobs and accelerate our economic recovery. And Energy Renaissance has seen as opportunity for battery manufacturing to take the lead in this. And they're building an exciting future where the world's powered by clean, stored energy everywhere. And they're building it right here in Australia. So back in 2017, Energy Renaissance announced that they'll develop Australia's first advanced lithium-ion battery manufacturing facility with funding from private investors and their foundation customers. They're continuing to work with the CSIRO and technology partner Cadenza Innovation as they're ramping up their capabilities and capacity to manufacture batteries in Australia that are safe, that are affordable, and they're actually optimised to perform in hot clients. Its supercells and super storage family of products are designed to perform in hot climates and be used to power infrastructure, buildings, businesses, homes, both in stationary and in transport applications. And I was absolutely thrilled to have visited the site twice just this year, including turning the first sod on what will be the lithium iron battery manufacturing centre. This scale and anticipated market will see their export opportunities grow to an estimated contribution of around $3 billion per annum once our battery market is up and exporting across the world. Now, hydrogen hubs, something else that the Morrison government's focused on. And for those that don't understand, hydrogen is actually a zero emissions gas. But yet when we wanted to invest in the technology roadmap, when we wanted to look at technology, not taxes, those opposite were more upset about hydrogen than I think they were coal. I mean, I just don't understand what's wrong with you people. We know you don't like nuclear and won't put it back on the table at all. Senator Hughes, but can I just remind you about the inappropriate use of the word you in that context? Make your when those opposite aren't very focused on looking at actual emissions uh, zero forms of technology, including things like nuclear, and understanding those opposites' ideological opposition is long-standing, and it's nice to see that something's long-standing in their value proposition. But the fact that there is a continued opposition to hydrogen hubs, a net zero emissions gas, 
an opportunity for the region to develop jobs where we have plenty of natural resources. In fact, the great thing about hydrogen can actually contribute to our waste reduction. There's another company up in the Hunter looking to burn excess timber products, waste timber, and create hydrogen hub, generate more and more energy for that region. I mean, it's nice to think that at least from those opposite we have one member, member for Hunter, Mr Fitzgibbon out there on his own. He must be just thrilled listening to Senator Faruqi talking about a shared power arrangement. Can't wait to catch up with the member for Hunter for that one. Might have to expedite that membership form to him sooner rather than later. He's the only one opposite, I think, that still understands mining has a future Thank in this you, country. Senator Hughes. Senator Sheldon, remotely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is very clear. And it's clear about the impact of years of Liberal national government inaction on climate policy is having on Australia. According to the IPCC, Australia has already warmed by 1.4 degrees Celsius since 1910. Heat extremes have increased, cold extremes have decreased, and these trends are projected to continue. The frequency of extreme fire weather days has increased and the fire season has become longer at many, many locations around this country and around the world. The intensity, frequency and duration of fire weather events are projected to increase throughout Australia. And of course, we're already seeing the consequences of inaction on climate. We lived through the black summer bushfires, which ravaged so much of New South Wales and elsewhere around Australia. Months before the Black Summer bushfires, a group of 23 former fire chiefs and other emergency service leaders tried to meet with the Prime Minister to raise their concerns. And Mr Morrison refused to meet with them. And then as Australia burned, Mr Morrison went on holiday to Hawaii. As the bushfires continued to ravage Australia, he was finally forced to cut his holiday short and when he did return, he griped that he doesn't hold a hose, mate. Now, the verdict is in. The failure of the Morrison government and the Liberal National Party governments before it to take any action have condemned Australia to be future bushfire seasons like the Black Summer. It's a great, great shame. It's a great shame because as the world moves rapidly towards renewable energy, we have a once-in-a-generation opportunity for Australia to jump ahead of the pack. Australia's abundant natural resources, wind, solar, hydrogen and gas, represent an incredible additional export opportunity for the Australian economy. A federal government which actually backs our local energy sector with investment and policy certainty could create thousands of good-paying jobs while making power cheaper for homes and businesses alike. Now, instead, we have the absurd situation, as the Australian Workers' Union has highlighted, where Australians are paying more for our own gas than we charge customers overseas. This is the energy policy legacy of the Morrison government. Australia needs a government that gives the energy sector the policy certain to invest after eight years of Liberal government, we still don't know what their 2050 target is. Every state and territory government, Labor and Liberal alike, all leading businesses, industry and agricultural groups are all united in committing to net zero by at least 2050. Now, the only major organisation left in Australia opposing this position is the Morrison government. Without a target, the Morrison government does not have a plan. It is just floundering around. No answer for the real mine workers. And of course, they don't have any answer for, for coal mine workers either. You know, the Morrison government dares to pretend that it's looking out for them. While it comes to Canberra to pass legislation to support lighter hire firms who are driving down the paying conditions of mine workers. When it goes to uh, spending $300,000 supporting WorkPAC, in the High Court on a case against one of their exploited casual employees. Truth is, the Morrison government is not on the side of mine workers. 
Mr Morrison and the rest of this sorry government are only here to represent themselves. The truth is that the world's climate emergency is Australia's job opportunity. Renewables, jobs are important to us to make sure that they work. Because quite clearly, we have an opportunity to turn around and engage nearly 27,000 extra workers expected by uh, the year uh, 45,000 by the year 2035. And yet the Liberal National Government has failed to give rights to those workers. It's one of the reports that talks about sharing the benefits with workers, not getting lower energy prices, and workers aren't getting the benefit, talks about the, how the fact that these jobs Thank are insecure you, jobs Sheldon? because of the way they're arranged under this government. Your time's expired. I call Senator Thorpe remotely. Senator Thorpe, we seem to have a technical problem. Would you can you make a rectification promptly? Senator Thorpe? Hey Lydia, hey Lydia, you've got to exit the thing and come back in again. It, it, it's Senator, done that. You've got to close it Senator down Steel and open John, it again. You don't have the call. So, Senator Thorpe, can you attempt to speak again? Right. So, Senator Thorpe, you'll need to log out and log back in. In the meantime, I call Senator Steele John. Thank you, President. You know, hearing the latest climate report made and then listening uh, to, to the debate that has followed in this chamber today, uh, this avalanche of nonsense, this insulting, degrading bilge that has been spewed into this place for the last day. It leaves you frustrated. It leaves me furious, quite frankly. This report is crystal clear. It may be inconvenient to the major parties in this place who are funded by the perpetrators of the climate crisis. It may be inconvenient to face the reality that the people who fund your campaigns are destroying our planet. It may be inconvenient that the question before the Labour and the Liberal parties is whether they value the donations which drive their campaigns more than they value the lives and futures of the young people of this nation. But nevertheless, that is the truth laid bare by this report. It is a signpost at a crossroads, presenting us with a clear choice. It shows us very clearly that the climate crisis which we are now enduring is a creation of politics. It is a political creation with a political solution. The choice is invest in renewable energy, keep coal in the ground, keep gas in the ground, create those jobs in that renewable energy transition or continue doing what you are doing now, selling our future out in favour of those donations from the Woodsides, from the gas giants, from the Gina Reinhardt and the Twiggy Forests. Put them first, value their profit, and continue to sell young people down the river, destroying our future and condemning us to battle a climate apocalypse. It is our future as a generation that is on the line, and only the Greens are willing to advocate the reduction in emissions necessary to keep our planet safe, to guarantee a safe future for our generation as young people, and to have a, such a vital report as this, greeted by such hollow, Nonsense is a disgrace and a shame to this parliament, which should be taking swift and urgent action to address the climate crisis that is now our lived reality. The inability to do this is why so many young people are so deeply frustrated with Australian politics, why so many of us are absolutely disgusted and turned off 
with the major parties. It is why so many of us are looking for alternatives, why I'm so proud to say so many of us are supporting the Greens, and it is why so many of us will be working together in the lead up to the next election to ensure that the Greens are able to return to this place with more members among us and to be able to deliver for the community the climate action which is so urgently demanded and needed. Sorry. 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 I have to call you first, um, Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, in the interest of consistency with rulings made earlier in the day, could you please um, indicate whether you will be directing Senator Steele John to comply with the standing orders in relation to the um, refraining from putting posters and slogans into uh, what is in effect the chamber uh, when he is appearing via video link. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Steele-John, to be consistent yeah, with I'm the still here. So, to be consistent with the a, the ruling that has been um, made earlier today, um, when you next call and your next contribution to the Senate, we just need to ensure that there are no signs um, other than the other than the signs that you'd be able to have in the Senate. So, sorry, Pres, could I just get or oh, acting Pres, could I just get some clarity on that? So my understanding was you weren't allowed to have, you know, Labour or Liberal or those sorry, kind of Senator signs. Still, but John, you're taking kindly in. we've just got the we just got the disabled and proud well, I, thing. I think I'm actually I, it's not brat like it's not it's I not will, a, um, to be consistent, uh, on the ruling that was made earlier today. I would, I would think that the sign that's in there um, would not be a sign that would be allowed to be brought into the Senate, but I'm happy to ask the President to give you a, 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 a further ruling, if you would wish. I, I, would, I would wish that, uh, would you, just yes, on the grounds okay. that I, well, I would I'll refer only, it to only the because um, President for you. Only because, as you can see, it just as far as okay, you can see there, it just says. I've made that ruling. I've made that ruling. Yep. Sorry, Senator Steele John. I've made that ruling. If you would like to continue your contribution on the urgency. No, I, I've motion. finished. Okay, I've thank finished. you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank uh, you. Thank you. So, Senator Thorpe, can you hear me? I can hear you Great. loud and clear. Please can proceed. You hear me? Climate emergency. Climate emergency. Just checking. Is that yeah. okay? Yes, that's great. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. We cannot separate climate justice from First Nations justice. But before I begin, I want to thank my colleague, Senator Waters, for bringing this important public urgency matter to this place and her staunch calls for climate action this morning. Last year, we watched this country burn as we experienced one of the worst bushfire seasons in our recorded history. The sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us that First Nations knowledge is a vital tool in the struggle for climate justice. First Nations people have cared and protected our lands and waters, including our totems, for tens of thousands of years. But by disregarding traditional forms of land management, we've seen a breakdown of traditional forms of land preservation. Recent breakdowns of ecological systems and harms to biodiversity have been linked to a disregard of traditional forms of land management and their displacement by imported and harmful practices. You know, like when the colonisers came over the, on the boats and they destroyed everything they touched. The IPCC report acknowledges the contribution of First Nations people and First Nations scientists 
in helping record historical as well as current observations of a, claim, of a changing climate. The fir this First Nations science enables climate scientists to paint the whole picture and understand holistically what we're doing to the planet. We know that First Nations land management reduces the risk of catastrophic fire damage. We know that our land protectors out there play a crucial role in reducing the risk of wildfires and mitigating shifts in the fire season. We need to lead with what we know is most effective. We must put First Nations knowledge at the forefront of our climate action and policy to safeguard our country and the people that call this place home. Now is the time to build a better normal out of this crisis. Together we can change politics in this country, we can kick the Liberals out and put the Greens in balance of power. Greens in balance of power means that there is enough Greens in Parliament that the government needs to consult with to make laws. That way we can make laws that are good for people and our country. Because we know Lib Lab are pretty much the same these days, particularly when it comes to climate. In a balance of power, the Greens will push the next government to go harder and faster on climate change. And last time the Greens and Labor were in shared power, we passed laws to bring down pollution. Coal and gas are causing the greatest damage to people and we know that the Liberal and the Labor Party continue to take those dirty, dirty donations from the oil and gas companies. That's why they won't talk about their target and that's why they're all talk and no action. We can continue to enjoy our lives in harmony with plenty of energy from clean sources like sun and wind. Or become a climate denier, a climate criminal or the climate terrorists that the, the previous senator spoke about. Senator Thorpe, your time peril. has expired. The question is, is that the urgency motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Keep that there in case somebody asks me what the question is. You never know.
stop the bells. <laughs> The question is, is that the urgency motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion um, will pass to the right of the chair and those against to the left. I point oh, Senator Chisholm, is teller for the eyes, and Senator Davey, is teller for the nose. The 16 eyes and 17 noes. Right. The result of the division is I 16, no 17, so the motion is negative. negative. So if senators could resume their seats or leave the chamber. So. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents, but I will just give senators a few moments to either resume their seats or leave the chamber. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. So uh, I'll go through them one by one. One, Australian Sports Commission. Two, Forestry Marketing and Research and Development Services Act. Three, Product Stewardship Oil Act 2000, review of the act. And do I have to do the So I'll now proceed to tabling and consideration of committee reports and government respo responses. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Madam Upking, Deputy President. At the request of the Chair of the Slick Select Committee on Job Security, Senator Sheldon, I present a corrigendum to the committee's first interim report. Senator, Mac Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. Uh, pursuant to order and at the request of the Chair of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee, Senator Macdonald, I present the committee's report in respect of the 2021-22 budget estimates together with accompanying information. Thank you. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I present a report by way of a statement on the committee's review of the regulations relisting Jamar Mujahideen Bangladesh (JMB) and the listing of Neo Jamar Mujahideen Bangladesh (Neo JMB) as terrorist organisations under the Criminal Code Act 1995. 
Regulations that specify an organisation as a terrorist organisation cease to have effect on the third anniversary of the day on which they take effect. Organisations can be relisted, provided the minister is satisfied on reasonable grounds that an organisation continues to directly or indirectly engage in terrorism or advocate the doing of a terrorist act. Jamal Mujahideen in Bangladesh was last listed in 2018, and the regulations to relist them were tabled in Parliament on 2 June 2021. Neo Jamar Mujahideen Bangladesh Neo JMB, was first listed as an alias of JMB in 2018 and, following advice from the Australian government agencies, is now considered to be an organisation that operates independently of JMB. These regulations relist them. To relist them were tabled in Parliament on 2 June 2021. The committee's review examines the minister's decision to list and relist these organisations. Section 1021A of the Criminal Code provides the committee may review a regulation which relists or lists an organisation as a terrorist organisation and report its comments and recommendations to each House of the Parliament before the end of the applicable 15-day sitting disallowance period. This statement serves this purpose and is being presented within the required period. In determining whether the regulations relisting and listing these organisations should be supported, the committee reviewed the merits in accordance with the Minister of Home Affairs' explanatory statement, ASIO's statement of reasons for the organisations and other publicly available information. In its deliberations, the committee determined that JMB is a Bangladeshi Sunni violent extremist group which aims to remove democracy, liberalism, socialism and secularism and institute an Islamic state in Bangladesh. The group's ideology broadly aligns with al-Qaeda and their global jihadist ideals. Since it was first listed on 9 June 2018, JMB has continued to conduct terrorist attacks. There are no known direct links between JMB and Australia, and while Australians are unlikely to be directly targeted, they may be incidentally harmed in attacks perpetrated at tourist sites in Bangladesh. Neo-JMB was first listed as an alias of JMB on 9 June 2018. However, the group is operating independently of JMB and has been listed as a terrorist organisation. The group is assessed to be an affiliate of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant and sus subscribes to Islamic State's anti-Western ideology, which would consider Australians to be legitimate targets of attack. Neo-JMB has been assessed to have been responsible for a number of terrorist attacks and in, in Australia, a Bangladeshi student who was reportedly a Neo-JMB member was responsible for a lone attacker stabbing attack in Melbourne on 9 February 2018. Neo-JMB favours lone wolf or small group attacks in which Australians may also be incidentally targeted while overseas. There is evidence that these groups continue to be engaging in, preparing, assisting or with or fostering terrorist activities that could potentially and profoundly impact the Australian people. In examining the evidence that has been provided, the committee is satisfied with the relisting processes and considers that they have been followed appropriately for these organisations. The committee therefore supports the relisting and listing of JMB and Neo-JMB under Division 102 of the Criminal Code in order to protect Australians and Australia's interests and finds no reason to disallow the regulations. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Migration, I present the report of the Committee on Australia's Skilled Migration Program. Thank you. We'll now move to reports presented out of City, the Community Affairs Legislation Committee Budget Estimates 2021-22 Progress Report. Are there any ministerial sta statements, Minister? Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I table a document relating to the order for production of documents concerning the government response to the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trades report on the global Magnitsky movement. Thank you. Committee memberships. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Customs Tariff Amendment Incorporation of Proposals Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. I move that the bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is, is that the, this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. All those of, of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Tariff Act 1995 and for related purposes. Minister. 
I move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. The question is that the debate now be adjourned. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the Education Services for Overseas Students Registration Charges Amendment Bill 2021 and three related bills for concurrence. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that these bills may proceed without formalities and be taken together and be read a first time. All those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the eyes have it. Clark. Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Amendment Bill 2021, Education Services for Overseas Students Amendment Cost Recovery and Other Measures Bill 2021, Education Services for Overseas Students TPS Levies Amendment Bill 2021, Education Services for Overseas Students Registration Charges Amendment Bill 2021. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in the Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. The question is that the debate now be adjourned. All those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. The question is, is that the, um, the, the resumption of the date be in order of the day for a later hour. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Mr Conroy in place of Ms Thwaites to the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit. Clark. Government business order of the day number one, family assistance legislation amendment, child care subsidy bill 2021, resumption of debate on the second reading and the amendment. Senator Waters. Yes, could I just seek some clarification? My understanding was that we would be moving to uh, debate business of the Senate notice of motion number one, which I was expecting to, uh, to move on behalf of my you're, colleague, you're Senator You're quite Rice. right, Senator Waters, and we're just about to rectify that. Thank you. Senate notice of motion number one, standing in the names of Senator Rice and Senator Carr, regarding a reference to the Economics References Committee. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President, and thank you, Clark. Um, I so move business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in the names of Senator Rice and Senators Carr, and I'll indicate that Senator Rice is uh, ready to go with her speech remotely. Senator Rice. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Today is the most relevant day in the seven years that I've been in the Senate to be introducing a motion for an inquiry into the need for independent science advice to this parliament. Of course, it's the day after the IPCC sixth assessment report landed, a report in which the UN Secretary General described it as a code read for humanity. He said the alarm bells were deafening. Greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at immediate risk. And it's a week of unprecedented fires in Greece, a Northern Hemisphere summer of 47 degrees being recorded in Canada, unprecedented wildfires across the US and Russia, unprecedented floods in Germany and China, and of course, after our black summer fires of the summer of 2019-20, which killed over three billion animals. Yet our government is in denial, and the Labor Party are in denial when it comes to the need for urgent action by 2030 to slash our carbon pollution by at least half for Australia to be pay, playing its part in tackling the climate crisis. So how would a Parliamentary Office of Science have changed this? In the words of the UK Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, which could be one possible model for an Australian Parliamentary Office of Science, the debate here today 
and going forward would have been informed by trusted and impartial analysis. Because we need more than just the scientific advice that is currently given to government. We need quality, reliable, impartial scientific advice to every parliamentarian to inform our decision making and for that advice to be largely to be public advice. I mean, parliamentarians could then ignore it. They could challenge it. They could debate it if they wished, but it would be at their peril. I mean, the work of scientists needs to be front and centre in the decisions that we make in our parliament. And the work of Australian scientists in particular needs to be celebrated and to be made accessible to all Australian MPs, including to some of those that we have heard this afternoon. Senator McMahon, who was saying that our climate all depends on sunspots. Senators Rennick and Roberts, who deny the climate science altogether. And in fact, to the Labor senators who are silent on the need, the scientifically assessed need to be slashing our carbon pollution by at least half by 2030. And I want to, in the context of this debate of privileging and highlighting science, to particularly salute the over 40 sci Australian scientists who were lead authors of the IPCC report that was released yesterday. Thank you for your perseverance for sitting in the fire, for spending each day confronting the reality of the existential threats to our planet. I am listening, the Greens are listening. We will keep working to convert your science into legislation for Australia to act in the urgent way that is needed to confront our climate crisis, to be acting as if our house was on fire, because it is. And of course, this Proposed referral for an inquiry into a parliamentary office of science isn't only about climate scientists, as relevant as they are today. It's about those scientists working on COVID, on vaccines, on environmental protection, across the whole gamut of science. A, a parliamentary office of science would mean their advice was regularly, reliably and, and impartially conveyed to all parliamentarians in this place. Now, I want to go specifically to the issue of this referral today, which is, of course, to set up an inquiry to, uh, about scientific advice to this parliament, and in particular, the appropriateness of a parliamentary office of science. Our um, referral today is based on the basic principles that guide the Australian Greens when it comes to policy in general, and science policy specifically. We, we believe that research is essential for social progress and it's a public good. And we believe that scientific principles and the practice of independent peer-reviewed research is essential to the development and availability of high quality knowledge and must not be compromised. And most importantly, we believe it's essential that policy making is informed by high quality evidence and scientific research. And it's because we value the contribution of scientific research and expertise that I particularly want to acknowledge the contribution of the Rapid Research Information Forum, or RIF. And since early last year, of course, we've been responding to a worldwide pandemic in ways that have been often very complex and very challenging. There have been major policy responses, but often they've depended on understanding and answering new and complex questions about a virus but as we know, is still mutating and evolving. So we have seen an incredibly valuable contribution from the RIF with multiple papers published on a whole range of questions. And we welcome the contribution of the Australian Academy of Science in leading that important work, as well as the contributions of a whole range of individuals and organisations across the sector in contributing collaboratively. But Given that important contribution of the RIF, it's sad to see so many areas of policy where ministers have actually ignored the scientific advice in making their decisions. And it's hard to know where to start, and it highlights the need for this advice from the RIF to be there, to be elevated, to actually not just be as it has been, but to be elevated, to actually have the be underpinned by an office like the Parliamentary Office of Science. I mean, the areas where Liberal ministers have been ignoring the scientific advice, ignoring the scientific advice on forest ecology, which means that native forest logging is continuing 
across the country, ignoring the advice on faunal extinction and conservation, weakening rather than strengthening our environmental laws, and of course, critically, as I've already discussed, ignoring the evidence on climate. But as well as government policy, there have been MPs freelancing on their own, often undermining at critical points some of the evidence that we've received here in the building. I mean, one member of the government party in the other place was permanently banned from Facebook for spreading misinformation about COVID-19. I mean, imagine how bad your content needs to be to be banned from Facebook, a platform that's regularly used by conspiracy theorists and far-right extremists to spread their ideas. So it's very clear that we need to have a much greater use of science and a much greater um, prominence of science in our decision making here and for parliamentarians to be held to account when they are spruiking far out ideas that are completely, completely debunked by good science. So if you think about the problems that we've got with science not informing our decision here in Australia, it's important to think of how this could be different. And one positive example is the UK's Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, or POST. And the UK POST produces impartial, non-partisan and peer-reviewed briefings designed to make scientific research available to the UK Parliament. And in an Australian context, that could be incredibly valuable. I mean, think of the contribution that a POST could, could make to debating COVID relief bills or changes to environment laws or changes to health frameworks or farming frameworks, or of course, when it comes to climate policy and energy policy. For example, on climate targets, their advice to the UK Parliament recently included, achieving net zero by 2050 will be highly challenging. And although existing policy does not put the UK on track to meet interim milestones, there is emerging consensus across the private sector and civil society on the importance of climate mitigation. There's also a growing number of industry organisations outside of the immediate energy and climate space that are now aligning their operations with net zero by 2050. However, several groups argue that the 2050 date would need to be brought forward to make the UK targets compatible with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees C under a stricter interpretation of equity assumptions. Globally, nationally determined Current nationally determined contributions, emissions reduction pledges emitted by all nations under the Paris Agreement fail to reach even the lower end of the agreement's ambition. And recent climate change modelling has, has demonstrated a route to UK of, for, for net zero by the early 2040s for the first time, under a scenario in which both innovation and public appetite for behaviour change all develop faster than expected. Basically, the UK Post is able to summarise contentious science and present it there to parliamentarians in a way which is trusted, which is impartial, and which parliamentarians cannot avoid, cannot ignore, cannot turn a blind eye to. It is there to be considered as part of our, our decision-making processes. So we would not be in a situation where the Labor Party could be saying, could be being silent on 2030 targets. We could not be in a situation where we have got government backbenchers that are basically spruiking complete fanciful models. They could still do that, but it's very clear that it's completely inconsistent with the appropriate science that's being presented to the parliament and being presented in an impartial and, and reliable way. But of course, I mean, this motion before us today, it's not to establish a parliamentary office of science, it's simply to examine the question, to put it there in the, uh, to be considered by the Senate. I mean, what is the current state of scientific advice to the Australian Parliament? And can it be improved? I mean, this is a really important question and one which we really think is worth examining. And we would really welcome the opportunity to hear from policymakers, from, from scientific researchers and academic experts and the general community. I've talked to a lot of key science stakeholders over the last few months as we've been developing this proposal for a parliamentary office of science and developing this idea of having an inquiry and they have been very positive about it because they know they want to see science to be given a much higher status and much higher um, 
salient in the decision making of the Australian Parliament. And the purpose, of course, of the Senate inquiry, it's to hear from the whole community and to gather the information. So I really commend this motion to the Senate. I think it's an incredibly important motion, and particularly on a day to day, when we see how much science is influencing our future, that we, knowing that we need to be elevating the importance of science in our decision making when you're looking at the climate crisis that we are facing that is in front of mind for us all today. So I really hope that this motion to establish an inquiry, to be looking at scientific advice to the parliament will be supported across party lines in the Senate this afternoon. Thank you. Senator Carr. Uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, at one level, this uh, is a very simple proposition that uh, seeks to refer to the Economics Committee a proposal on how we can improve the scientific advice to this parliament. So I was somewhat surprised when I was advised that the government is going to vote against this proposition. I was surprised because I have uh, represented the Labor Party on scientific matters uh, for many, many years. It's a matter of deep concern to me that we have not had an adequate level of investment and understanding of the importance of scientific advice to this parliament. And as a consequence, I've long held the view that the British model is, uh, and, and followed by the American model in terms of their advice to their Congress, is the models that we could adopt in this country. And as a consequence, we did look at this issue in regard to the Senate inquiry into nationhood, national identity and democracy, and that uh, committee uh, recommended that the Australian government established a parliamentary office of science modelled on the UK parliamentary office of science and technology to provide independent, impartial scientific advice, evidence and data, and all to all members and senators. It was recommendation 14. Now, I chaired that inquiry. It was a recommendation that was bipartisan. So I'm particularly uh, concerned that the government now finds this proposition dangerous that says that uh, there's adequate advice and we don't need to do this uh, we don't need to have this reference I've, it's somehow or another this has suddenly become a contentious issue now if members are going to uh, members and uh, senators are going to debate and pass laws that govern Australians they do need access to reliable information impartial information they don't need to have ideologically loaded information, and I acknowledge that there are going to be differences of opinion about the nature of that information, but they do need access to the very best information. And you simply can't rely upon the department to provide that in their, on their own. And it's possible that even fine organisations like our scientific agencies are able to present information which is contestable. We hear on a regular basis it is contestable. Now, I take the view that it is important that the institutions and process of the parliamentary doctors would not be possible without that debate and without that access. And a proposed uh, science office would in fact enhance democracy in this country. It would enhance our understanding of how this country is actually faring. And the fact that, for instance, the IPCC uh, report has highlighted the challenges that this country faces. The arguments about how we deal with those challenges are inherent to the political process. We don't have to agree about the mechanism by which we address those challenges, but we do have to address those challenges. And the pursuit of that advice through proper scientific analysis is critical to that solution. And what we've got, I see, is an example where the government's opposing this motion because it's inherent within this government a fundamental hostility, a fundamental hostility to scientific inquiry. A war on science has been the hallmark of this government throughout its life. We are, of course, now debating whether or not an office would be useful, an office debating whether or not we could create such an office would enhance our work as members of parliament. It's an extraordinary proposition. 
the debate whether or not it would enable us to serve better the people of this country, the people who actually pay our wages, on whom we, of course, uh, are we supposed to serve, people who, of course, look to us to provide advice. So what's the argument about the establishment of the Parliamentary Office of Science? Well, they say, well, there's sufficient advice already available through the Office of the Chief Science and other advisory bodies to the government. Now, no one's disputing the fact that we do have quality advice available. But is anyone realistically going to say that that's adequate? Is anyone realistically going to be able to argue a case that it's sufficient? Is anyone really going to be able to maintain a proposition that there is a, that is appropriate that we don't have a, that we have enough advice in terms of the way in which the challenges facing this country are being addressed? It's already a model of provision of independent advice that's available, and of course we see it with the parliamentary budget office. Is anyone going to say suddenly that the treasury is being usurped? because there's an independent parliamentary budget office? Does anyone suggest that we have the authority of the Treasury now so fundamentally challenged that we can't function? It's a nonsense, a complete nonsense. Public servants in the Treasury Department, the Department of Finance, do provide advice to government of the day, but there needs to be an independent source of advice to the parliament. And that's why a proposition such as this provides us with a vehicle to ensure that that can happen. It's important that the parliament has its own source of advice on matters of uh, fiscal questions, and we've accepted that, but we don't accept it in regard to scientific questions. The Parliamentary Office of Science is able to provide that same level of advice as the Parliamentary Budget Office does, provide information we need in terms of being able to do our job properly our, as members of parliament. It's about our job to hold governments to account, but above all, to service the people that send us here. And that's what I find quite extraordinary. Now, it's not for the first time that we hear this argument that from the government that said, oh, just trust us, just trust us. By taking that attitude, the government really is saying, we want to maintain control, we want to maintain access, we want to be able to provide that vital resource, that information that allows us to tell you what's good for you. Well, that's not satisfactory. That's no way in which parliamentary accountability can be exercised. What we have to have is access to independent, reliable information on matters that require scientific expertise. The message running throughout this recommendation on nationhood and the inquiry was that we build trust within the public, within the nation, if we can provide the proper levels of communication about these questions, if we can debate these questions on the basis of sound knowledge, not just prejudice. If this parliament is to do its job properly, we have to restore confidence, public confidence in the work in which we undertake. It's a fundamental principle of the way in which the democracy ought to function. Now, the lesson of the pandemic pandemic is that the public is wide open to the proposition you can trust scientific advice, but it needs to be presented properly. It needs to be presented on the basis that it is contestable. There's no magic formula. There's no Ten Commandments. There is to be a debate about these things based on sound advice. That's the way citizens respond positively to medical emergencies. That's how people are able to respond positively to the questions, fundamental questions of public health. Ill-informed comments have unfortunately been heard all too often throughout our political system. The former chief scientist, Professor Ian Chubb, proposed that the Australian government set up a formal relationship between parliament and the scientific community. A formal relationship would define what it means to provide scientific advice to parliament and to the government. Now, that relationship does exist within the United Kingdom, where the parliament has signed an agreement setting out the roles and the responsibilities of the two parties. It's a proposition that I have advanced before about a charter, a charter between the parliament and the scientific community. Professor Chubbs argues the case that we need to have an agreement which includes such things as the scientists have an obligation to provide free, frank advice 
that was good as they would possibly offer, given that advice that was available to them and their own expertise and their own work. On the other side, the parliament has to make a commitment to make that advice public. This process, of course, which led to the creation of POST, the UK Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, which the Nationhood Inquiry, as I've indicated, recommended as a model for this country. POST works well because both houses of the UK Parliament uh, described, uh, involved and they describe the job as helping bridge the gap between research and policy by providing parliamentarians with up-to-date research evidence and expertise to inform legislation and scrutiny. And to the, those that say, well, you know, this gets captured, gets captured by scientists. The thing about Post, and I've read their material for many, many years, it's balanced. It's actually in plain English. And it acknowledges the importance of social considerations as well as the purely scientific. And it's proved its worth. It's existed since 1989. It was established under the Thatcher government. That great radical, Margaret Thatcher, of course, the government that, you know, for this reactionary mob here, far too, far too dangerous a person to be able to undertake something like that. So no one in the United Kingdom argues somehow or another it usurps the role of the government's own advisers. But a post is jointly funded by the Houses of Parliament in the United Kingdom. It's overseen by a board made up of 10 members of the House of Commons and four members of the Lords, chosen on the basis that reflects the balance of the parties in the parliament. Researchers are chosen by learned academies representing the breadth of scientific disciplines, representatives of the research and information committees of the parliament. So there's no reason why a similar model couldn't apply here. And this reference would provide us with a vehicle to check all of those things out. We should be able to be conscious of how such damage has been done in terms of democracies about ill-informed opinion and the breakdown in public trust in public institutions. The establishment of a formal relationship between nation scientists and the parliament is an important to restore trust, but it's important for the, for the re-establishment of confidence in the parliamentary system itself. It would also work to overcome the toxic effect of the scurrilous attacks on science and on scientists, attacks promoted by and including members of this parliament who should know better. Now, of course, they've done it for very partisan reasons. They think there's a vote in it. They think that building on prejudice, on building upon this sort of populist, reactionary, nationalist notions is going to somehow or another produce a political dividend for them. We've heard in uh, various elements suggest that somehow or another this is about defending Western civilisation. Well, strangely, these are the same people that won't or don't usually have uh, any science in mind when they talk about Western civilization being under threat. Yet modern science is at the finest achievements of Western civilization. It's the flowering of the Enlightenment values of organized rational inquiry, inquiry into the nature of the world around us, inquiry into humanity's place in the world. Science has transformed life for the better, for people all over the world. Yet in our time, we have come to witness attacks on the people who seek to spread this understanding of life and, of course, and being encouraged by people that want to spread distrust. This is a time of anxiety in which people are inciting fear about the consequences of new developments in science and technology because of the impact of these developments on the future of work, because of the concern about the changes in terms of the climate, about the threat spread of disease, about the fears in terms of our international strategic situation. And since the government's election in 2013, it's allowed the fear mongers in its ranks to influence public policy way beyond their intellectual capacities. We've seen cuts to the scientific, the public science agencies. We've seen the failure to fund our university research agencies. We've seen a war on science, which has undermined our capacity to be able to deal with the really big problems facing our society. 
So we simply can't turn our backs on the Enlightenment. And this is a big problem for this government. They have yet to come to terms with the Enlightenment. And we should be standing with science and we should take advice from the scientific community and we should defend those that elect us, rebuild public confidence, rebuild confidence in the parliamentary democracies by ensuring that people understand that we are actually for the future of humanity and we should be trying to, to build hope rather than extinguish it. And by investing in science, by demonstrating our trust in science, we are in fact strengthening democracy. And democracy just only thrives when we have a respect for the truth. Senator Carr, your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I will be discussing the cost of shoddy science that is crippling people, crippling families, communities and our nation. One Nation has repeatedly called for and continues to call for an independent office of scientific integrity and quality assurance to assess the science claimed to be underpinning government policy and decisions. We want objective, independent scientific scrutiny that is protected from politicisation. Science is not a label. It is hard, verifiable, reliable data within a logical framework that proves cause and effect within a framework that proves cause and effect logically. It's every senator's responsibility to ensure that she or he makes decisions using such data. I'll give you some examples of the cost of shoddy science that has not been scrutinised. Climate policies and renewable subsidies cost Australian households via electricity costs $13 billion per year every year. That's $1,300 per household per year. Needlessly wasted. Median income in this country is $49,000. After tax, that's around about 34, maybe a little bit higher. How the hell can anyone on $39,000 after, after tax afford $1,300 just being flushed down the toilet for nothing? The additional cost of climate policies on our power bills is a staggering 39% not the 6.5% that the government claims. Renewables distort the low-cost coal-based power and more than double the wholesale electricity price from coal's $45.50 per kilowatt hour to $92.50. China and India use our coal to, to sell electricity at $0.08 cents a kilowatt hour, while we burn the same coal without transporting it thousands of kilometres and the price of electricity from that coal is three times as much at 25 cents a kilowatt hour. All Australians have a right to benefit from our rich natural resources. The true cost of electricity in this country would be $13 billion per year less if cheap, affordable, reliable coal production was not lumbered with policies that distort the market. We commissioned independent expert and respected economist Dr Alan Moran to get those figures, to calculate those figures, and he used the government's own data. So it can't be sensibly refuted. The government stopped presenting it in consolidated form to hide what government policy is doing to Australian, everyday Australians in their nation. Every subsidised green energy job, so-called renewable job, from renewable or unreliable power, wind and solar, Every one costs 2.2 jobs lost in the real economy. Parasitic unreliables, parasitic unreliables are killing its host, the people of Australia and the people of Queensland. We go further beyond raw data on energy costs to look at property rights. Property rights have been stolen in this country in the name of the Kyoto Protocol. John Howard started it, his, his Howard Anderson government started it with Rob Borbidge's National Party government in Queensland, then followed quickly by Peter Beattie's government and every government since, with the exception of Campbell Newman, who failed to repeal it. But the property rights have been stolen with no compensation. That is fundamentally wrong. We see water policy with corruption in the Murray-Darling Basin when it comes to water trading. We see the, the stealing of water rights 
all based on shoddy science. The whole Murray-Darling Basin plan is based on shoddy science, political science. Instead of having science-based policy, we now have policy-based science, and both sides of this parliament are, are responsible. Senator Carr, who I have a lot of regard for in many ways, raised COVID. We have not been given the scientific data on COVID. We've been given models. The scientific data, which I got from the chief medical officer, points to a completely different picture, completely different management. COVID is being mismanagement in the name of science, mismanaged in the name of science. It is wrong. Now, what we want to turn to now, the costs, by the way, of, of all of those examples I've given are not in the billions, but in the tens and hundreds of billions. And the impact on our, on our country's economy is in the trillions. The lost opportunity, the lack of competitiveness. COVID, ex COVID exposed to us that our country has lost its economic independence. We now depend on other countries for our, for our survival, for basics. We've lost our manufacturing sector because of shoddy governance from the Labor Liberal National Party for almost eight decades, since 1944. And in the last 18 months, we've seen Liberal and Labor and National squabbling at state and federal level because there is no science being used to drive the, drive the plan. There's no plan for COVID management. Each state is lurching from crisis to crisis, manufactured crisis to manufactured crisis, and the federal government is bypassing the Constitution and conditioning them to suck on the federal tit. That's what's going on. Let's have a look at the science. I have held the CSIRO accountable. Three presentations from them plus Senate estimates. The CSIRO has admitted under my cross-examination that the CSIRO has never said that carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger. Never. We asked them who has said it because politicians tell us you said it. They said you'll have to ask the politicians. Secondly, the CSIRO has admitted that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. I'll say that again, not unprecedented. They've happened before in recent times without our burning of hydrocarbon fuels. Thirdly, the CSIRO then fell back on one thing, one paper after almost 50 years of research and said that the rate of warming is now increasing. That too was falsified by the author of that paper. It was then falsified and contradicted by other references which the CSIRO had to then give us. There is no evidence for the CSIRO's sole claim that rate of temperature rise is unprecedented. Its own papers that it cites do not show that. The CSIRO then relied upon unvalidated computer models that are already proven to be given errone giving erroneous pr projections. And that's what, the, that's what the UN IPCC relies on. They've already been proven wrong many times. The clincher is that to have policy based upon uh, science, you would need to quantify the amount of impact on climate variables such as weather, rainfall, storm activity, severity, frequency, rain, uh, drought. You'd need to be able to quantify the impact of carbon dioxide on that from human, carbon dioxide from human activity. The CSIRO has never has never quantified any specific impact on climate or any climate variable from human carbon dioxide. The CSIRO has repeatedly with us relied on discredited and poor quality papers on temperature and carbon dioxide. It gave us one of each, and then when we tore it to shreds, they gave us more. We tore them to shreds. It has never given us uh, any good quality papers, scientific papers. That's their science. CSIRO revealed little understanding of the papers they cited as evidence. That's our scientific body in this country. They could not re re show understanding of the papers that they cited. The CSIRO admits it has never done due diligence on reports and data that it cites as evidence. Just accepts peer review. What a lot of rubbish that is. That's been shown in peer-reviewed articles to be rubbish. The CSIRO allows politicians to misrepresent CSIRO without correction. It doesn't stand up, doesn't have any backbone. The CSIRO has misled parliament. Independent international scientists have verified our conclusions with the CSIRO science and they're stunned. 
People like John Christie, Nurse Shaviv, Niels Morner, David Leggetts, Ian Plymer, Will Happer. There is no climate emergency. None at all. Everything is normal, completely cyclical weather. Now we'll move to the UK's Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology that's turned into a propaganda outfit and a mouthpiece and cheer squad for global policies. Politics has captured it and turned it into a massive bureaucracy that's rights legislation, not checks legislation. Post, as it's called, is composed of people, as, as uh, Senator Carr said, consistent with parliamentary composition. That tells us straight away it's not independent. Instead of a body to drive legislation, we want a body to vet it. Senator Carr mentioned the name of, uh, mentioned the office of chief scientist. I asked the chief scientist for a presentation on his evidence of climate, climate change caused by human carbon dioxide. After 20 minutes of rubbish, we asked him questions and he looked at us and said that he's not a climate scientist and he doesn't understand it. Yet we have policies around this country based upon uh, Dr Finkel's advice. That's the state. Those policies that I mentioned, some of them are due, uh, are based on his advice. We've had activists such as Tim Flannery, David Caroli, Will Steffen, Ross Garno, Ove Goldberg, Matthew England, Kurt Lambach, Andy Pittman, Leslie Hughes, being paraded by the governments, both Liberal and Labor, paid by the government, and yet they're nothing more than academic activists. None have provided any empirical scientific evidence in a logical framework proving cause and effect. That's what parades around this parliament for decades now as science. It's rubbish. That's why One Nation opposes this motion. It is wasting committee resources to send them off on a goose chase to adopt something like the um, UK's Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. We invite Senator Carr to join us in legislating an independent body of scientists to scrutinise government policy and decisions, to scrutinise them. Let the government put up the science upon which its policies are based and let the independent body scrutinise it. That requires a few things. First of all, it needs a team funded and set up to be opposing the government's position. And let them both go at it. Science fundamentally is about data and about debate. We need the, we need the government to put up its science and let a team tear it apart and be funded to tear it apart. Once that happens, then the science is dismissed. That saved the, that saved the country billions of dollars. If it withstands the scrutiny, that's good. We know we've got a, a really solid scientific case. The other way is to have a transparency portal. Put the science out there and let anybody in the public, anybody in the public domain, tear it apart. And if someone finds a chink, fix it. Because scientists, true scientists, are not about protecting their egos, they're about being open to the advancement of humanity. And so they welcome their own science being torn apart. We need an independent view. The type of information, as uh, the motion discusses, is simple. All we need is empirical scientific evidence in a framework proving cause and effect. We then need independent scrutiny, and I've given you just two examples. That will replace policies that, as Senator Carr has discussed, and I agree with him, are based on ideology, headline-seeking, headline prejudice, opinions, looking after vested interests, looking after donors. This is what's driving this country, and the people are paying for it. They're paying for it through the neck. And we're destroying our country. We need the claim science to be scrutinised and verified and rejected. What a shameful, disgraceful incident we saw in, in this parliament just after midday today. We saw Senator Wong. We saw Senator Watt. We saw Senator Waters engaging in a screaming match. Not once, not once, not once did anyone raise empirical scientific evidence. This is day 701 since I've asked the chief proponent in this parliament for this climate change nonsense to be accountable for her data. I've asked Senator Waters, I challenged her 701 days ago, almost two years ago. I challenged her 11 years ago. 
She has never, debate, never uh, agreed to debate me. She refuses to debate me. She refuses to put up the scientific evidence. She refuses to discuss the corruption of climate science. And yet she, yet she espouses pol uh, policies that will gut this country. But we also, we've also seen Senator Wong quoting a report from the IPCC. That's not a report from scientists. That's a report from political activists. And then she talks about what we are told, insert the catastrophe, will happen in the future. That's not science. What we need is an honest debate. We need, we need an honest debate to reveal the pure science and to hold people accountable in this parliament. We will not be supporting this motion because it will encourage politicisation. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, has there ever been a more anti-science government than the government we've got today? And let's be clear, we've got Scott Morrison as Prime Minister giving free range to the whack jobs on his side to spout all manner of anti-science agendas, whether it be— uh, Senator Hanson Young, please resume your seat. Referring to members of uh, this place as whack jobs is appropriate parliamentary language. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, the, there was no reference to people's names. I appreciate it's coming close, um, and I'd ask senators to uh, participate in the debate respectfully. But there was no personal attack. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The anti-science rubbish that is spouted out from that side of the chamber, from the Morrison government, and I might say it's not just confined to the backbench. I know we've got Senator Rennick and we've got uh, Mr George Christensen and we've got you know, Senator Canavan and a bunch of others, but we also have the Deputy Prime Minister, Madam Deputy President, who is one of the cheerleaders of anti-science in this parliament. So much so that dismissing uh, climate change science almost in totality, dismissing the science in relation to water security in this country, and now even today, this afternoon, the leader of the National Party, the Deputy Prime Minister of this country, Mr Joyce, has his party out declaring that they are going to amend the environmental, uh, Environment and Biodiversity Act in this place when it comes before the parliament to tomorrow to remove the prohibition on nuclear power in this country. They don't quote science in relation to this, Madam Acting Deputy President. It is all part of their crazy whack job agenda. It is part of the tinfoil hat brigade of which keeps the seats warm on uh, the, that side of the chamber in the Morrison government. And it, all, it suits the Prime Minister, of course, to have these crazy fringe groups within his own party banging on about this stuff because it look, makes him look almost reasonable. <laughs> but we've got everything is relative, Madam Acting Deputy President. Everything is relative. And when you see the scientific facts, the warning signs from around the world, the world's leading climate scientists telling us point blank that we are running out of time to take action on climate change, to reverse the catastrophe facing our environment. If you're the Prime Minister of the country and you still stand there today at a press conference addressing the nation and telling them you're doing enough, it's because you don't believe in science. It's because you don't have regard for science and scientific fact. It's because you don't listen to the experts. And of course, this is the same Prime Minister who, when the COVID pandemic first hit and was spreading rapidly across the world and was starting to spread across Australia, dismissed the concerns of the experts, said it was fine to shake hands, said it was fine to go to the football. We don't need any type of border controls. We don't need lockdowns. Oh, we probably don't even need a vaccine. 
the Prime Minister was dragged kicking and screaming to take action in the midst of this pandemic, and it was because the rest of the country listened to the science, because other leaders around this country, our state premiers of both persuasions, I might add, listened to the science and the health experts. It wasn't because it was coming from the Prime Minister. It certainly wasn't coming from the top. Now, I just want to come back to this point about why this government is dismissing this important reference today to establish a, science a parliamentary office of science, because they don't want to be challenged, Madam Acting Deputy President. They don't want to be held to account. And when you've got people like Mr Barnaby Joyce, the Deputy Prime Minister, free-ranging on government policy, proposing to move drastic amendments to government legislation, such as building nuclear power in this country, without any facts, without any science, without regard to the huge amount of nuclear waste that something like this creates, the cost, the time frame, the huge amount of water that Australia actually can't afford in the midst of a drying climate. And we don't even have time to daydream about these types of projects anymore. The science is clear. We have to take action now. We have to take action now, and we know what we have to do. We have to get onto renewables. And it's here. It's wind. It's solar. It's storage. We don't have the luxury of spending billions and billions and billions of dollars on feasibility studies for some pixie fairy dust idea of a nuclear power plant in 20 years' time. The climate is already in crisis. But, of course, this is what has happened to this government. Mr Morrison has lost control. The science deniers on his side, the science deniers that sit on both the front bench and the back bench of this government, are running rings around the Prime Minister, creating chaos wherever they can find it. And today is just another example. No wonder this reference is being voted down today. Now, I just have one question for the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr Joyce who has today announced as the National Party that they want a nuclear power station built in this country. They want to amend laws tomorrow in this place. Well, where's it going to go? Whose town and whose suburb is Mr Joyce's first nuclear power plant going to be built? Good question. Now, I, I, Good question. I put it to you that if a member of the National Party can walk in here tonight or tomorrow and tell us which town they want this nuclear power station built. I'll debate them in the town. That's right. Let's hire the hall and let's get it started. They won't because they are cowards. They are running an anti-science agenda. They are running an anti-climate agenda. They are anti-planet. They are anti-people and they're anti-Australian. They want to hold our country back. They are all in it for themselves. They think this is a quick, cheap political point-scoring exercise. It'll get them some headlines. Morrison as Prime Minister, Mr Morrison as Prime Minister, doesn't have the guts to slap them down. We've seen that already. He refuses to call out Mr Christensen in terms of his COVID denialism and spreading of lies. They refuse to call out Senator Rennick for his reckless comments and behaviour. They refuse to call out Senator Canavan. The nut jobs in the National Party have the Prime Minister running scared. Uh, Senator, Senator Hanson Young, uh, Senator Davey. Uh, again, I mean, yes, she generalised to a party. But the use of the term nut jobs, specifically after directly naming some of those members in that said party, is unparliamentary. Uh, well, Senator Hanson Young once again didn't directly refer to any particular members. 
uh, once again, I'll remind the Senate. I've ruled, I've ruled, Senator Davey, it's not a debating point. Resume your seat. Uh, I would res uh, ask senators to conduct the debate in a, a respectful manner. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. I've made my point. Okay, thank you. So, if there are no further speakers, Senator Hume. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy. Sorry, Deputy President. Uh, the government will be voting no to this motion. Uh, the coalition government has invested record amounts of funding in scientific research and development. Our open and transparent approach to scientific advice has helped drive our world-leading response to COVID-19 pandemic. Just this week, for example, the government provided not only the parliament but the entire nation with the Doherty Institute modelling that underpins our approach to vaccination. The proposal to create a new body would see more taxpayer money spent on more bureaucracy, duplicate existing functions and mechanisms and see no appreciable gain in the effectiveness or the efficacy of scientific advice. Thank you, uh, Senator Hume. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Waters on behalf of Senators Rice and Carr uh, to refer a matter to the Economics Reference Committee be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <clears throat>
stop the bells. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Waters on behalf of Senators Rice and Carr to refer a matter to the Economics Reference Committee be agreed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order. There being 17 ayes and 19 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I call the clerk. Government business orders of the day number one, family assistance legislation amendment, child care subsidy bill 2021, second reading debate and the amendment moved by Senator Pratt. Um, Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Child Care Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Child Care Subsidy Bill 2021. And in doing so, I start by stating that Labor broadly supports this bill because, of course, we support making Senator child Smith, care. Senator Smith, would you are you able to move a little closer to the microphone because you're fading out? Thank you. I'll try. Um, Labor broadly supports this bill because we, of course, support making childcare more affordable and more accessible for more Australian families. But our support for the bill shouldn't be taken as an endorsement of the Liberals' childcare policy. It is not. We know that the Liberals' policy on childcare fee assistance doesn't go far enough. Indeed, it is a missed opportunity to drive the economic recovery and a missed opportunity to support families with children in early learning. Mm. When it comes to childcare fee um, policy, Senator Smith, if you just wouldn't mind for a moment, um, I'm having great difficulty hearing the senator speak. So, if senators are not participating in this debate. Uh, could you leave the chamber? And I don't know if you can make it any louder, uh, Senator Smith. But let's just try again. Thank you. I don't know if I can. So, is it being picked up for broadcast, or do we need to do something? Yeah. Right. I think it's okay now. Okay. I'll, I'll start again. Thank you. Labor support for this legislation shouldn't be taken as an endorsement of the Liberals' childcare fee policy. It is not. It's a missed opportunity. As I said, it's a missed opportunity in terms of the economic recovery, a missed opportunity to support families with kids in early learning. And our policy, Labor's policy, is clearly more beneficial to more families and more children in care. It's better because we genuinely believe in the benefits of early learning. We believe in the benefits for productivity for our economy. We haven't, like the Liberals, been dragged kicking and screaming to a sensible position on fees. We value early learning. We value the children in it. We value the families who rely on it. And we value the workforce which delivers it. And despite promising a once in a generation reform of early learning, we have seen consistent fee increases under the coalition government, indeed a 36% increase since 2013. Childcare costs have been growing at approximately double CPI over the past quarter, and the government predicts these costs to grow by a further 4.7% in the next four years. And why does this matter beyond cost of living concerns? It matters because childcare and early learning is beneficial for children in it. It's beneficial for many families who rely on it. It's beneficial for productivity. It's beneficial for our economy. Now, the policy which underpins this legislation was announced to great fanfare earlier this year. 
And while the fee relief is welcome, of course it is, and that's why we'll support this bill, let's be clear about who misses out under the Liberals' policy. Because we know there are more than 700,000 families who will receive no lift at all. Indeed, under this policy, every single Australian family with one child aged five or under in care with a combined family income of less than $530,000 a year will not receive any lift in benefit. Any extra support the Liberals' policy provides to families with two children in childcare will be ripped away once the family's oldest child goes to school. What's more, it doesn't start until July 2022, which is absurd when we know how important and urgent fee relief is for families now. Of course, there is another way. There is Labor's policy, which the government could adopt. Labor's policy, which does not discriminate based on the size of a family, which has no age cutoff and applies to all children using outside school hours care during primary school. Our policy, which will boost support for every child whilst they're in childcare and will leave 1 million Australian families better off. Push your pride aside and sign up to it. It's good policy. It's good policy if you genuinely believe to the importance of fee reform and fee relief. But of course, that's key, right? You've got to genuinely believe in it. You've got to genuinely believe in the sector which this legislation seeks to assist, the sector which holds the key to greater productivity, greater economic benefits, and of course, greater social benefits from improving access to early learning. Because every time we invest in early learning in Australia, we're not just investing in social reform, we're investing in productivity, we're investing in economic growth. That's critical to remember. Labor gets it, right? We get the importance of early learning. And I stand up here and I speak about this frequently. We get it, we believe the science. We've just had a far ranging discussion on science in this place. Let's talk about the science of early learning. We know in those first thousand days of a child's life, critical brain connections are formed. And if those brain connections aren't formed, there can be dire consequences for the children involved. And they're formed through some of the most simple and pleasurable things for a child, counting fingers and toes, singing songs, telling nursery rhymes, these sorts of actions which help a child develop. And for some children, the place they get that interaction, they get that stimulation, they have that opportunity for those connections to form is in an early learning setting. And for particularly vulnerable children, that can be the only place where those brain connections have the opportunity to come alive. That's why it's so important for vulnerable kids, especially. And that's why our early educators are absolutely doing life-changing work every single day. Life-changing work for the children in our community who stand to benefit the most from the work they do and the support they provide. So fee relief is absolutely an economic reform, an economic measure, a productivity measure. But it is also one of the greatest things we can do socially in terms of enabling children, and particularly those children, who may not get a chance to go to an early learning setting if fee relief isn't provided, giving those children that opportunity to attend, to have those brain connections formed, to have that stimulation, that care, that support, which is provided in an early learning centre. It's a way of ensuring children get that opportunity for the basic fundamentals of their early learning and development. That's what should guide our approach to early learning and early <laughs> education in this place. Of course, it's been put at risk from the pandemic. We have seen the pandemic shut some children out of their early learning centre, shut them out of that connection with their educators, shut them out from that potential to have those connections formed. We've seen our early learning educators under extraordinary pressure in trying to deliver the life-changing and critical work that they provide for children. We've seen them ignored, we've seen them let down. We've seen their calls for help go unanswered at the beginning of the pandemic when they were saying, where's the PPE? When I wipe a child's nose, where's my PPE? When they were performing the essential work, not just in terms of the work they were providing for children in their care, but the essential work they did, which meant our essential workers in other industries could go and do their jobs. The children they were caring for, whose parents were on the front line of this pandemic, who couldn't do that work, 
who couldn't staff the hospitals, who couldn't be in our aged care centres, who couldn't provide caring roles or policing roles, or even indeed political roles, if it weren't for the incredible early learning workforce, which was standing there behind them and supporting them. And it's those workers, those educators, who were let down so severely during this pandemic by the government. And now we're looking at a policy which is to a great extent about access because fees, costs, determines access for many, many families. And when you don't get that right, you don't give as many children the opportunity to attend an early learning centre. And for many children, if they don't attend that early learning centre, they will miss out on so much. Now, conversations about early learning in this place can be controversial. It is beyond me why. So this isn't about pitting families against each other. It isn't about your choices as a parent. It's about ensuring that all those children in our community who stand to benefit from access to an early learning centre, from access to our dedicated childcare workforce, and all the opportunities in terms of their development that that can bring, have the opportunity to do that. That's what fee relief really is about. And it's about ensuring that all those parents who stand ready to make a contribution to our economy, to our society, to our community, aren't prevented from doing so because they can't afford hours and time in early learning and hours and time in childcare. It's absolutely critical on the economics, in terms of its social reform, in terms of productivity, and of course, for our children, for the kids in Australia who stand to benefit from it. So, Whilst I stand here as part of the Labor team, yes, supporting the legislation, we wish it went further, we wish it did better, and we wish it provided that recognition, that critical recognition that it should for the value of early learning, the value of childcare, the opportunity attending care can bring to so many children. And I wish that in earnest it did more, it went further, it did better because there is so much more we can do to support the early learning and development of children in Australia. There is so much more we can do to show that we value our early learning educators, not just in what we say about them and how we thank them, but in how we pay them, how we respect them, how we treat their work, how we prioritise them as the essential workers they are. There is a huge road ahead in getting early learning policy right in Australia and getting childcare policy right in Australia. This was an opportunity to do so much more. Put your pride aside, follow Labor's policy, and perhaps think creatively about the way our investments in this sector, the way our investments in early learning could be truly transformative for our economy, for productivity, for families, for children in early learning, and for our society as a whole. That would be a truly visionary thing to come out of this place. A truly reforming thing, worthy of that word, worthy of the word reform. But in saying that, we do support the legislation. We support any effort to provide fee assistance to families. I'm happy to do that, but I will be fighting in here every single day to make sure that we are always striving to go further, always striving to deliver more, to value the sector, to value the children in early learning, to value the families who are using it, to value it for its contribution to Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Smith. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. I rise to speak on the family assistance legislation today, the childcare subsidy, but I want to make one thing very, very clear from the outset. This is not a women's issue. And yes, whilst it's a family issue, a personal family issue about how they want to run their households and their lives and their working lives, it is actually, most importantly, an economic issue. And on this side of the chamber, the Morrison government, we want to ensure that, ensure that we get the best economic outcomes across the board, a concept that's evidently beyond the grasp of the Greens, judging from their contributions in this debate, but to be fair, pretty much every debate. 
Senator Faruqi seemed to declare a formal power-sharing agreement with those opposite, something I've no doubt that my friend, the member for Hunter, Mr Fitzgibbon, will send shivers up his spine, but we can save that for another day. I also note earlier in the debate that Senator Pratt was a bit upset about an internal debate within the coalition government, and I appreciate that this must be a very strange concept to those opposite internal debate, a discussion of ideas and, perhaps even more surprisingly, a diversity of opinion. And as Liberal women, we more than know that we're dismissed by those opposite, by the so-called sisterhood as nothing more than lapdogs to the men of our party and we do as we're told. And we know that, as when many of us on this side of the chamber receive any of this derogatory and unfortunately often violent threats that's publicly visible as it's usually conducted over social media. What's that that I can hear? The cavalry? No, coming to the defence of conservative women, that would be crickets from those opposite, with a whispered, well, they deserve it, from the Caro Wilkinson feminazis. But to come back to the legislation and to Senator Pratt's point, it really is just that I do enjoy the irony that the whole concept of independent thought is foreign to you and, in fact, banned by your bosses. We over this side actually have our own agency, our own ability to stand up for what we believe in and, in fact, actually support all women, men, families, who want to make choices in how they best support their family and work life. And I, you know, I know this is an anathema to you guys over on the other side of the chamber through you, Chair, that the whole idea of personal choice, personal responsibility, mm. that not all families fit into their designated box as to whatever is the current union pulling the opposition leader's strings. Families come in all shapes and sizes, two parents, single parents, shared parents. Children can live mainly with mum, live with mum and dad can live mainly with dad. And outrageously, it's actually the women on this side of the chamber who don't assume it's always dad who's the main breadwinner, with mum at home watching Bluey in her apron. Sometimes it's actually mum who's the main breadwinner. Sometimes mum has the bigger career. And sometimes, even once they become parents, both want to return to their careers. Some families, single parent or not, don't have that choice. They're forced back to work for financial reasons. But we need to support all of these families to best manage their lives. And we need to most significantly support those families who need the most support. Childcare needs to be more affordable. And we're actively supporting families with more than one child to get back to work sooner, should they wish to without losing any additional income to childcare payments. This childcare subsidy will benefit around 250,000 Australian families, and subsidy levels in some cases will increase from 30 per cent to 95 per cent, with 50 per cent of those families paying on average just $21 a day for two children in care. And tens of thousands of families are set to benefit from the removal of the annual cap on the childcare subsidy. This will make it fairer for all Australian families. The removal of the cap will remove any disincentive for families to remain working or increase their workforce participation. And why do we want to do it? Because we believe in supporting families. We support all families. We want parents to believe that they can have more children. As I heard Senator O'Sullivan reference the Peter Costello quote, one for mum, one for dad, one for the country. Well, I have my three and I, I have had a bit of a joke with Peter that I'm still asking where the one for the country should be sent. But in truth, he's the light of my life, love him dearly, wouldn't send him anywhere. But we do want families back into the workforce and allow them to arrange the care that suits their families the best way they can, if that's what they want to do. And we want to put money back into the pockets of these families, not unions, not the black armband curriculum brigade, 
families, because we know they can make better use of that funding and the better, more income they can keep. So we want to see children access quality early learning and care, and we want it to be more affordable for families, and we want to make sure that all of that assistance is as targeted as it can be to ensure the families that require the most support receive that support. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, and I rise to speak on the Family Assistance Legislation Childcare Subsidy Bill of 2021. Uh, and this bill is a half-hearted attempt to fix the growing affordability crisis in early childhood education for Australian families. And affordability of early childhood education is in crisis, and it's a crisis ignored by the Morrison government and a crisis which is putting pressure on Australian families. Uh, and this bill, well, it's just fiddling around the edges and it goes nowhere near the reform that families need to deliver the high quality, affordable early learning system that they absolutely deserve. Uh, and once again, this government has offered nothing to support the hard working and dedicated early childhood educators who are absolutely at the heart of this system. Nothing for transparency to ensure the additional funding will actually go towards supporting high quality education programs uh, and nothing to ensure that any additional funding will go to the workforce. Nothing to protect their hours and their pay that have been so hard hit during this COVID crisis. This bill is the government's cynical attempt to save face with the women of Australia. Uh, and it shows that this government remains woefully out of touch with the experience of working people raising families, woefully out of touch with families who are paying some of the highest fees anywhere in the world out of touch with the families who are struggling to access the early learning that they need and out of touch with all of those families who are struggling to balance work and family uh, in a system that is overly complicated and fundamentally in crisis. So with this bill, the government is saying we will ease some of these costs, but only for some families, only for a short time and only if you have more than one child in childcare. So let's imagine a family with two children in an early learning service aged one and four. That family can expect to be paying childcare fees for five years for each child. Only three of those years will be while both children are in care. And for those three years, this bill will only reduce the fees for one of the children. This is a pittance. They aren't really serious about addressing this crisis. This is penny pinching uh, and it's something made up on the run to look good for a photo op in an early learning service. Uh, but it doesn't look good when you're doing the family budget. This government is penny pinching at the expense of the children and families increasingly locked out of the early learning that they need. And now more than ever, families need a system that is simple, one that they can rely on. But this bill does nothing to provide certainty to thousands of families who are affected by the Morrison lockdowns. Families who are being required to pay fees while their children can't attend services. Families who are doing the right thing, staying at home to protect the health of the community. Families who are scrambling to find the money for fees when they've lost hours, jobs or are on disaster payments. So right now, the minister could support these families by giving them one less thing to worry about. He can decide at any time to allow services to waive parent fees and give them the financial break that they need. He can decide to give early learning services the certainty that they need to keep their doors open. He can decide to protect the educators' wages and their hours um, while they continue to work to support children during this pandemic. Uh, instead, 
Every lockdown announcement means that families are left wondering what they will have to pay uh, and whether they can afford to pay it. Services are left wondering if enrolments will plummet as a result or if they can, in fact, remain viable. And educators are left wondering whether they will have the hours that they need to support their own families. Families in Greater Sydney were forced to wait two weeks into the lockdown until the minister confirmed services would be allowed to waive parent fees. Families in other lockdown states, including my state of Victoria, missed out altogether. So this government needs to do its job and give parents and services and educators the certainty that they need. Uh, it is clear in the face of extended lockdowns, the early childhood sector cannot afford to sustain parental fee waivers without government support. Uh, but once again, this government is simply not willing to step up and do what is needed. This government is straight out of the 1950s when it comes to this sector. They are yet to realise that almost a million families rely on early education to support them to return to work. Uh, they are yet to realise that over 1.3 million children benefit from high quality early learning. Uh, and they are yet to realise that this is a sector that employs 200,000 Australians, 200,000 educators and teachers. So the minister should know what needs to be done, but he is simply not doing it. Now, if the Prime Minister had done his job and delivered a speedy, effective rollout of the vaccine and a purpose-built quarantine system, we wouldn't be in this situation. Uh, and instead, parents are forced to continue to find the money to pay fees for early learning that they just can't access. And the services who can waive parent fees are left uh, wondering just how long they can afford to do so. So this government has failed to act yet again. And we have to ask who is left to bear the brunt of their inaction this time. And it is the hardworking and dedicated early childhood educators and teachers. The longer this government fails to act, the more hours and income that these educators lose as their services struggle. But the government, as we know, has shown absolutely no regard for the early childhood educators of Australia. This is the government that made the extraordinary decision to kick this workforce off JobKeeper last year. Um, long before anyone else. Um, but every day of this pandemic, educators have actually continued to work and support children and families in really difficult circumstances. They have turned up each and every day despite the risk to their personal health, despite increased workload and stress, despite the constant risk that their hours could be cut, despite the fact that social distancing is impossible in an early learning centre. They have turned up because they know that the children and the families of Australia need them. And it is time that the Morrison government recognised that too. Instead, educators across the country are still faced with loss of hours and loss of income as a result of the government's complete refusal to act, refusal to properly fund the sector through this crisis. Now, early educators are already at breaking point, and this pandemic has only further exposed a problem that was already there. Educators are exhausted, undervalued, and leaving the sector at record levels. A report released today by the United Workers' Union reveals that 37% of early educators are planning to leave the sector. 37%. That's around 70,000 educators. 70,000 educators who will leave when the sector needs an additional 40,000 educators to meet demand just in the next couple of years. So COVID has been the breaking point for thousands of Australian educators. Educators are leaving. They are saying enough is enough. And when educators leave, parents and children miss out on accessing the early learning that they need. Um, there is simply no early learning. There is simply no critical development in those early years without the dedicated, hardworking, professional early childhood educators. 
And this crisis, it will only get worse while the government fails to do its job and support families, fails to do its job and support services, and fails to do its job and support our early childhood educators. Now, Labor's amendment will give families and the early childhood sector the certainty that they need by taking the decision out of, out of the minister's hands. Our amendment makes an automatic exemption from charging families gap fees as soon as a state or territory government declares a lockdown, as soon as a lockdown is announced. Not two weeks in, not a month, as soon as it is announced, families and services will know what they can expect. They'll have the certainty that they need. Families will know that they can keep their children home in the interests of their health and wellbeing, uh, and they can do that instead of worrying about fees. Uh, and it will keep services open for the children and the families who need it. Making sure this essential service doesn't just survive the crisis, but is there to help power our recovery. Now, Labor knows the real value of early childhood education. We know that it's an essential service that not only supports working families, but is critical to supporting the early development of children. It is an investment in the future prosperity of our nation. We have a vision for an early learning sector that is high quality and simple, one that families can rely on and one that truly values the professional educators at its heart. Our Childcare for Working Families plan will see fees reduced for all children and families for longer because no child should miss out on the benefits that quality early childhood education can deliver because of high fees. Under Labor, that family of two that I mentioned earlier would receive lower fees the whole time that their children are accessing early learnings, not just for a few years and not just for one child. Labor's plan will increase the base subsidy for all children to 90% for the whole time that they are using the service. Unlike this bill, Labor's plan does not differentiate on the size of a family. It has no age cutoff and it will apply to all children using outside school hours care during primary school. So as a result, over 86%, 850,000 families would be better off under Labor's policy. Labor is also committed to ensuring early educators are not left behind. These are our frontline workers, but they are underpaid and they are undervalued. And we are determined to repay them for their essential work during this crisis. We know their value to families. We know their value to children. We know their value to our society and our community. That's why we're committed to building an early childhood education sector for the future one that children, families and educators can rely on in crisis and in recovery. Early learning is critical to the future success of our children and our economy. This sector deserves a real plan for the future, not half-hearted platitudes like this. Um, this government does not value early learning and they don't value our early educators. It is clear from this half-baked bill, which doesn't address affordability for most families in the long term, it's clear when they kick early educators off JobKeeper. It's clear when government members say that early learning is outsourcing parenting, uh, that the Morrison government is woefully out of touch with how modern families today operate. Uh, and this government is woefully selling our children and our economy short. Uh, unlike this government, Labor knows the life-changing impact of early learning. We know that the first five years are the most crucial time in a child's development. We know that early learning is one of the best investments that we can make for the future. Only Labor has a vision for a world-class early learning sector with educators respected and valued at the heart of that system. An early learning sector that every working family can rely on. A sector where every child can access the early learning that they need to grow and to thrive. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Uh, Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> I just uh, wanted to briefly explain to the chamber, while I, I will not be supporting 
uh, this legislation. Uh, in, in doing so, I want to make three quick points. Uh, first, uh, I do support uh, funding for uh, childcare. Uh, I do support helping families that would otherwise struggle uh, to look after their own children or make decisions to go to work. And I do think we should support families uh, on, on low uh, to middle incomes to do that. We already do, of course, provide um, substantial uh, assistance to low income families. Up to 85 per cent of childcare costs are covered uh, for families on lower incomes and with a sliding scale uh, over $180,000. This bill, though, would, of course, uh, remove caps for, uh, for families on, on very high incomes. Very Above, above average incomes of uh, just over or near $200,000 a year. And I'll come back to that. The, 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 the main issue I have, though, is not necessarily the changes in this bill itself. It's more that the second point I'd like to make is more that if we have, if we have $1.7 billion to allocate to support families, uh, it seems completely out of whack and out of balance to me that we cannot find any assistance. Uh, to those families who decide to look after their own children. Uh, uh, as I say, I, I support families and want to support families who make the choice to work and therefore have to uh, provide and pay for childcare uh, for their young children. But there are, of course, families that make the decision for one or other of the parents, sometimes both in combination, uh, to look after their own children. Uh, we should support that choice as well. Uh, we should uh, support parents in any choice how they decide what is best for their own children. Uh, because I do want to say the, those the mothers and fathers that do look after their own children at home are often ignored in this debate. Uh, uh, I don't like calling them stay-at-home parents. They are work-at-home parents. I know that. My, my wife for a long time did work at home looking after our children. She's back working a little bit at the moment, but uh, uh, she works a lot harder than I do uh, in, in this job. And uh, She was working at home and others working at home looking after the kids long before it was cool, long before it was cool during the coronavirus, and they have not been recognised adequately. I want to say here that uh, I do recognise the effort they do put in. I think it was summed up by a quote from C.S. Lewis, or a quote that's attributed to C.S. Lewis, that the homemaker has the ultimate career. All other careers exist for one purpose only, and that is to support the ultimate career. And that is exactly right. It's exactly right. The point C.S. Lewis was making was that our defence forces are there to defend the home. Our businesses are there to make wealth, to support the home and the education of children in the home. And it's ultimately then the homemaker, the person that is looking after the home and supporting children, uh, raising families, that is the ultimate career, because all other careers are just there to help them. Now, I often say oh, my, my job as a senator is very important, but it pales into insignificance compared to my job as a father, as a husband, uh, and likewise for my wife. That is the most important job anyone else can do yet it is barely recognised in our tax uh, or welfare system. It is barely recognised because today, if you make that choice to look after your, your, your own children, you are massively penalised, massively penalised by our tax system, which only looks at the individual, does not look at the household choices that, that families make. I make decisions with my wife as a team. We are a team. I'm not sure if my kids are on that team half the time, but we are on the same team. We are working together, but yet the tax system treats us as completely two separate entities. And if, if we made a choice, uh, or when we had young kids, if we'd made a choice for my wife to go back to work, we would have been massively uh, uh, benefit. We would have been much better ahead because the tax system would have supported us. We would have had two tax-free thresholds. It would have made an enormous financial difference. And just to put that difference into stark terms here, uh, if uh, right now. If there are two families, one family, uh, a double income family on 150 grand a year, that sounds like a lot of money, but it's the, the average uh, uh, wage today is around uh, uh, nearly $80,000, the average full time wage. So 150 grand a year is not unusual for a household together, two incomes to be on. Um, but let's say they split that with $100,000 a year from one parent and $50,000 a year from another. They pay under our tax system $32,000 roughly $32,000 in tax. 
they would receive roughly another $7,000 or so of childcare subsidies. That has to be estimated. I've assumed three days a week at $10.40 an hour, the prescribed rate. So totally, uh, when you net off those childcare subsidies, their tax bill comes in at $25,000 a year for a, for a household income of $150,000. If you have a single income family, for different families, says, look, one parent is going to go out and earn, earn the, the money and, and they're going to work a bit harder, maybe work longer hours and they earn 150 grand and the other parent is not going to earn anything and stay at home and look after their own child, child. Same income, exactly the same income as the other family. Their tax bill will be $43,000 a year. They, of course, get no childcare subsidies because they're not using it. So their tax is $43,000 a year. And the difference between those two families is a difference of nearly $18,000 in net tax a year. Same household income, exactly the same household income, 150 grand a year. Not unusual, a little bit above average, but not unusual for households to be on that amount of income today. And yet the difference in tax is nearly $18,000 a year. That is completely out of whack. It is grossly unfair and, of course, it ultimately does distort then the decisions parent and parents make about their children and the raising of their children because it is a very, very costly choice to look after your own children. And I note the contribution of the previous speaker who said it's really important that we support the education of young children. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely it's very important. Uh, yet all the evidence shows especially for children under the age of one, if, if a parent, if a mother or father can spend more time with them, it makes an enormous difference in their development. And that is not me speaking, it's OECD reports, psychological studies have all shown the more time a child under one can spend with their biological mother or father, the, the better it is for their development. So why aren't we doing anything in this bill or, or other arrangements to support the child? Because this, isn't, this, isn't this bill, isn't that what it should be about? As I said at the start, I do support helping parents who want to go back to work and helping them support their children in childcare, but I hear a lot about that in these debates, but I hear very little about the child. And, and shouldn't, in a childcare bill, the child and our children be at the front and centre of what we are trying to do? And that is another reason why we should be seeking a more neutral outcome here uh, in this legislation. And so my final point is, look, I, I, I don't have a fundamental objection to supporting families more. I do, though, think that families that are on over $200,000 a year, which this bill helps to support, aren't, shouldn't be at the front of the queue for government assistance. Uh, if you are or lucky enough to have a household income of that kind of amount, I'm in that category, and you decide to bring a child into the world, I do think primarily it should be your responsibility to look after that child. There is some government assistance there, but uh, the idea we would spend now, through this bill, through this legislation, another $1.7 billion on the richest people in our community, the absolute top few percent. This bill only helps out those, those few who are the absolute top few percent, like us. We're low. This bill's for us, by the way. We'll all benefit from this bill. But people, single-income families on eighty, or $90,000 or $110,000 a year, and they're often at those levels when they're just starting a family. If you've got a young family, young, you might not be on a lot of money. We're not doing anything for them and for supporting. I know so many families would love to spend more time with their children when they are young and they are not necessarily earning high incomes yet. Yet we are not doing anything to help and support those choices, yet we are helping out the very lucky few that are very rich. For that reason, I'm sorry, I cannot support this legislation. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Now, Senator Polly, on line, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'd like to make a contribution to the debate on the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Childcare Subsidy Bill 2021. The bill implements the Morrison government's amendments to the childcare subsidy that were announced as part of their budget this year. Their announcement of this policy was, as per usual, full of spin because not only have they changed changes being squashed by the data analysis, they don't even come into effect until July next year. That's right, the families will have to wait almost 12 months before they see the benefit of the Morrison government's plan. Families are struggling right now to pay rising costs of childcare fees, and this bill will offer them little consolation they will have to wait too long and will only help out 
a small number of people. It also does not address the problem currently facing thousands of families who are currently in lockdown and are having to pay the gap fees. Whilst many families are un under stay-at-home orders across the country, childcare centres have remained open as essential services for essential workers. However, families staying at home have still been charged gap fees by the centres as they are legally required to levy the fees. The Minister has the ability to give centres an exemption from charging gap fees and did so for Sydney childcare centres two weeks into their lockdown. However, the government has yet to grant exemptions again for other lockdowns, which have been since insured and will likely to continue because of their failure to administer a timely rollout of vaccinations across the country. That is why Labor moved a second reading amendment in the other place to take out the exemption to the Minister's rule and put it in the Act. So there is an automatic exemption from charging gap fees as soon as a lockdown is declared. But like in March, the Morrison government has voted this down again. It is a deliberate decision of this government to slug families with additional fees throughout what is already a very difficult time. While we're having to deal with a completely bungled vaccine rollout and Mr Morrison's refusal to build purpose-built quarantine sites, lockdowns are going to continue. By voting against the amendment, he is clearly telling families that they will have to continue to pay the gap fees for childcare they're not receiving. Parents need a real plan on childcare not only will it help the pockets of Australians, it will boost participation in our economy. Under the current agenda, the Liberals have, broken, have a broken system and fiddling with the childcare subsidy as this bill does will not fix the problem. There are two schedules to the bill. The first will remove the annual cap from the family assistance law so that there will no longer be a limit on the amount of childcare subsidy that families over a specified income can receive each year. The second schedule will increase the rate of childcare subsidy for 30 percent points for second and subsequent children aged five and under, up into a maximum rate of 95 percent. However, as soon as the second child is six and starts to go to school, this support will be ripped away despite the fact that they may be in before or after school care. So whether they're in after school care or before school care, it is still going to be ripped away from them. In contrast, Labor's plan for cheaper childcare will assist more families and for a longer period of time. Our policy accommodates for families of all sizes does not have age restrictions and applies to all children using outside school hour care during primary school. Not only this, there is data to back it up. Analysis of the Parliamentary Budget Office modelling shows that 86% of families are better off, better off under Labor's policy, while only a mere 8% of families are better off under the Liberal system. Now, we wouldn't mind if we just took our policy and implemented it, because after all, we want to ensure that families are the ones who benefit. There's really no comparison. Our policy works and it will work for a significant amount of more Australians. While we will be supporting the bill, it's important to note the stark contrast to what we would provide. Also, as I said earlier, it will be of no support to families who are currently in lockdown or who will inevitably be in in the coming months as we struggle to contain the Delta variant and deal with Mr Morrison's bungled rollout of the vaccine. This has not, however, stopped the Morrison government from praising themselves for providing better assistance to families with three children in childcare at once. It may do this, but that will only help the 1.8%, I know, less than 2%, 1.8% of families 
who have three children under the age of six, what about the other 98%? Childcare fees and costs are out of control and Australian families are paying more out of pocket for childcare than ever before under the Morrison government. Since the Liberals were elected in 2013, childcare fees have risen by a whopping 36%. In my home city of Launceston, over the past 12 months, local childcare fees have risen by a staggering 4.1%, well above the national average of 2.4%, and substantially exceeding inflation. The childcare subsidy is pegged to inflation and means that families in Launceston and throughout Tasmania are paying more out of pocket for childcare. This is all concerning at a time when wages have been stagnant and when we will be, who knows what's going to happen in the future. We know that casualisation of our workforce is causing insecurity for people. Clearly the system is broken and Mr Morrison has failed families. Data from the Productivity Commission's report on government services released this year shows that high costs of childcare are a barrier to parents entering the workforce, particularly for women. It makes no sense for a parent to work if it is only going to just pay for the costs of childcare. Parents should be encouraged to work if they want to and they should not be held back by exorbitant childcare fees. By joining the workforce, it will boost our participation rate, have a positive flow on effect to the economy. There has also been a report put out by UNICEF, which is an additional evidence that the Morrison government is failing Australian families. The report titled, Where Do Rich Countries Stand on Childcare? ranks Australia 37th out of 41 countries based on childcare, affordability, access, quality, and parental leave. The report also found that Australia is one of only eight countries where childcare costs parents a quarter, a quarter of their income. This just adds to the mounting evidence that under this Morrison Liberal government, Australia is falling behind the rest of the world. We are ranked third last in the OECD for our vaccination rates. Our housing market is the third most unaffordable in the world. We are ranked 87th out of 133 countries globally in terms of economic complexity and our average internet speeds are embarrassingly, embarrassingly ranked at 61st. Mr Morrison may be going hard and strong on the Olympic rhetoric recently, but Australia is running last in the race on too many indicators. On lives, our lives should be improving, but under the Liberals, we're falling far, far behind. This tired old Morrison government's lousy childcare policy will fall short of what is needed to deliver genuine assistance to Australian families who are struggling with the obscene childcare fees. And it will fail to bring reform to the system, which is so desperately needed. Our plan for childcare will deliver for working families and have a meaningful impact. It will scrap the $10,560 childcare subsidy cap, which often sees women losing money from extra days work. Lift the maximum childcare subsidy rate to 90% and increase childcare subsidy rates and taper them for every family earning less than $530,000. This plan will bring the cost of childcare down for all Australian families and better support parents to work the hours they need and that they want to work. As it stands, the second income earner in a family is usually a woman and they should be rewarded for working more hours and contributing to our economy. The Morrison government has on so many fronts failed Australian families, but no more importantly, are they disappointing Australian families and letting those families down? Their track record is abysmal. This bill, although we will support it because something is better than nothing, will do nothing, nothing to aid Australian families. 
at a time when they need a boost, where we see lockdown after lockdown because the failure of this government to protect Australian families by rolling out in a very timely manner the vaccines throughout this country. They are failing aged care workers, they're failing early childhood educators, they are failing parents, they're failing people with disabilities. Australian families deserve so much more. Australian children in those early learning years need to have their parents able to depend on their Commonwealth government, their federal government to deliver childcare at an affordable rate and to support them entering the workforce again. I call on this government to improve what they've um, laid out in this bill and support the families who need them most. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator Rennick, you have the call. I'll just note that it's uh, only three minutes till we move to adjournment though. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And it's great to be up here tonight to speak to this bill. Uh, and let's just get a couple of things out on the table before I start getting, getting the taunts of being a dinosaur and all of this sort of stuff. I myself did stay at home for four years uh, at my choice so I could help raise my children and I was happily attended mother's groups and everything like that. And I want to be clear, I'm not talking about kindergarten either. Um, and I come from a long line of working mothers. Uh, indeed, my great great aunt uh, taught maths and physics at All Hallows for 50 years and has got a hall named after her. My grandmother was a teacher, had eight children, four before, four before the war, four after the war. My mother worked, uh, my, my wife, my sisters, and all that worked. So, this is not an attack on working mothers or anything like that. However, I would like to see greater choice in childcare. And one thing I think we've got common ground on here is how expensive childcare is. And I would argue one of the reasons why childcare is so expensive is that there is very little choice or competition in the type of childcare that parents can choose uh, and very little flexibility. So, for example, pretty much now the government pays the childcare centre directly uh, rather than the parent. So that uh, removes the choice that the parent has uh, if they, say, for example, wanted to have an at-home nanny. Uh, for, say, three hours a day rather than uh, eight hours a day. They're forced to basically pay a full day's uh, childcare. Uh, for a lot of shift workers, for example, this just doesn't work because they'll either work early uh, at six o'clock in the morning through till two, or they might work from two through till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So it's very difficult to use uh, what I'd call the formalised childcare system if you're a childcare worker. Likewise, if you come from a regional part of Australia where you might have to drive 40 kilometres, you're out in a farm and the nearest town's 40 kilometres away, are you really going to drive into town, spend half an hour, 40 minutes driving into town, then driving back, only then have to you know, waste another an hour and a half going back five or six hours later uh, when you're already on the farm? I mean, you just, you know, uh, farmers, for example, just don't have the time to drop their children off in childcare. And why would they? I mean, I grew up on a farm and I've got great memories of uh, hanging out with my dad in a big old Bedford truck when I was a child. Um, uh, so having said that, however, I did go to kindergarten and my dad was the president of the kindergarten for four years um, before actually going on and being the president of the PNF. So I guess my problem with this bill is it continues the arms race whereby the more we increase childcare subsidies, the higher childcare fees go. And I'm not convinced that parents and the children are getting better outcomes out of it. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, I think we spent about 500 million on childcare. Today, we spend over 10 billion, and I'm not sure that parents get greater choice or great, greater flexibility in the type of uh, childcare that they get. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out too is that the cost of childcare now for low-income earners hardly makes it worth the low income earners going to work. I mean, I've got different numbers here, but it looks like it's somewhere between 15 to 20,000 per child. Uh, Senator for, Rennick, could yeah. you please okay. resume your seat? You will be in continuation. I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Tonight I'm going to speak about two important initiatives. Australia's National Action Plan for Pain Management and Pain Australia's updated National Pain Services Directory. Both were launched recently at a Parliamentary Friends of Pain Management event here in Canberra. Minister for Health Greg Hunt said at the launch that chronic pain is something which can be agonising, debilitating, it can have an impact on mental health and it can simply impair one's life in the most devastating of ways. 
Like Minister Hunt, my hope is that the National Strategic Action Plan will give a sense of hope to the almost 3.4 million Australians who live with chronic pain each and every day. One of those Australians, injured in a serious accident nearly three years ago and well known to many in this building, recently sent me a message after her first visit to the Launceston Pain Management Centre saying, and I quote, thank you so much. My appointment yesterday has opened up so many more options that I never even knew I had. And she went on to finish with, I couldn't believe all the options there are once you talk to the right people. Pain Australia was tasked with developing the National Strategic Action Plan for Pain Management with financial support from the Australian Government. The resulting action plan lays out a national approach towards support for chronic pain management and has been endorsed by health ministers from every state and territory. The National Strategic Action Plan for Pain Management outlines the key actions Australians should take to tackle chronic pain, including managing pain through holistic methods. The, pain rec the plan recommends eight goals that focus on reducing the burden of disease, improving the quality of life and care for patients, educating Australians on understanding and managing pain, and supporting health practitioners to deliver the best treatment and care for pain patients. The Australian Government has provided $2.5 million for early implementation of this plan, including funding to educate and train health professionals in offering effective pain management care, as well as providing further funding to Pain Australia for consumer education and awareness programs. As one of those 3.4 million people living with chronic pain, author, advocate and Pain Australia pain champion Tara Moss described how pain restricts her activity and impacts her day-to-day -day life. Tara was diagnosed with complex regional pain syndrome after an injury five years ago. She described how her condition was invisible, but explained pain is invisible, but the fact that it is invisible does not mean it's not here. Tara said that living with CRPS is a daily mountain I need to climb, and the pathways change all the time. Some days I might make it to the top of that mountain, but frequently I never make it out of base camp, or I might not make it out of my bedclothes. That's reality of living with chronic pain. She's a great advocate. Like Tara, the Australians who live with chronic pain know how it can determine whether they can go ahead with their plans for the day, or whether those plans will have to be put off until a time when their pain is more manageable. And they know how chronic pain impacts their work, health, sleep and relationships, as well as creating flow-on effects for their families, carers, friends, colleagues and their wider communities. Through the Parliamentary Friends of Pain Management Group, my co-chair and ACT local, David Smith and I, have worked hard to raise the awareness of chronic pain and managing that pain, both here in Parliament and also within our own communities. Our group works to help health professionals access pain management education and training, as well as reduce the discrimination, misunderstanding and stigmatisation of people living with chronic pain. One pain management initiative the group has promoted is the National Pain Services Directory, which was initially launched in 2019 and updated this year. This new and improved pain services directory contains information on services offered by more than 200 facilities throughout Australia. This directory puts the information about pain management services and facilities in a format that makes it easy for consumers and GPs to find what they need. The directory search function allows people to find clinics by state and territory or by specific geographic location, by pain condition or by whether a public or private facility is needed. It means those living with chronic pain, their carers and medical professionals can make informed decisions around pain management options and pathways located in their regions. Chronic pain costs the Australian economy more than $70, million, $70 billion each year, but the cost of persistent pain goes beyond economics to quality of life. The updated National Plan, Pain Services Directory and the National Action Plan give us tools and future direction in the support we provide for Australians living with chronic pain. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to reflect on the Olympic Games in Tokyo, which finished on Sunday. Like Senator Chandler, I witnessed performances which, as Senator Chandler put it, captured the essence of the Olympic spirit. It's just a shame that Senator Chandler demonstrated the exact opposite in her contribution last week, to use the word loosely, 
when she misgendered and denigrated a trans woman athlete, Laurel Hubbard, and her qualification to represent her country at an Olympic Games. Principle four of the Olympic Charter states the practice of sport is a human right. Every individual must have the possibility of practising sport without discrimination of any kind and in the Olympic spirit, which requires mutual understanding with the spirit of friendship, solidarity and fair play. Further, Principle 6 states the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms set forth in the Olympic Charter shall be secured without discrimination of any kind, such as race, colour, sex, sexual orientation, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. The Australian Human Rights Commission and Sports Australia hold the same vision for sport when in their guidelines for the inclusion of transgender and gender diverse people in sport where they state participation in sport is a human right. We are all born free and equal in dignity and rights. Senator Chandler would have you believe people affirm their gender identity for the specific purpose of excellence at a sport and to dominate women's sport. Trans women affirm their gender identity to live as their true selves. They should not lose their human right to participate in any social and cultural practice such as sport. This is so called trans this so-called trans dominance of women's sport is a myth, which people like Senator Chandler use to cause fear, distrust and to cause division in our society. We saw at the Tokyo Olympics a number of firsts. Senator Chandler chose to focus her discrimination on one athlete, but there were a number of trans and non-binary athletes competing at the T Tokyo Olympics, including Alana Smith and Quinn a member of the Canadian women's football team. In fact, Quinn became the first trans or non-binary athlete to win a medal at an Olympic Games when the Canadian women's football team beat Sweden to claim the gold medal. Their accomplishments should be celebrated, not denigrated, as Senator Chandler did last week in this place. As Senator Chandler has said, the IOC has noted there is no evidence of an unfair advantage for trans women of their cisgender counterparts. This is true. There is no evidence of this. There are no studies which include trans women athletes comparing their performance to those of cisgender athletes. As participation in sport is a human right, we should always start from a position of inclusion. The IOC have developed protocols and policies regarding transgender athletes in sport. It is these standards which athletes such as Laurel Hubbard met in order to qualify for these games. She was humble, thankful and showed real courage at her press conference after the comp competition at these games. Laurel Hubbard exemplifies the Olympic spirit and should be celebrated as an Olympian without the question marks Senator Chandler and her ilk would seek to put on this status. This should not have to be continually said, but for Senator Chandler's benefit, I'll state it for the record. Trans men are men. Trans women are women. Non-binary people are non-binary, and their gender identities are valid, and they should not have to tolerate blatant discrimination unchallenged in this place from the likes of Senator Chandler. Senator Seward. Deputy President, I rise this evening to speak about this government's relentless debt collection against people on income support. It was revealed through questions on notice that the government has issued, uh, through estimates, questions on notice through estimates, government has issued 11,771 people with a debt notice after a review, a review of their income support payments and any JobKeeper income that they uh, were paid, that was paid to them by their employer. It is unconscionable and frankly outrageous that the government is chasing income support recipients for so-called debts when billionaires collect millions of dollars in JobKeeper while turning significant profits. 
There is a clear double standard between the individuals receiving income support and businesses who claimed JobKeeper. The government is clearly demonstrating these double standards. I am certain that the vast majority of those so-called debts will be genuine mistakes in a, in a confusing system, if in fact they are debts at all. I raised this issue again and again during the COVID uh, committee and at estimates, in fact, um, trying to myself make sense of the system. The government knew that people on both Job Seeker and Job Keeper might receive overpayments. The government says that they uh, were doing checks, and I question how significant and how uh, effectively they were carried out. The same agency that was responsible for robo debt. Services Australia told me they were undertaking a compliance review of so-called high-risk customers. But with the rate of coronavirus supplement decreasing and the stepping down of JobKeeper, people were confused about the rules and requirements. There were hundreds of thousands of people who were dealing with Centrelink for the first time. It's no wonder there was mass confusion. There, was, there are still so many unanswered questions. Did Centrelink do their due diligence, due diligence and get in touch with every single person they thought might be at high risk? Were they the, why weren't the rules clearer? How can we trust the government that was responsible for robo-debt to raise debts correctly and fairly? The short answer is we can't. Meanwhile, the government is allowing big businesses that made huge profit, profits whilst keeping JobKeeper to keep the funds, uh, while receiving JobKeeper to keep those funds. When will those billionaires get their debt notices? It is simply unconscionable to allow them to keep the millions when they have made significant profits and chase people on income support. What it, it is simply a joke for the government to say both job seeker and job keeper programs have strong compliance frameworks. Clearly that failed. We have huge corporations and exclusive private schools getting millions in payments and they don't have to pay anything back. I simply cannot understand why the government can see that this is can't see why this is nonsense. And apparently they can't be shamed into giving the money back. Meanwhile, we have people doing it the toughest. People who are doing it the toughest are the ones that are getting treated this way. People who have lost their jobs in a pandemic, who have received assistance when they needed it most, and now they're getting a kick in the teeth. If billionaires can keep their JobKeeper payments while making huge profits, then people who sought support during the pandemic and may have made a mistake should not be punished. The government should focus on giving people an income support higher payments to get through the latest lockdown instead of chasing others, some of whom may well be in lockdown. The government couldn't answer that question to me today about whether and how many people that are currently in lockdown have received these notices. People are in lockdown right now in New South Wales and Victoria, living on just $44 a day if they couldn't find more than eight hours' work. They can't afford to pay rent, put food on the table or buy essential items. People are in serious financial distress. They are being pushed to the limit. And what does this government do? It sends them a debt notice. It is unconscionable. The government should write to all those people and withdraw those debt notices and send the debt notices to the billionaires who should be paying back that JobKeeper money out of the profits that they made during the pandemic. I'm not against people making profits. I am against them making it through JobKeeper. Senator Henderson, you're joining us remotely. You have the call. Uh, Senator Henderson, we don't have audio at the moment. Try Apologies. Again. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy Go President. Go ahead. You have the call, Senator Henderson. Thank you. And this evening I raise the case of my constituents, Mary Ann and Billy Hemsley, who live in Kerr Lewis, New Geelong, the mother and stepfather of 15-year-old Talia Whale. Talia travelled to Fennel Bay, New South Wales on the 11th of July to stay with her aunt for a short holiday at the end of the school holidays. 
Several days after departing in Victoria, a statewide lockdown, being lockdown number five, was imposed across Victoria. Over the past several weeks, Ms Hemsley has applied for three separate permits for Talia, who has received a COVID-19 negative test, to enable Talia to return to Victoria, that be, but these applications have been repeatedly denied. As the days and weeks have dragged on, Ms Hemsley and Talia have become increasingly distressed, anxious and depressed about Talia's forced separation from her family. Uh, late last week, I wrote to Victoria's Chief Medical Officer, Professor Brett Sutton, urgently appealing to him to issue a permit for Talia so that she could fly back to Victoria on a flight booked last Sunday. I received only an automated reply and no response to my follow-up email. At the time I was assisting the family, a friend of the Hemsley family contacted the office of Ballerine MP Lisa Neville and was advised, uh, obviously on the instructions of the um, MP acting for Ms Neville, who is away ill at the moment, um, she was advised that the Department of Health's processes would need to be followed and there was nothing further that could be done. Given Talia is a minor, a child, only 15 years old, I considered this to be an untenable situation. Talia's mental health was in such decline that yesterday her mum drove to Fennel Bay to be with her daughter. Uh, Ms Hemsley has now applied for permits for both herself and Talia, but these have still not been issued despite regional Victoria coming out of lockdown number six. Section 17 of the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act 2006 provides for the protection of the family and the rights of the child. A large body of international and domestic law makes it clear that the rights of the child are absolute. I believe the refusal to provide Talia with a permit to return to her family may constitute a breach of the Charter. That's why I'm referring this case to the Victorian Ombudsman Deborah Glass who has done a first-class job at identifying human rights breaches uh, by the Victorian government under the guise of public health orders and has called them out. As certainly, she's still waiting for an apology after the shocking incident last year when the public housing tower in Melbourne was locked down within minutes of notice and uh, people were left in their units with no food or medicines. Public health orders are necessary during a pandemic, but they must be proportionate. And during a pandemic, human rights matters also. The right not to be locked in your home 24 seven, as happened during the Melbourne curfew. The right not to be locked in your house uh, with no food or medicines or support for those with a disability. The right of family and friends to say their final farewell to their child as happened in the case of the beautiful Cooper Onyet, who tragically drowned whilst on a school camp in Port Ferry, hundreds of kilometres away from the nearest case of the virus. Uh, there was no funeral exam exemption given, and that was an absolute disgrace. Professor Sutton explaining his decision was simply a matter of uh, equity, which is incomprehensible. And what about today's case, the right of a mother to see her daughter stricken with cancer? A woman, a mother who is fully, fully vaccinated and cannot cross the border to be with her daughter with cancer. Last year, I advocated for the family who lost their precious 16-year-old to suicide. And I was told by the most senior departmental health official that uh, an exemption would not be granted uh, because uh, this might be a breach of human rights, which is, of course, absolute rubbish. So, pandemic, as we work together to get through this crisis, I say to the Victorian government, please do not forget the importance of compassion towards Victorians facing sickness, grief and separation. I'm determined to fight for Talia. She must come home. She must return to school. And I call on Daniel Anders to do the right thing and to Senator, issue her with a permit. Senator Anderson, your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The United Nations Food Systems pre-summit last week in Rome recommended a dietary limit of 14 grams of red meat per person per day. That's one bite. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I'm appalled 
and I'll explain how this is an attack on our farmers and on every Australian. The pre-summit recommended the introduction of a worldwide environmental tax on meat of $1.60 per kilo for cattle grazing on pasture, yet not for cattle raised in intensive feedlots. That distinction reflects the influence of large multinational feedlot operators and the lack of influence that family, family farms have in the UN's eyes. As my colleague Bob Catter rightly pointed out, this UN measure will take 2.4 billion kilos of protein off the market, starving 80 million people of protein. Yes, go the UN! The third recommendation of the Food Systems Pre-Summit is to move food production within reach of population centres and produce whatever protein and nutrition is possible in that region. It's called short-chain food supply. We did that 200 years ago. People starved. Nutrition was poor. Life expectancy was less than half what we enjoy today. Then along came long-chain food supply, allowing countries like Australia to grow crops to feed and clothe those in need. World hunger fell to less than 10 per cent. The only reason there are still areas of poverty and hunger in 2021 is because of war and civil unrest. You know, the things that the United Nations were supposed to solve. World peace has eluded the UN, yet cows have not. The United Nations is proposing to eliminate global food chains that have brought good food to the world for hundreds of years. I've recently spoken about the false water shortage brought to you. Thank the UN's directive to not build new dams. This is the start of a false food shortage. The motivation is to eliminate broadacre agriculture, eliminate food exports and return all that land to nature. Rural voters will be annoyed to hear that the Morrison government bankrolled this attack on our farming community with a $64 million donation. The Liberal national government is funding our own demise the betrayal and demise of our farmers of our country. Australian farms employ 326,000 people directly. They contribute $75 billion to the economy and $60 billion to our exports. Without the bush, we'd be stuffed, broke and hungry. These three United Nations proposals will destroy rural Australia, wipe out family farms, crash real estate prices and further hollow out country towns for no benefit to us. There's no better source of protein than red meat. Yet our supermarkets now stock, stock protein and fake food products made from crickets. Why? Because billionaires can't make enough profit out of cattle. It's a variable industry with good times and bad. Billionaires can, though, make money on intensive cultivation of bugs for protein. This breaks the reliance on nature's weather and allows scheduled production of a food-like substance with great profit margins and low fulfilment costs. This satisfies the UN dictate for short-chain supply. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization is literally directing the replacement of red meat with bug protein. Skeptics can even attend one of the regular UN bug tastings where journalists are encouraged to extol the virtues of bug cuisine. The CSIRO has fallen in line behind the UN, publishing a 64-page love letter on the delights of eating bugs entitled Edible Insects, a Roadmap. Looking through the glossy pages, we see the CSIRO advocates our future should include insect milkshakes, bug ice cream and granola bars made from dried cockroaches. I'm not making any of this up. It's real. This is happening and we taxpayers are paying for it thanks to the Morrison-Joyce government. For those who think they're eating an environmentally friendly product, think again. A fake hamburger patty using plant or bug protein contains 20 chemicals found in pet food. That's all the UN and their quislings in our federal government think the public deserve, pet food. How does it make sense to grow good food and instead of eating that food, we feed it to crickets and then we eat the crickets? Fellow Australians, this, there is no protein shortage. There will be, though, if the UN succeeds in wiping out red meat production so they can hand the protein industry over to their big business corporate partners. One Nation rejects this attack on our farming community. We reject state and federal parliaments around our country continuing to demonise and isolate farmers. We will continue to oppose the UN dictating to federal and state governments. One Nation will continue to oppose ideology over humanity. We will continue to stand up for a fair society based on a citizen's right to exercise free choice about diet, health and business. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one sovereign nation. It's time to withdraw from the United Nations. Senator McGraw. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Anastasia Palaszczuk and Queensland Labor continue to fail Queensland farmers. First, they made the decision to destroy Paradise Dam in what is Australia's greatest 
infrastructure fail. And secondly, that they have done everything, well, apart from tell the truth and apart from refusing to even consider repairing the wall to the full height, leaving farmers high and dry. And now they have no plan for water security in the Wide Bay Burnett region. Again, kicking the region's farmers right in the guts. And you just have to ask Tom Marlin from Marlin Law, who's running the legal action against the Queensland government, as to how low this government has gone. The farmers who once relied on Paradise Dam are almost down and out. Meanwhile, Queensland Labor have the audacity to rub lies in their face by refusing to tell the truth about any future plans for the region. These farmers have battled drought, fire and flood, in some cases pestilence, yet the reprehensible actions of Queensland Labor have reduced water allocation to as low as 16 per cent, crippling the farmers' ability to produce crops, to produce crops in the coming seasons. And if this wasn't dire enough, the Queensland Water Minister showed his true colours last week when he was asked how the Queensland government intended to assist farmers with reduced water allocations. Now, Glenn Butcher, who is the minister in question, said that he was expecting greater rainfall this year. So there it is, folks. Queensland's Labor's solution to the drought situation in Queensland, to the lack of building dams in Queensland, is that their water minister is going to do basically a rain dance. He's going to put on a grass skirt, he's going to put on the coconut brasseries, and he's going to shilly shally all around George Street hoping that it's going to rain in Queensland. He's not going to build dams. He's not going to rebuild Paradise Dam. He's going to act like some deranged feral minion dancing all around the place, hoping it's going to rain. Well, Minister, Queensland is two-thirds in drought. And what your government's actions have done in the Wide Bay Burnett region has effectively uh, let loose a, a neutron bomb worth $2.5 billion worth of damage to the economy. So instead of the, the Queensland Labor government playing politics with this dam, instead of the Queensland Labor government refusing to sit down with the, the, the community in the Wide Bay Burnett and talk about how they're going to rebuild the dam wall, this Labor government just want to go and play politics. And I say shame on them, because this, this is destroying people's lives. It's destroying the lives of farmers. It's destroying the lives of those who are in the towns connected in the, in the Wide Bay Burnett. Now, they still don't have a plan, Mr Acting Deputy President, for water security across Queensland. Now, if we don't start doing something about water storage capacity in Queensland, that means our water storage capacity is going to fall by 30 per cent before the decade is over. Now, Tasmania has built 16 of the 20 dams in Australia over the last 20 years. Queensland, we need our dams being built. I don't care if it's a dam. I don't care if it's a large pond. I don't care if it's a weir. I just want dams built in Queensland. I want the Queensland Labor government to stop, worry, to stop worrying about oh, Anthony Ch Senator Chisholm's woken up over there. Welcome, welcome back to Daylight Hour, Senator Chisholm. Your mates in, in, in state Labor are refusing to build dams in Queensland because they hate rural Queenslanders. They hate those people on the land because the only way state Labor ever, ever get into power is by sucking up to the Greens because they know they can only get into power with the Green preferences. So no dams are ever going to be built in in Queensland while Palaszczuk stays Premier, and especially while this, this shilly showering sort of rain dancing water minister who believes the answer to, to water security water. in Queensland is not building dams, but instead to sort of pretend that he's some sort of shaman and sort of dance around the place. This is ridiculous, ladies and gentlemen who are listening at home. This is modern Labor. They don't want dams built in Queensland because they're all concerned about Green Party preferences. And I say to everybody, only the Liberal National Party believe in dams. Only the Liberal National Party want to build dams in Queensland. And we say to state Labor, stop playing politics. Do the right thing by the people Order. in Queensland and build dams. Be on the side of the farmers. Be on the side of those people who want to make our state a better place, not those moss munchies who live Sen in South Senator Brisbane. Senator McGrath, your time has expired. S Senator Chisholm, order. Senator Rice, you're joining us remotely. You have the call. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. 
Tonight, as I do most Tuesday nights, I want to speak about human rights because the Australian Greens believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be respected and protected in all countries and for all people. I want to talk first about the rights of LGBTIQA plus people here in Australia to be free from discrimination and particularly how damaging the approach in tonight's census has been for LGBTIQA plus communities. By not asking the right questions, the census is erasing the identities of queer people. Nathan Anastasi is a trans man who spoke to the ABC about what the gap in the census meant to him. He said, I've been excluded. For me, the census is the biggest data collection that occurs in this country, and so it should be designed to include a collection of data on all Australians. Anna Brown, the CEO of Equality Australia, wrote last week, the Australian Bureau of Statistics will collect a whole heap of data about my personal life, how much I earn, my religious affiliation, and even my history of chronic health conditions. But they won't learn about something that's important to the picture of who I am, my sexual orientation. In fact, once again, lesbian, gay, transgender, intersex and queer people won't be properly counted in this year's census because the ABS and the responsible minister, Michael Sakar, failed to add in questions about sexual orientation, gender identity, or variations in sex characteristics. And this erasure hurts every individual member of our LGBTIQA plus communities. And that erasure flows on to policy making. As the Australian LGBTIQA plus community census declaration noted in their powerful statement, we condemn the 2021 census for continuing to render LGBTIQA plus Australians invisible and to make it harder to address the stigma, discrimination and lack of services we experience. We call on the federal government to commit to following its own guidelines on recognition of sex and gender by including in the 2026 census the best practice questions already developed in consultation with the, with the LGBTIQA plus communities. And this matters because of the impact it has across so many people's lives, across health services, mental health provision, housing services, employment outcomes and more. I mean, the government has already promised to introduce a religious discrimination bill by the end of the year. And when the census is done, we will have detailed data on the religion of every person who chooses to answer that question. But for LGBTIQA plus people, there is no question in this year's census that enables them to make their voice count. Equality is not negotiable, and we must fight the stigma and discrimination that tragically LGBTIQA plus communities still experience. Last week marked the second anniversary of Kashmir's loss of its special autonomy status. And the Australian Greens share the grief and sorrow of activists around the world at the ongoing tragedy and human rights abuses in Kashmir. From well before 2019, we've seen very serious human rights abuses in Kashmir. We've seen a communications blackout, that, which is an incredibly serious violation of Kashmiri's human rights. We've seen weapons fired at crowds, incredibly dangerous and a fundamental attack on the freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. There have been extrajudicial killings. And the Indian government's security forces in Kashmir have operated with impunity and are not being held accountable due to special protections in law. And worse than that, the Indian government's actions have been compounded during the COVID-19 crisis. Kashmir was not provided with resources to respond to COVID-19 and had fewer doctors and ICU beds in other regions in India. And many prisoners who should have been released were held for political reasons and placed at increased risk of COVID. The attacks on human rights are horrifying and they must stop. So we call upon the Australian government to do everything it can to directly raise the issue of human rights internationally, both bilaterally and multilaterally, and including with the Indian government. This is something I've raised multiple times here and will continue to do so. And most importantly, we call for the full right for self-determination of the people of Kashmir as a fundamental human right, both under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Senator, 
Thorpe, you're also joining us remotely. You have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Every single person in this country should be absolutely ashamed that the so-called Prime Minister of this country, a man absolutely committed to not doing his job today, refused to commit to a target of net zero emissions by 2050. The sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us that First Nations knowledge is a vital tool in the struggle for climate justice. First Nations people have cared and protected our lands and waters, including our totems, for tens of thousands of years. Acting Deputy President, recent breakdowns of ecological systems and harms to biodiversity have been linked to a disregard of traditional forms of land management and their displacement by imported and harmful practices. The IPC report acknowledges the contribution of First Nations people and First Nations scientists, acting Deputy President, in helping record historical as well as current observations of a, as a, of a changing climate. Last year, we watched this country burn as we experienced one of the worst bushfire seasons in our recorded history, Acting Deputy President. And what did your so-called Prime Minister do? He took a holiday to Hawaii. He doesn't hold a hose, mate. He went missing when it was time to get this country vaccinated. What? And he doesn't hold a needle, mate? And today, when the IPCC recommended urgent action, he's gone missing again. Where is he? Get him out from under that desk. He just has no idea, mate. We need to get rid of the Morrison government, acting deputy president. We can kick the Liberals out and put the Greens in balance of power. Greens in balance of power would mean that the Greens and our advocacy for black justice and climate justice in the parliament could not be ignored, acting deputy president. It would mean that our people powered movement would need to be consulted on all laws before this place. Imagine that, imagine that. Have a look at the Greens policies. See what we stand for. We leave the rest for dead. This way we can make laws that are good for the people and for the country acting deputy president. In a balance of power, the Greens will push the next government to go harder and faster on climate change. So if we get a Labor government, because we know that they can't even, they don't know what their target is and they're still getting donations from the fossil fuel industry. So they're going to need a true party that will hold them to account and the only way we're going to do that is balance of power. Last time the Greens and Labor were in shared power we passed laws to bring down pollution. Oh yes we did. Coal and gas are causing the greatest damage to people, country and communities because Labor and Liberal are both being brought off by the coal and gas corporations. Seriously, you guys stop taking their money because when you take their money, you have to do their work, right? The Greens don't take dirty donations. So in balance of power, we will make big corporations and billionaires finally contribute their fair share of tax so that we can all live a better life. Right now, we live in a society where a nurse pays more tax than a multi-billion dollar corporation. What the hell? My politics, green politics, is the politics of hope. Where, where we dare to plant a seed and make these big, bold, visionary plans come true. Right now, we have a chance to build a country that works for everyone, 
not just the chosen few. My promise to the people of Victoria is that only the Greens will fight for your future. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, thank you, President. Code red for humanity. On the edge of an irreversible disaster if we don't act. They were the exact words from the IPCC report on climate, the sixth assessment, AR6, released last night. And that science has been like a lighthouse guiding us through a smokescreen, a decades-long smokescreen put up by the fossil fuel industry and their lackeys in governments all around the world. And can I say it's been a tough day, Acting Deputy President, for the many people who care about our planet and care about future generations following the release of that report. The reality hitting home from some of the world's best scientists, over 200 of them, a very conservative bunch, who use consensus decision-making to provide their report. The reality of this hitting home has been difficult for many people to comprehend because for so long now so many people have been campaigning for climate action, indeed for decades, and yet here we are in 2021 having the same debates. And it's been especially frustrating for people today witnessing the government's continued indifference to the climate emergency. But I thought it was a tough day for myself until I got a message from Helen Taylor tonight. She is the mother of one very special young Australian who I'd like to acknowledge tonight in the Australian Senate. A young fella, a climate activist who had a firecracker for a heart, who dedicated his short life to taking action on our climate crisis. He was riding his bike around the country to raise awareness on the need for climate action. Another young person galvanised, riding and having conversations with anyone and everyone to change the world. His name was Leith Justin. He popped in to meet me in my electorate office in Launceston this summer, but sadly I was away. I heard he had a fantastic meeting with some of my staff, who of course were blown away by the energy and commitment of this young fellow. He died only a few months ago, Acting Deputy President, riding his bike across the Nullarbor. Leif was just 21 when he was tragically hit by a truck. The same age as my son. At his funeral, his family said Leif was a passionate lover of the planet and all life that came from it. I'd like to dedicate this speech to Leif and his mum, Helen Taylor, who reached out to me today. She wanted to thank me and my colleagues for the work that we've done on fighting for climate action for so long. And she told me it was Leif's birthday this weekend and he would appreciate it, the work that we do and everything we fight for. If people want to know more about Leif, they can go to www.leifjustham.com and there's a collection of information there about his life work or check out Change Your Super, which was one of the many causes that Leif was campaigning on to get people to use their investments to try and channel uh, action and climate action. I wanted to do a few things tonight. I wanted to start after acknowledging Leif and his mum Helen by also acknowledging the many climate scientists and indeed all our scientists, but especially climate scientists tonight. 
on this day that we've received the IPCC report. Now, you know, it, it can't be easy being a climate scientist, uh, acting deputy president. Um, it really can't be. Uh, they spend so much of their time looking at a subject that is so difficult to comprehend for many people that delivers so much bad news. As reported in the Canberra Times recently, dozens of Australian scientists have also been targeted by vicious, unrelenting campaigns because of their work. They are often ignored, they are censored, they are politicised. And according to a survey conducted in 2020, more than half of environmental scientists working for the Australian federal government and state governments report having been prohibited from communicating scientific information. Some respondents said they'd suffered negative health impacts after having work, their work suppressed, and others reported that their career advancement was stifled. Well, I'd like to thank those climate scientists for all the work they've done, not just the hundreds that have contributed to this report with the IPCC, but all the scientists out there that do this work. We can go home to our families, to our lives, but they have to see this every day, and they have committed their life to giving us a better understanding. What we need to do as decision makers, as leaders in a place like this, where we have a platform and a privilege to change things. And I wanted to honour them tonight uh, for all their hard work that they've done. Acting Deputy President, I think it's uh, well and truly justified that this IPCC report is the most important report in our time. It has argued, it has laid out the facts that in just five and a half years' time the world collectively will have spent its carbon budget. In five and a half years' time we will be on track to exceed 1.5 degree warming. By 2030 we will have reached a tipping point ten years earlier than our models, our best climate models had previously forecasted. And if that is the case, and that is what the best scientists tell us, then we have got five and a half years to turn this ship around. And that means we simply cannot afford to have a government in power in this country or anywhere else that continues to ignore the science that puts the environment and future generations of this country at risk. So I would argue, if this is one of the most important reports in human history, then this next federal election is, without a doubt, the most important federal election in our nation's history. And I'd say to all those Australians out there today who are despairing, who are angry, who are frustrated, who are anxious, action is the best antidote to despair. And there's lots of things you can do to take action. You could be like Leaf, decide that you're going to do something with your life to change the world. You can do small things. You can change the way you live. You can electrify your transport. You can get renewables for your home power. You can do lots of things to reduce your carbon footprint. And that all matters. But at the end of the day, we have to change a broken system, a broken political system, a broken economic system. That nexus between political donations and special interests that keeps us locked into this cynical death spiral that this planet is in now. And the most important action that any Australian can take is to vote for change. Vote for the change you want to see in the world. Your vote is powerful. Do not believe that your vote isn't. It is the most important thing you can do because it's one of the only things politicians will listen to, is votes. 
Vote for the change you want to see in the world. And I'm proud to be a party that has, for 40 years now, in this place, campaigned for climate action. We have never relented, nor will we ever. We could be in the, the Greens could be in the balance of power in this government in the next 47th parliament. Vote for Senator it. Senator Wish Wilson, your time has expired. Senator Patrick, you will have the call, but then just for the benefit of the chamber, then we will go to Senator Griff remotely. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about the prosecution of barrister and former ACT Attorney General Bernard Kaliri in the ACT courts. The prosecution has proved very controversial, and that's for two reasons. Firstly, the matter involves four charges of contravening Section 39 of the Intelligence Services Act, that is, unauthorised communications of information relating to the Australian Secret Intelligence Services and one count of conspiring to, to do so. The information in question relates to ASIS spying on Timor-Leste. Before and after a round of uh, negotiations relating to the proposed maritime boundary between Timor-Leste and Australia took place in Dili on the 24th to the 27th of October 2004, Prime Minister al Khatiri and Secretary of State Jose Texiera outlined to their cabinet colleagues the negotiating position of Timor-Leste and the importance of the issue affecting the, their country. The Australian government arranged for these cabinet discussions to be clandestinely monitored by listening devices surreptitiously uh, and unlawfully placed by ASIS in the Timor-Leste government cabinet meeting room. Working closely with elements of the Australian Embassy in Dili, ASIS recorded and transcribed the Timor government's internal deliberations. This enabled the Australian negotiating team to become aware of the private discussions of the Timor-Leste negotiating team and of its position in relation to various issues arising in connection with the negotiation of what became the 2006 treaty between Australia and Timor on certain maritime arrangements in the Timor Sea. It is scandalous and un-Australian that we would spy on a new independent neighbour, the newest country in the world, an impoverished country, a country that gave great assistance to Australian forces in World War II and in circumstances where we had agreed to negotiate with them in good faith. That someone may uh, have called this immoral conduct out and is being prosecuted for blowing the whistle is unconscionable. Now, the second reason for the controversy of, uh, uh, controversial nature of Mr Kaliri's trial is that much, indeed almost all, of the proceedings are taking place in strict secrecy. In this country, we have a system of open justice. Someone passing by a court should be able to wander in and hear what the charges are, what evidence has been laid out uh, by the prosecution, what the witnesses have to say, what the defence's evidence is and what he or she may have to say. Importantly, an open court allows the public to keep an eye on the judge as well. Open courts go to the community's confidence in the courts, and the courts must be rooted in that confidence. Sadly, this trial is taking place behind closed doors, or at least it will, unless the full court of the ACT uh, Supreme Court reverses the decision of Justice, uh, Justice Mossop to close the court. So what's it all about? Australians do have a right to know. As mentioned in my opening remarks in 2004, in the context of good faith negotiations, Australia spied on Timor-Leste. Can I tell you that's the first and dominant reason the Commonwealth want the, the, to close the court. They don't want to admit, on the, uh, admit uh, to the spying operation. Strangely, they do so in circumstances where the government of Timor have acted in a manner consistent with the operation having taken place. Those words I read at the start come from Timor Leste's memorial uh, in The Hague. They also uh, do so in, in circumstances where the Australian government itself has responded to these proceedings with a team uh, full of lawyers um, and negotiators. They've done so uh, uh, in circumstances where they've prosecuted a former ASIS officer for conspiracy to reveal a bugging operation in an affidavit David, that was tendered to the Timor Leste. Uh, um, and Australian uh, Permanent Court of, uh, of Arbitration proceedings. On that front, it's worth pointing out, on the 2nd of April 2019, I asked the Secretary of the Attorney General's Department, uh, Chris Moriatis, whether he was aware of the allegations in respect of Australia spying on the negotiating team of the East Timorese. He replied, I am aware of that. There are, uh, there's a criminal case in the ACT. I'm well aware of it. 
Now, interestingly, he made the link between the spying and the case in, uh, in the ACT. And that's not unexpected because it turns out that uh, uh, he was in the Australian negotiating team that would have been a recipient of the product of the bugging activity. I went on to ask him if, he would, uh, uh, if I would be correct in presuming most criminal cases were not launched on the basis of a fictitious operation. He responded, I would hope not. So the dominant reason for the secrecy is to avoid having to publicly acknowledge that the Australian government did the spying when everyone knows it's just plain that we did it and it uh, would be appropriate to acknowledge it for the healing of East Timor and indeed so that Australians can rightfully ask why it was it was done. Indeed, I understand uh, public interest uh, rests in uh, in most cases in, uh, in neither confirming or denying intelligence operations, but in this case uh, it swings the other way. Uh, I would hope that uh, uh, well, what we know about what's, what's happening right now is there are confidential briefs flowing around inside the court. And look, I'm going to give you some hints as to where, where they, what they go to. The, um, the, the Connell's position will be, will be to say there was an operation, and in, behind closed door they'll say there was an operation in East Timor, and that Mr Kaliri disclosed it. That's what's going to uh, be said. And Mr Kaliri, by and large, will agree with, with, uh, with that particular proposition that there was a spying operation. They will, I understand, contest whether the operation was lawful and whether the operation was lawfully initiated. These are two different questions, um, but indeed go to our national interest and indeed our moral constitution. I have no doubt that uh, it was neither legal or initiated properly. The question doesn't involve uh, national security sensitivities. It involves the sequence of events that led to the approval of the operation. Uh, now, the way in which the, uh, these operations are approved, I'm not telling you anything that's classified, it's in the Intelligence Services Act. There's a sequence, there's a proper process. Firstly, one of the ways in, in which to, do, uh, to, to uh, uh, initiate one of these operations is for uh, the executive, the collective, the National Security Cabinet to uh, basically uh, state a government requirement. That government requirement must centre around some pretty uh, uh, crucial principles, like uh, it must be in our foreign relations interest, national security interests, or our economic interests. Um, the reasonable question one can ask is how can an executive government uh, in a democracy ruled by law ever make an activity that would breach a solemn signed undertaking to act in good faith, breach international law, cheat a fiduciary commercial partner and breach Australian criminal laws? A government requirement? It's likely that, uh, it's likely that uh, there's going to be difficulty in relation to that particular requirement because the Commonwealth has opposed, and this is available in open court, the, uh, the, the uh, request or the subpoenas for Cabinet documents. But there is a second pathway. Uh, a minister can uh, make a decision, uh, particularly the foreign minister, in this case Mr Downer, can make a decision provided he is satisfied and has consulted with um, uh, with other minister relevant ministers, and they may have been Mr Howard, the Prime Minister, uh, Mr Ruddock, the Attorney General, uh, uh, Mr Hill, the Defence Minister, perhaps uh, Mr Minchin, who was the Minister for Science, Industry um, and uh, also assisting the Prime Minister. All of those uh, ministers should have been asked, and there should be a written directive. And I understand there isn't, and that doesn't surprise me after my national cabinet case because the court was scathing as to the record keeping of, uh, in fact, uh, the Commonwealth government. So I suspect all of those people I've just named, all those ministers, will be on the subpoena list giving, uh, giving evidence. So we have specific controls placed on the intelligence services by this parliament, and my view is they haven't been followed. My view is that this operation was instituted by uh, Mr Downer, not properly authorised, and, uh, and done for the benefit of Woodside, which we've seen in evidence before the parliamentary uh, committees on treaties. Uh, uh, the Commonwealth government has a view that whatever Woodside's interests are, are 
our, uh, are the national interests. So we need to watch this uh, case. We need to press. I hope the court opens up the case because the only thing, really secret, that's going to be talked about is, in fact, the, the, the well, and it's not secret, is the fact that the operation uh, took place. Disclosure of, of uh, the basic fact that the operation was conducted and who did or did not authorise uh, that action uh, would go towards healing the rift between. Uh, East Timor and Australia, and satisfying Senator the Australian Patrick, people. Patrick, your time has expired. Senator Griff, joining us remotely, you have the call. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. A few short weeks ago, my beautiful wife, Kristen Griff, passed away after a long and distressing battle with an aggressive form of breast cancer. She was not alone. A shocking number of Australians die from cancer each and every year. 50,000 died last year, and there were a further 150,000 who were diagnosed with cancer. These are unimaginable numbers. Some Australians have a genetic predisposition to cancer, and this is often triggered by environmental factors of some kind. Others, like my wife Kristen, had no apparent genetic predisposition. When they are diagnosed with cancer, it is usually because they were exposed to an environmental factor or factors of some kind. The best known example is smoking, where an individual ingests a number of potent carcinogens which later develop into lung cancer. A great number of chemicals in our environment are carcinogenic or otherwise harmful. Many are known, many are not. And just like malignant mesothelioma, it can take 30 to 40 years after exposure before it develops. 30 to 40 years. My wife Kristen was an active, nature-loving and health-conscious person. As an adult, she was careful about what she ingested and what she was exposed to. As a mother, she was just as careful about our family's health. But her childhood was very different. She grew up in a small seaside town and had a childhood that was generally happy and carefree. But now we can look back with fresh eyes and new knowledge and recognise the many risks that this carefree childhood exposed her to. I will quote from some notes that she wrote to our daughter and her siblings to allay any fears they might have about them suffering the same fate as her via a genetic flaw. I was always wandering around at the depot with Dad, the uncles and Grandpa, or on the fuel truck to farm deliveries with Dad. Bare feet, black most of my childhood prior to school age, from running around barefoot at the depot, except yellow rubber boots in winter. I used to get in trouble all the time for leaving black smears all over the white enamel inside the bath. Leaded petrochemicals, kerosene, sump oil, DDT, and other farm crop uh, chemical pesticides, many subsequently banned for use. Sheep dip and drenching chemicals. We swam in sheep dip, as many of us country kids did. Kids in the sheep run to push sheep through. Ant and spider dust, surface powder. Hessian sacks of improved seed for crop planting. Dad smoked indoors and in the car every day of my life until I went to Finland at age 16. End of quote. It is staggering what people were exposed to in decades past, but only in hindsight. At the time, these exposures were commonplace. Parents were not believed to be negligent for exposing their children to secondhand smoke or DDT as they would be today. The harms were not known at the time. In many cases, it took decades of widespread use before it became clear that certain chemicals were carcinogenic. By then, it was too late for too many. In the post-war decades, we made great advances in chemical science. In every facet of life, new chemical products were developed and brought quickly to market. Everything from pesticides to toothpaste was improved again and again. These products rapidly became better, cheaper, and more widely used. But our understanding of chemical safety did not advance anywhere near as quickly. 
and we, individuals and government, failed to act with care. We assumed products were safe until they were shown to be unsafe. For example, DDT was released to the public in 1945. By the 1950s, it was widely used in Australia to wipe out mosquito populations and to protect crops from insects. But by the mid 1960s, its harmful effects were becoming widely understood. It was toxic, a danger to human health and ecosystems. In 1972, it was banned in the United States but it would take another 15 years before Australia followed suit. 15 years after DDT was banned in the United States. But the harm didn't stop then. The toxic effects of DDT are long lived. More than 30 years on, there are still accumulations in our natural environment which will persist for decades to come. This means there are many Australians living today who were exposed to DDT in their childhood, just like my wife Kristen, who have toxic accumulations in their body and are unaware it could ultimately cause the cancer that may take their lives. The challenge we face today is not regulating and restricting the use of DDT. That battle has been fought and won. The battle today is ensuring the other chemicals available in Australia are safe. Safe for the people working with and around the chemicals. Safe for the people or animals who may consume or be exposed to the chemicals. And most importantly, safe for our natural environment. We need to ensure that governments act with respect to the precautionary principle that is assuming chemicals are harmful and prohibiting them until they are shown to be safe. It can't be enough for a company to assert that its products are harmless. Too often we see companies using dishonest studies with secret commercial and confidence data to evade regulation. Why else would it have taken 15 years for Australia to follow the US in banning DDT? Were governments ignorant of the danger? Of course not. Lobbyists and corporate interests acted to protect their business. Every one of us in this chamber has had some experience where a rent seeker has tried to slow down or kill off regulation. Every one of us. Most recently, we have seen it with big tobacco and vaping products, which they want legalised because they are less deadly than their other products. Such companies care nothing for the public and only care for their profits. This is why government must ensure chemicals are independently evaluated in Australia and most importantly, re-evaluated over time. We should never rely on a study like we have with glyphosate that was over 30 years old. We need to re-evaluate studies over time. The evaluation methods and data must also be publicly made available so academics and researchers can verify those results and give the public confidence that their governments are working properly to protect them. Acting today won't stop a single case of cancer this year or next year or the year after. But it could help to prevent thousands of cancer deaths in 2030 and beyond. We can look back on parents in the post-war decades and say they acted responsibly given the knowledge available at the time. Will our children be able to say the same decades from now about us? In the past 18 months, Australia has had slightly less than 40,000 COVID cases and 1,000 deaths. We mobilise our entire health community, locked down cities and states, and closed our borders to protect our community from the threat of COVID. 
During the same time, we've had more than 220,000 new cancer diagnoses and 75,000 cancer deaths. We don't need COVID policies for cancer, but there are reasonable steps we can take today to protect the community. Radically better chemical regulation and testing is one of those important steps. We owe it to our constituents and to our children to make sure we act today and this time we get it right. Thank you, Senator Griff. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.